Chapter One of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter One Ancestry. Thomas Lincoln and Nancy Hanks. Rock Spring Farm. Lincoln's Birth. Kentucky Schools. The Journey to Indiana. Pigeon Creek Settlement. Indiana Schools. Sally Bush Lincoln. Gentryville. Work and Books. Satires and Sermons. Flatboat Voyage to New Orleans. The Journey to Illinois. Abraham Lincoln, the sixteenth President of the United States, was born in a log cabin in the backwoods of Kentucky on the twelfth day of February, 1809. His father, Thomas Lincoln, was sixth in direct line of descent from Samuel Lincoln, who emigrated from England to Massachusetts in 1638. Following the prevailing drift of American settlement, these descendants had, during a century and a half, successively moved from Massachusetts to New Jersey, from New Jersey to Pennsylvania, from Pennsylvania to Virginia, and from Virginia to Kentucky, while collateral branches of the family eventually made homes in other parts of the West. In Pennsylvania and Virginia, some of them had acquired considerable property and local prominence. In the year 1780, Abraham Lincoln, the President's grandfather, was able to pay into the public treasury of Virginia one hundred and sixty pounds current money, for which he received a warrant directed to the principal surveyor of any county within the Commonwealth of Virginia, to lay off in one or more surveys for Abraham Lincoln, his heirs or assigns, the quantity of four hundred acres of land. The error in the spelling of the name was a blunder of the clerk who made out the warrant. With this warrant and his family of five children, Mordecai, Josiah, Mary, Nancy, and Thomas, he moved to Kentucky, then still a county of Virginia, in 1780, and began opening a farm. Four years later, while at work with his three boys in the edge of his clearing, a party of Indians, concealed in the brush, shot and killed him. Josiah, the second son, ran to a neighboring fort for assistance. Mordecai, the eldest, hurried to the cabin for his gun, leaving Thomas, youngest of the family, a child of six years, by his father. Mordecai had just taken down his rifle from its convenient resting place over the door of the cabin when, turning, he saw an Indian in his war paint stooping to seize the child. He took quick aim through a loophole, shot and killed the savage, at which the little boy also ran to the house, and from this citadel Mordecai continued firing at the Indians until Josiah brought help from the fort. It was doubtless this misfortune which rapidly changed the circumstances of the family. Kentucky was yet a wild new country. As compared with later periods of emigration, settlement was slow and pioneer life a hard struggle so it was probably under the stress of poverty as well as by the marriage of the older children that the home was gradually broken up, and Thomas Lincoln became, quote, even in childhood, a wandering, laboring boy, and grew up literally without education. Before he was grown, he passed one year as a hired hand with his uncle Isaac in Watauga, a branch of the Holston River, unquote. Later he seems to have undertaken to learn the trade of carpenter in the shop of Joseph Hanks in Elizabethtown. When Thomas Lincoln was about twenty-eight years old, he married Nancy Hanks, a niece of his employer near Beachland in Washington County. She was a good-looking young woman of twenty-three, also from Virginia, and so far superior to her husband in education that she could read and write, and taught him how to sign his name. Neither one of the young couple had any money or property, but in those days living was not expensive, and they doubtless considered his trade a sufficient provision for the future. 
he brought her to a little house in Elizabethtown, where a daughter was born to them the following year. During the next twelve months, Thomas Lincoln either grew tired of his carpenter work, or found the wages he was able to earn insufficient to meet his growing household expenses. He therefore bought a little farm on the big south fork of Nolan Creek, in what was then Hardin, and is now LaRue County, three miles from Hodgensville, and thirteen miles from Elizabethtown. Having no means, he of course bought the place on credit, a transaction not so difficult when we remember that in that early day there was plenty of land to be bought for mere promises to pay, under the disadvantage, however, that farms to be had on these terms were usually of a very poor quality, on which energetic or forehanded men did not care to waste their labor. It was a kind of land generally known in the West as barrens, rolling upland with very thin, unproductive soil. Its momentary usefulness was that it was partly cleared and cultivated, that an indifferent cabin stood on it ready to be occupied, and that it had one specially attractive as well as useful feature, a fine spring of water, prettily situated amid a graceful clump of foliage, because of which the place was called Rock Spring Farm. The change of abode was perhaps in some respects an improvement upon Elizabethtown. To pioneer families in deep poverty, a little farm offered many more resources than a town lot. Space, wood, water, greens in the spring, berries in the summer, nuts in the autumn, small game everywhere, and they were fully accustomed to the loss of companionship. On this farm, and in this cabin, the future President of the United States was born on the 12th of February, 1809, and here the first four years of his childhood were spent. When Abraham was about four years old, the Lincoln home was changed to a much better farm of two hundred and thirty-eight acres on Knob Creek, six miles from Hodgensville, bought by Thomas Lincoln, again on credit, for the promise to pay one hundred and eighteen pounds. A year later he conveyed two hundred acres of it by deed to a new purchaser. In this new home the family spent four years more, and while here, Abraham and his sister Sarah began going to ABC schools. Their first teacher was Zachariah Riney, who taught near the Lincoln cabin. The next, Caleb Hazel, at a distance of about four miles. Thomas Lincoln was evidently one of those easy-going, good-natured men who carry the virtue of contentment to an extreme. He appears never to have exerted himself much beyond the attainment of a necessary subsistence. By a little farming and occasional jobs at his trade, he seems to have supplied his family with food and clothes. There is no record that he made any payment on either of his farms. The fever of westward emigration was in the air, and, listening to glowing accounts of rich lands and newer settlements in Indiana, he had neither valuable possessions nor cheerful associations to restrain the natural impulse of every frontiersman to move. In this determination his carpenter's skill served him a good purpose, and made the enterprise not only feasible, but reasonably cheap. In the fall of 1816 he built himself a small flatboat, which he launched at the mouth of Knob Creek, half a mile from his cabin, on the waters of the Rolling Fork. This stream would float him to Salt River, and Salt River to the Ohio. He also thought to combine a little speculation with his undertaking. Part of his personal property he traded for four hundred gallons of whiskey. Then, loading the rest on his boat with his carpenter's tools and the whiskey, he made the voyage, with the help of the current, down the Rolling Fork to Salt River, down Salt River to the Ohio, and down the Ohio to Thompson's Ferry, in Perry County on the Indiana shore. The boat capsized once on the way, but he saved most of the cargo. Sixteen miles out from the river he found a location in the forest which suited him. Since his boat would not float upstream, he sold it, left his property with a settler, and trudged back home to Kentucky, all the way on foot, to bring his wife and the two children, Sarah, nine years old, and Abraham, seven. 
Another son had been born to them some years before, but had died when only three days old. This time the trip to Indiana was made with the aid of two horses, used by the wife and children for riding, and to carry their little equipage for camping at night by the way. In a straight line the distance is about fifty miles, but it was probably doubled by the very few roads it was possible to follow. Having reached the Ohio and crossed to where he had left his goods on the Indiana side, he hired a wagon, which carried them and his family the remaining sixteen miles through the forest to the spot he had chosen, which in due time became the Lincoln Farm. It was a piece of heavily timbered land, one and a half miles east of what has since become the village of Gentryville in Spencer County. The lateness of the autumn compelled him to provide a shelter as quickly as possible, and he built what is known on the frontier as a half-faced camp, about fourteen feet square. This structure differed from a cabin in that it was closed on only three sides, and open to the weather on the fourth. It was usual to build the fire in front of the open side, and the necessity of providing a chimney was thus avoided. He doubtless intended it for a mere temporary shelter, and, as such, it would have sufficed for good weather in the summer season. But it was a rude provision for the winds and snows of an Indiana winter. It illustrates Thomas Lincoln's want of energy that the family remained housed in this primitive camp for nearly a whole year. He must, however, not be too hastily blamed for his dilatory improvement. It is not likely that he remained altogether idle. A more substantial cabin was probably begun, and, besides, there was the heavy work of clearing away the timber, that is, cutting down the large trees, chopping them into suitable lengths, and rolling them together into great log heaps to be burned, or splitting them into rails to fence the small field upon which he managed to raise a patch of corn and other things during the ensuing summer. Thomas Lincoln's arrival was in the autumn of 1816. That same winter Indiana was admitted to the Union as a state. There were as yet no roads worthy of the name to or from the settlement formed by himself and seven or eight neighbors at various distances. The village of Gentryville was not even begun. There was no sawmill to saw lumber. Breadstuff could be had only by sending young Abraham on horseback seven miles with a bag of corn to be ground on a hand gristmill. In the course of two or three years, a road from Corridon to Evansville was laid out, running past the Lincoln Farm, and, perhaps two or three years afterward, another from Rockport to Bloomington, crossing the former. This gave rise to Gentryville. James Gentry entered the land at the crossroads. Gideon Romine opened a small store, and their joint efforts succeeded in getting a post office established from which the village gradually grew. For a year after his arrival Thomas Lincoln remained a mere squatter. Then he entered the quarter section, 160 acres, on which he opened his farm, and made some payments on his entry, but only enough in eleven years to obtain a patent for one half of it. About the time that he moved into his new cabin, relatives and friends followed from Kentucky, and some of them in turn occupied the half-faced camp. In the ensuing autumn much sickness prevailed in the Pigeon Creek settlement. It was thirty miles to the nearest doctor, and several persons died, among them Nancy Hanks Lincoln, the mother of young Abraham. The mechanical skill of Thomas was called upon to make the coffins, the necessary lumber for which had to be cut with a whipsaw. The death of Mrs. Lincoln was a serious loss to her husband and children. Abraham's sister Sarah was only eleven years old, and the tasks and cares of the little household were altogether too heavy for her years and experience. Nevertheless, they struggled on bravely through the winter and next summer. But in the autumn of 1819, Thomas Lincoln went back to Kentucky and married Sally Bush Johnston, whom he had known and, it is said, courted when she was merely Sally Bush. Johnston, to whom she was married about the time Lincoln married Nancy Hanks, had died, leaving her with three children. 
She came of a better station in life than Thomas, and is represented as a woman of uncommon energy and thrift, possessing excellent qualities both of head and heart. The household goods which she brought to the Lincoln home in Indiana filled a four-horse wagon. Not only were her own three children well clothed and cared for, but she was able at once to provide little Abraham and Sarah with home comforts to which they had been strangers during the whole of their young lives. Under her example and urging, Thomas at once supplied the yet unfinished cabin with floor, door, and windows, and existence took on a new aspect for all the inmates. Under her management and control, all friction and jealousy was avoided between the two sets of children, and contentment, if not happiness, reigned in the little cabin. The new stepmother quickly perceived the superior aptitudes and abilities of Abraham. She became very fond of him, and in every way encouraged his marked inclination to study and improve himself. The opportunities for this were meager enough. Mr. Lincoln himself has drawn a vivid outline of the situation. Quote, it was a wild region, with many bears and other wild animals still in the woods. There I grew up. There were some schools so called, but no qualification was ever required of a teacher beyond readin', writin', and cipherin' to the rule of three. If a straggler supposed to understand Latin happened to sojourn in the neighborhood, he was looked upon as a wizard. There was absolutely nothing to excite ambition for education. Unquote. As Abraham was only in his eighth year when he left Kentucky, the little beginnings he had learned in the schools kept by Riney and Hazel in that state must have been very slight. Probably only his alphabet, or possibly three or four pages of Webster's elementary spelling book. It is likely that the multiplication table was as yet an unfathomed mystery, and that he could not write or read more than the words he spelled. There is no record at what date he was able again to go to school in Indiana. Some of his schoolmates think it was in his tenth year, or soon after he fell under the care of his stepmother. The schoolhouse was a low cabin of round logs, a mile and a half from the Lincoln home, with split logs, or puncheons, for a floor, split logs roughly leveled with an axe and set up on legs for benches, and a log cut out of one end, and the space filled in with squares of greased paper for window panes. The main light in such primitive halls of learning was admitted by the open door. It was a type of school building common in the early West, in which many a statesman gained the first rudiments of knowledge. Very often Webster's elementary spelling book was the only textbook. Abraham's first Indiana school was probably held five years before Gentryville was located and a store established there. Until then it was difficult if not impossible, to obtain books, slates, pencils, pen, ink, and paper, and their use was limited to settlers who had brought them when they came. It is reasonable to infer that the Lincoln family had no such luxuries, and, as the Pigeon Creek settlement numbered only eight or ten families, there must have been very few pupils to attend this first school. Nevertheless, it is worthy of special note that even under such difficulties and limitations, the American thirst for education planted a schoolhouse on the very forefront of every settlement. Abraham's second school in Indiana was held about the time he was fourteen years old, and the third in his seventeenth year. By this time he probably had better teachers and increased facilities, though with the disadvantage of having to walk four or five miles to the schoolhouse. He learned to write, and was provided with pen, ink, and a copy-book, and probably a very limited supply of writing paper, for facsimiles had been printed of several scraps and fragments upon which he had carefully copied tables, rules, and sums from his arithmetic, such as those of long measure, land measure, and dry measure, and examples in multiplication and compound division. All this indicates that he pursued his studies with a very unusual purpose and determination, not only to understand them at the moment, but to imprint them indelibly upon his memory, 
and even to regain them in visible form for reference when the school-book might no longer be in his hands or possession. Mr. Lincoln has himself written that these three different schools were, quote, kept successively by Andrew Crawford, Sweeney, and Azel W. Dorsey, unquote. Other witnesses state the succession somewhat differently. The important fact to be gleaned from what we learn about Mr. Lincoln's schooling is that the instruction gave him by these five different teachers, two in Kentucky and three in Indiana, in short sessions of attendance scattered over a period of nine years, made up in all less than a twelve-month. He said of it in 1860, quote, Abraham now thinks that the aggregate of all his schooling did not amount to one year. Unquote. This distribution of the tuition he received was doubtless an advantage. Had it all been given him at his first school in Indiana, it would probably not have carried him half through Webster's elementary spelling book. The lazy or indifferent pupils who were his schoolmates doubtless forgot what was taught them at one time, before they had opportunity at another. But to the exceptional character of Abraham, these widely separated fragments of instruction were precious steps to self-help, of which he made unremitting use. It is the concurrent testimony of his early companions that he employed all his spare moments in keeping on with some one of his studies. His stepmother says, Abe read diligently. He read every book he could lay his hands on, and when he came across a passage that struck him, he would write it down on boards, if he had no paper, and keep it there until he did get paper. Then he would rewrite it, look at it, repeat it. He had a copy-book, a kind of scrap-book, in which he put down all things, and thus preserved them. There is no mention that either he or other pupils had slates and slate pencils to use at school or at home, but he found a ready substitute in pieces of board. It is stated that he occupied his long evenings at home doing sums on the fire-shovel. Iron fire-shovels were a rarity among pioneers. They used, instead, a broad, thin clapboard with one end narrowed to a handle. In cooking by the open fire, this domestic implement was of the first necessity to arrange piles of live coals on the hearth, over which they set their skillet and oven, upon the lids of which live coals were also heaped. Upon such a wooden shovel Abraham was able to work his sums by the flickering firelight. If he had no pencil, he could use charcoal and probably did so. When it was covered with figures he would take a drawing-knife, shave it off clean, and begin again. Under these various disadvantages, and by the help of such troublesome expedients, Abraham Lincoln worked his way to so much of an education as placed him far ahead of his schoolmates, and quickly abreast of the acquirements of his various teachers. The field from which he could glean knowledge was very limited, though he diligently borrowed every book in the neighborhood. This list is a short one. Robinson Crusoe, Aesop's Fables, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, Weems' Life of Washington, and A History of the United States. When he had exhausted other books, he even resolutely attacked the revised statutes of Indiana, which Dave Turnham, the constable, had in daily use, and permitted him to come to his house and read. It needs to be borne in mind that all this effort at self-education extended from first to last over a period of twelve or thirteen years, during which he was also performing hard manual labor, and proves a degree of steady, unflinching perseverance in a line of conduct that brings into strong relief a high aim and the consciousness of abundant intellectual power. He was not permitted to forget that he was on an uphill path, a stern struggle with adversity. The leisure hours which he was able to devote to his reading, his penmanship, and his arithmetic were by no means overabundant. Writing of his father's removal from Kentucky to Indiana, he says, He settled in an unbroken forest, and the clearing away of surplus wood was the great task ahead. Abraham, though very young, was large of his age, and had an axe put into his hands at once. And from that, till within his twenty-third year, 
he was almost constantly handling that most useful instrument, less, of course, in ploughing and harvesting seasons. John Hanks mentions the character of his work a little more in detail. Quote, he and I worked barefoot, grubbed it, ploughed, mowed, and cradled together, ploughed corn, gathered it, and shucked corn. Unquote. The sum of it all is that from his boyhood until after he was of age, most of his time was spent in the hard and varied muscular labor of the farm and the forest, sometimes on his father's place, sometimes as a hired hand for other pioneers. In this very useful but commonplace occupation he had, however, one advantage. He was not only very early in his life a tall, strong country boy, but as he grew up he soon became a tall, strong, sinewy man. He early attained the unusual height of six feet four inches, with arms of proportionate length. This gave him a degree of power and facility as an axeman which few had or were able to acquire. He was therefore usually able to lead his fellows in efforts of both muscle and mind. He performed the task of his daily labor and mastered the lessons of his scanty schooling with an ease and rapidity they were unable to attain. Twice during his life in Indiana this ordinary routine was somewhat varied. When he was sixteen, while working for a man who lived at the mouth of Anderson's Creek, it was part of his duty to manage a ferry-boat which transported passengers across the Ohio River. It was doubtless this which three years later brought him a new experience that he himself related in these words. When he was nineteen, still residing in Indiana, he made his first trip upon a flatboat to New Orleans. He was a hired hand merely, and he and a son of the owner, without other assistance, made the trip. The nature of part of the cargo load, as it was called, made it necessary for them to linger and trade along the sugar coast, and one night they were attacked by seven negroes with intent to kill and rob them. They were hurt some in the melee, but succeeded in driving the negroes from the boat, and then cut cable, weighed anchor, and left. This commercial enterprise was set on foot by Mr. Gentry, the founder of Gentryville. The affair shows us that Abraham had gained an enviable standing in the village as a man of honesty, skill, and judgment, one who could be depended on to meet such emergencies as might arise in selling their bacon and other produce to the cotton planters along the shores of the lower Mississippi. By this time Abraham's education was well advanced. His handwriting, his arithmetic, and his general intelligence were so good that he had occasionally been employed to help in the Gentryville store, and Gentry thus knew by personal test that he was entirely capable of assisting his son Allen in the trading expedition to New Orleans. For Abraham, on the other hand, it was an event which must have opened up wide vistas of future hope and ambition. Allen Gentry probably was nominal supercargo and steersman, but we may easily surmise that Lincoln, as the bow oar, carried his full half of general responsibility. For this service the elder gentry paid him eight dollars a month and his passage home on a steamboat. It was the future president's first eager look into the wide, wide world. Abraham's devotion to his books and his sums stands forth in more striking light from the fact that his habits differed from those of most frontier boys in one important particular. Almost every youth of the backwoods early became a habitual hunter and superior marksman. The Indiana woods were yet swarming with game, and the larder of every cabin depended largely upon this great storehouse of wild meat. The Pigeon Creek settlement was especially fortunate on this point. There was in the neighborhood of the Lincoln home what was known in the West as a deer lick, that is, there existed a feeble salt spring which impregnated the soil in its vicinity or created little pools of brackish water, and various kinds of animals, particularly deer, resorted there to satisfy their natural craving for salt by drinking from these or licking the moist earth. 
Hunters took advantage of this habit, and one of their common customs was to watch in the dusk or at night and secure their approaching prey by an easy shot. Skill with a rifle and success in the chase were points of friendly emulation. In many localities the boy or youth who shot a squirrel in any part of the animal except its head became the butt of the jests of his companions and elders. Yet, under such conditions and opportunities, Abraham was neither a hunter nor a marksman. He tells us, A few days before the completion of his eighth year, in the absence of his father, a flock of wild turkeys approached the new log cabin, and Abraham, with a rifle gun standing inside, shot through a crack and killed one of them. He has never since pulled a trigger on any larger game. The hours which other boys spent in roaming the woods, or lying in ambush at the deer lick, he preferred to devote to his effort at mental improvement. It can hardly be claimed that he did this from calculating ambition. It was a native intellectual thirst, the significance of which he did not himself yet understand. Such exceptional characteristics manifested themselves only in a few matters. In most particulars he grew up as the ordinary backwoods boy develops into the youth and man. As he was subjected to their usual labors, so also he was limited to their usual pastimes and enjoyments. The varied amusements common to our day were not within their reach. The period of the circus, the political speech, and the itinerant show had not yet come. Schools, as we have seen, and probably meetings or church services, were irregular, to be had only at long intervals. Primitive athletic games and commonplace talk, enlivened by frontier jests and stories, formed the sum of social intercourse when half a dozen or a score of settlers of various ages came together at a house-raising or corn-husking, or when mere chance brought them at the same time to the post-office or the country store. On these occasions, however, Abraham was, according to his age, always able to contribute his full share or more. Most of his natural aptitudes equipped him especially to play his part well. He had quick intelligence, ready sympathy, a cheerful temperament, a kindling humor, a generous and helpful spirit. He was both a ready talker and appreciative listener. By virtue of his tall stature and unusual strength of sinew and muscle, he was from the beginning a leader in all athletic games. By reason of his studious habits and his extraordinarily retentive memory, he quickly became the best storyteller among his companions. Even the slight training he gained from his studies greatly quickened his perceptions and broadened and steadied the strong reasoning faculty with which nature had endowed him. As the years of his youth passed by, his less gifted comrades learned to accept his judgments and to welcome his power to entertain and instruct them. On his own part, he gradually learned to write not merely with the hand, but also with the mind, to think. It was an easy transition for him from remembering the jingle of a commonplace rhyme to the constructing of a doggerel verse, and he did not neglect the opportunity of practicing his penmanship in such impromptus. Tradition also relates that he added to his list of stories and jokes humorous imitations from the sermons of eccentric preachers. But tradition has very likely both magnified and distorted these alleged exploits of his satire and mimicry. All that can be said of them is that his youth was marked by intellectual activity far beyond that of his companions. It is an interesting coincidence that nine days before the birth of Abraham Lincoln, Congress passed the act to organize the territory of Illinois, which his future life and career were destined to render so illustrious. Another interesting coincidence may be found in the fact that in the same year, 1818, in which Congress definitely fixed the number of stars and stripes in the national flag, Illinois was admitted as a state to the Union. The star of empire was moving westward at an accelerating speed. Alabama was admitted in 1819, Maine in 1820, Missouri in 1821. Little by little the line of frontier settlement was pushing itself toward the Mississippi. 
No sooner had the pioneer built him a cabin and opened his little farm than during every summer canvas-covered wagons wound their toilsome way over the new-made roads into the newer wilderness, while his eyes followed them with wistful eagerness. Thomas Lincoln and his Pigeon Creek relatives and neighbors could not forever withstand the contagion of this example, and at length they yielded to the irrepressible longing by a common impulse. Mr. Lincoln writes, March 1, 1830, Abraham having just completed his twenty-first year, his father and family, with the families of the two daughters and sons-in-law of his stepmother, left the old homestead in Indiana and came to Illinois. Their mode of conveyance was wagons drawn by ox teams, and Abraham drove one of the teams. They reached the county of Macon, and stopped there some time within the same month of March. His father and family settled a new place on the north side of the Sangamon River, at the junction of the Timberland and Prairie, about ten miles westerly from Decatur. Here they built a log cabin, into which they removed, and made sufficient of rails to fence ten acres of ground, fenced and broke the ground, and raised a crop of sown corn upon it the same year. The sons-in-law were temporarily settled in other places in the county. In the autumn all hands were greatly afflicted with ague and fever to which they had not been used, and by which they were greatly discouraged, so much so that they determined on leaving the county. They remained, however, through the succeeding winter, which was the winter of the very celebrated Deep Snow of Illinois. End of chapter 1 Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois. Chapter 2 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 2. Flatboat. New Salem. Election Clerk. Store and Mill. Kirkham's Grammar. Sangamo Journal. The Talisman. Lincoln's Address, March 9, 1832. Black Hawk War. Lincoln elected captain. Mustered out, May 27, 1832. Re-enlisted in Independent Spy Battalion. Finally mustered out, June 16, 1832. Defeated for the legislature. Blacksmith or lawyer. The Lincoln Berry Store. Appointed postmaster, May 7, 1833. National Politics. The life of Abraham Lincoln, or that part of it which will interest readers for all future time, properly begins in March 1831, after the winter of the deep snow. According to frontier custom, being then twenty-one years old, he left his father's cabin to make his own fortune in the world. A man named Denton Offutt, one of a class of local traders and speculators usually found about early western settlements, had probably heard something of young Lincoln's Indiana history, particularly that he had made a voyage on a flatboat from Indiana to New Orleans, and that he was strong, active, honest, and generally, as would be expressed in western phrase, a smart young fellow. He was therefore just the sort of man Offutt needed for one of his trading enterprises, and Mr. Lincoln himself relates somewhat in detail how Offutt engaged him and the beginning of the venture. Quote, Abraham, together with his stepmother's son, John D. Johnston, and John Hanks, yet residing in Macon County, hired themselves to Denton Offutt to make a flatboat from Beardstown, Illinois, on the Illinois River, to New Orleans, and for that purpose were to join him, Offutt, at Springfield, Illinois, so soon as the snow should go off. When it did go off, which was about the 1st of March, 1831, the county was so flooded as to make traveling by land impractical, to obviate which difficulty they purchased a large canoe, 
and came down the Sangamon River in it. This is the time and the manner of Abraham's first entrance into Sangamon County. They found Offutt at Springfield, but learned from him that he had failed in getting a boat at Beardstown. This led to their hiring themselves to him for twelve dollars per month each, and getting the timber out of the trees and building a boat at Old Sangamon Town on the Sangamon River, seven miles northwest of Springfield, which boat they took to New Orleans substantially upon the old contract. End of quote. It needs here to be recalled that Lincoln's father was a carpenter, and that Abraham had no doubt acquired considerable skill in the use of tools during his boyhood, and a practical knowledge of the construction of flatboats during his previous New Orleans trip, sufficient to enable him with confidence to undertake this task in shipbuilding. From the after-history of both Johnston and Hanks, we know that neither of them was gifted with skill or industry, and it becomes clear that Lincoln was from the first leader of the party, master of construction, and captain of the craft. It took some time to build the boat, and before it was finished, the Sangamon River had fallen, so that the new craft stuck midway across the dam at Rutledge's Mill at New Salem, a village of fifteen or twenty houses. The inhabitants came down to the bank, and exhibited great interest in the fate of the boat, which, with its bow in the air and its stern under water, was half bird and half fish, and they probably jestingly inquired of the young captain whether he expected to dive or to fly to New Orleans. He was, however, equal to the occasion. He bored a hole in the bottom of the boat at the bow, and rigged some sort of lever or derrick to lift the stern, so that the water she had taken in behind ran out in front, enabling her to float over the partly submerged dam, and this feat in turn caused great wonderment in the crowd at the novel expedient of bailing a boat by boring a hole in her bottom. This exploit of naval engineering fully established Lincoln's fame at New Salem, and grounded him so firmly in the esteem of his employer Offutt that the latter, already looking forward to his future usefulness, at once engaged him to come back to New Salem, after his New Orleans voyage, to act as his clerk in a store. Once over the dam and her cargo reloaded, partly there and partly at Beardstown, the boat safely made the remainder of her voyage to New Orleans, and, returning by steamer to St. Louis, Lincoln and Johnston, Hanks had turned back from St. Louis, continued on foot to Illinois, Johnston remaining at the family home, which had meanwhile been removed from Macon to Coles County, and Lincoln going to his employer and friends at New Salem. This was in July or August, 1831. Neither Offutt nor his goods had yet arrived, and during his waiting he had a chance to show the New Salemites another accomplishment. An election was to be held, and one of the clerks was sick and failed to come. Scribes were not plenty on the frontier, and Mentor Graham, the clerk who was present, looking around for a properly qualified colleague, noticed Lincoln, and asked him if he could write, to which he answered in local idiom that he could make a few rabbit tracks, and was thereupon immediately inducted into his first office. He performed his duties not only to the general satisfaction, but so as to interest Graham, who was a schoolmaster, and afterward made himself very useful to Lincoln. Offutt finally arrived with a miscellaneous lot of goods, which Lincoln opened and put in order in a room that a former New Salem storekeeper was just ready to vacate, and whose remnant stock Offutt also purchased. Trade was evidently not brisk at New Salem, for the commercial zeal of Offutt led him to increase his venture by renting the Rutledge and Cameron Mill, on whose historic dam the flatboat had stuck. For a while the charge of the mill was added to Lincoln's duties, until another clerk was engaged to help him. There was likewise good evidence that in addition to his duties at the store and the mill, Lincoln made himself generally useful, that he cut down trees and split rails enough to make a large hog-pen adjoining the mill, a proceeding quite natural when we remember that his hitherto active life and still-growing muscles 
imperatively demanded the exercise which measuring calico or weighing out sugar and coffee failed to supply. We know from other incidents that he was possessed of ample bodily strength. In frontier life it is not only needed for useful labor of many kinds, but is also called upon to aid in popular amusement. There was a settlement in the neighborhood of New Salem called Clary's Grove, where lived a group of restless, rollicking backwoodsmen with a strong liking for various forms of frontier athletics and rough practical jokes. In the progress of American settlement there has always been a time, whether the frontier was in New England or Pennsylvania or Kentucky, or on the banks of the Mississippi, when the champion wrestler held some fraction of the public consideration accorded to the victor in the Olympic Games of Greece. Until Lincoln came, Jack Armstrong was the champion wrestler of Clary's Grove and New Salem, and picturesque stories are told how the neighborhood talk, inflamed by Offutt's fulsome laudation of his clerk, made Jack Armstrong feel that his fame was in danger. Lincoln put off the encounter as long as he could, and when the wrestling match finally came off, neither could throw the other. The bystanders became satisfied that they were equally matched in strength and skill, and the cool courage which Lincoln manifested throughout the ordeal prevented the usual close of such incidents with a fight. Instead of becoming chronic enemies and leaders of a neighborhood feud, Lincoln's self-possession and good temper turned the contest into the beginning of a warm and lasting friendship. If Lincoln's muscles were at times hungry for work, no less so was his mind. He was already instinctively feeling his way to his destiny when, in conversation with Mentor Graham, the schoolmaster, he indicated his desire to use some of his spare moments to increase his education, and confided to him his notion to study English grammar. It was entirely in the nature of things that Graham should encourage this mental craving and tell him, quote, if you expect to go before the public in any capacity, I think it the best thing you can do. End of quote. Lincoln said that if he had a grammar, he would begin at once. Graham was obliged to confess that there was no such book at New Salem, but remembered that there was one at Vayner's, six miles away. Promptly after breakfast the next morning, Lincoln walked to Vayner's and procured the precious volume, and, probably with Graham's occasional help, found no great difficulty in mastering its contents. While tradition does not mention any other study begun at that time, we may fairly infer that, slight as may have been Graham's education, he must have had other books from which, together with his friendly advice, Lincoln's intellectual hunger derived further stimulus and nourishment. In his duties at the store and his work at the mill, in his study of Kirkham's grammar and educational conversations with Mentor Graham, in the somewhat rude but frank and hearty companionship of the citizens of New Salem and the exuberant boys of Clary's Grove, Lincoln's life, for the second half of the year 1831, appears not to have been eventful, but was doubtless more comfortable and as interesting as had been his flatboat building and New Orleans voyage during the first half. He was busy in useful labor, and, though he had few chances to pick up scraps of schooling, was beginning to read deeply in that book of human nature, the profound knowledge of which rendered him such immense service in after years. The restlessness and ambition of the village of New Salem was many times multiplied in the restlessness and ambition of Springfield, fifteen or twenty miles away, which, located approximately near the geographical center of Illinois, was already beginning to crave, if not yet to feel, its future destiny as the capital of the state. In November of the same year, that aspiring town produced the first number of its weekly newspaper, the Sangamo Journal, and in its columns we begin to find recorded historical data. Situated in a region of alternating spaces of prairie and forest, of attractive natural scenery and rich soil, it was nevertheless at a great disadvantage in the means of commercial transportation. Lying sixty miles from Beardstown, the nearest landing on the Illinois River, the peculiarities of soil, climate, and primitive roads rendered travel and land carriage extremely difficult. 
often entirely impossible, for nearly half of every year. The very first number of the Sangamo Journal sounded its strongest note on the then leading tenant of the Whig Party. Internal improvements by the general government and active politics to secure them. In later numbers we learn that a regular Eastern mail had not been received for three weeks. The tide of immigration which was pouring into Illinois is illustrated in a tabular statement on the commerce of the Illinois River, showing that the steamboat arrivals at Beardstown had risen from one each in the years 1828 and 1829, and only four in 1830, to thirty-two during the year 1831. This naturally directed the thoughts of travelers and traders to some better means of reaching the river landing than the frozen or muddy roads and impassable creeks and sloughs of winter and spring. The use of the Sangamon River, flowing within five miles of Springfield and emptying itself into the Illinois ten or fifteen miles from Beardstown, seemed for the present the only solution of the problem, and a public meeting was called to discuss the project. The deep snows of the winter of 1830 and 31 abundantly filled the channels of that stream, and the winter of 1831 and 32 substantially repeated its swelling floods. Newcomers in that region were therefore warranted in drawing the inference that it might remain navigable for small craft. Public interest on the topic was greatly heightened when one Captain Bogue, commanding a small steamer then at Cincinnati, printed a letter in the journal of january twenty sixth eighteen thirty two saying quote, i intend to try to ascend the river sangamo immediately on the breaking up of the ice End of quote. it was well understood that the chief difficulty would be that the short turns in the channels were liable to be obstructed by a gorge of driftwood and the limbs and trunks of overhanging trees to provide for this, Captain Bogue's letter added, quote, I should be met at the mouth of the river by ten or twelve men, having axes with long handles under the direction of some experienced man. I shall deliver freight from St. Louis at the landing on the Sangamo River opposite the town of Springfield for thirty-seven and a half cents per hundred pounds. End of quote. The journal of February 16 contained an advertisement that the splendid upper cabin steamer Talisman would leave for Springfield, and the paper of March 1 announced her arrival at St. Louis on the 22nd of February with a full cargo. In due time the Citizen Committee appointed by the public meeting met the Talisman at the mouth of the Sangamon, and the journal of March 29th announced with great flourish that the steamboat talisman of one hundred and fifty tons burden arrived at the portland landing opposite this town on saturday last there was great local rejoicing over this demonstration that the sangamon was really navigable and the journal proclaimed with exultation that springfield could no longer be considered an inland town President Jackson's first term was nearing its close, and the Democratic Party was preparing to re-elect him. The Whigs, on their part, had held their first national convention in December 1831, and nominated Henry Clay to dispute the succession. This nomination, made almost a year in advance of the election, indicates an unusual degree of political activity in the East, and voters in the new state of Illinois were fired with an equal party zeal. During the months of January and February, 1832, no less than six citizens of Sangamon County announced themselves in the Sangamo Journal as candidates for the state legislature, the election for which was not to occur until August, and the Journal of March 15 printed a long letter addressed to the people of Sangamon County, under date of the ninth, signed A. Lincoln, and beginning, quote, Fellow citizens, having become a candidate for the honorable office of one of your representatives in the next General Assembly of this State, in accordance with an established custom and the principles of true republicanism, it becomes my duty to make known to you, the people whom I propose to represent, my sentiments with regard to local affairs. End of quote. 
He then takes up and discusses in an eminently methodical and practical way the absorbing topic of the moment, the Whig doctrine of internal improvements and its local application, the improvement of the Sangamon River. He mentions that meetings have been held to propose the construction of a railroad, and frankly acknowledges that, quote, no other improvement that reason will justify us in hoping for can equal in utility the railroad, end of quote, but contends that its enormous cost precludes any such hope that, therefore, quote, the improvement of the Sangamon River is an object much better suited to our infant resources, end of quote. Relating his experience in building and navigating his flatboat, and his observation of the stage of the water since then, he draws the very plausible conclusion that by straightening its channel and clearing away its driftwood, the stream can be made navigable, quote, to vessels of from twenty-five to thirty tons burden for at least one-half of all common years, and to vessels of much greater burden a part of the time, end of quote. His letter very modestly touches a few other points of needed legislation, a law against usury, laws to promote education, and amendments to estray and road laws. The main interest for us, however, is in the frank avowal of his personal ambition. Quote, Every man is said to have his peculiar ambition. Whether it be true or not, I can say, for one, that I have no other so great as that of being truly esteemed of my fellow men by rendering myself worthy of their esteem. How far I shall succeed in gratifying this ambition is yet to be developed. I am young, and unknown to many of you. I was born, and have ever remained, in the most humble walks of life. I have no wealthy or popular relations or friends to recommend me. My case is thrown exclusively upon the independent voters of the country, and if elected they will have conferred a favor upon me for which I shall be unremitting in my labors to compensate. But if the good people in their wisdom shall see fit to keep me in the background, I have been too familiar with disappointments to be very much chagrined. End of quote. This written and printed address gives us an accurate measure of the man and the time. When he wrote this document, he was twenty-three years old. He had been in the town and county only about nine months of actual time. As Sangamon County covered an estimated area of twenty-one hundred and sixty square miles, he could know but little of either it or its people. How dared a friendless, uneducated boy working on a flatboat at twelve dollars a month, with no wealthy or popular friends to recommend him, aspire to the honors and responsibilities of a legislator. The only answer is that he was prompted by that intuition of genius, that consciousness of powers which justify their claims by their achievements. When we scan the circumstances more closely, we find distinct evidence of some reason for his confidence. Relatively speaking, he was neither uneducated nor friendless. His acquirements were already far beyond the simple elements of reading, writing, and ciphering. He wrote a good, clear, serviceable hand. He could talk well and reason cogently. The simple, manly style of his printed address fully equals in literary ability that of the average collegian in the twenties. His migration from Indiana to Illinois, and his two voyages to New Orleans, had given him a glimpse of the outside world. His natural logic readily grasped the significance of the railroad as a new factor in transportation, although the first American locomotive had been built only one year, and ten to fifteen years were yet to elapse before the first railroad train was to run in Illinois. One other motive probably had its influence. He tells us that Offutt's business was failing, and his quick judgment warned him that he would soon be out of a job as clerk. This, however, could be only a secondary reason for announcing himself as a candidate, for the election was not to occur till August, and even if he were elected there would be neither service nor salary till the coming winter. His venture into politics must therefore be ascribed to the feeling which he so frankly announced in his letter, his ambition to become useful to his fellow men, the impulse that, throughout history, has singled out the great leaders of mankind." 
In this particular instance, a crisis was also at hand, calculated to develop and utilize the impulse. Just about a month after the publication of Lincoln's announcement, the Sangamo Journal of April 19 printed an official call from Governor Reynolds, directed to General Neal of the Illinois Militia, to organize 600 volunteers of his brigade for military service in a campaign against the Indians under Black Hawk, the war chief of the Sacs, who, in defiance of treaties and promises, had formed a combination with other tribes during the winter, and had now crossed back from the west to the east side of the Mississippi River, with the determination to reoccupy their old homes in the Rock River country toward the northern end of the state. In the memoranda which Mr. Lincoln furnished for a campaign biography, he thus relates what followed the call for troops. Quote, Abraham joined a volunteer company, and to his own surprise, was elected captain of it. He says he has not since had any success in life which gave him so much satisfaction. He went to the campaign, served near three months, met the ordinary hardships of such an expedition, but was in no battle. End of quote. Official documents furnish some further interesting details. As already said, the call was printed in the Sangamo Journal of April 19. On April 21, the company was organized at Richland, Sangamon County, and on April 28 was inspected and mustered into service at Beardstown and attached to Colonel Samuel Thompson's regiment, the 4th Illinois Mounted Volunteers. They marched at once to the hostile frontier. As the campaign shaped itself, it probably became evident to the company that they were not likely to meet any serious fighting, and, not having been enlisted for any stated period, they became clamorous to return home. The governor, therefore, had them and other companies mustered out of service at the mouth of Fox River on May 27. Not, however, wishing to weaken his forces before the arrival of new levies already on the way, he called for volunteers to remain twenty days longer. Lincoln had gone to the frontier to perform real service, not merely to enjoy military rank or reap military glory. On the same day, therefore, on which he was mustered out as captain, he re-enlisted and became Private Lincoln in Captain Iles's Company of Mounted Volunteers, organized apparently principally for scouting service, and sometimes called the Independent Spy Battalion. Among the other officers who imitated this patriotic example were General Whiteside and Major John T. Stewart, Lincoln's later law partner. The Independent Spy Battalion, having faithfully performed its new term of service, was finally mustered out on June 16, 1832. Lincoln and his messmate, George M. Harrison, had the misfortune to have their horses stolen the day before, but Harrison relates, quote, I laughed at our fate, and he joked at it, and we all started off merrily. The generous men of our company walked and rode by turns with us, and we fared about equal with the rest. But for this generosity our legs would have had to do the better work, for in that day this dreary route furnished no horses to buy or to steal, and, whether on horse or afoot, we always had company, for many of the horses' backs were too sore for riding. End of quote. Lincoln must have reached home about August 1, for the election was to occur in the second week of that month, and this left him but ten days in which to push his claims for popular endorsement. His friends, however, had been doing manful duty for him during his three months' absence, and he lost nothing in public estimation by his prompt enlistment to defend the frontier. Successive announcements in the journal had by this time swelled the list of candidates to thirteen but Sangamon County was entitled to only four representatives, and when the returns came in, Lincoln was among those defeated. Nevertheless, he made a very respectable showing in the race. The list of successful and unsuccessful aspirants and their votes was as follows. E. D. Taylor, 1,127. John T. Stewart, 991. Achilles Morris, 945. Peter Cartwright, 815. Under the plurality rule, these four had been elected. 
The unsuccessful candidates were A. G. Herndon, 806, W. Carpenter, 774, J. Dawson, 717, A. Lincoln, 657, T. M. Neal, 571, R. Quinton, 485, Z. Peter, 214, E. Robinson, 169, Kirkpatrick, 44. The returns show that the total vote of the county was about 2,168. Comparing this with the vote cast for Lincoln, we see that he received nearly one-third of the total county vote, notwithstanding his absence from the canvas, notwithstanding the fact that his acquaintanceship was limited to the neighborhood of New Salem, notwithstanding the sharp competition. Indeed, his talent and fitness for active practical politics were demonstrated beyond question by the result in his home precinct of New Salem, which, though he ran as a Whig, gave 277 votes for him and only three against him. Three months later it gave 185 for the Jackson and only 70 for the Clay electors, proving Lincoln's personal popularity. He remembered for the remainder of his life with great pride that this was the only time he was ever beaten on a direct vote of the people. The result of the election brought him to one of the serious crises of his life, which he forcibly stated in after years in the following written words, quote, He was now without means and out of business, but was anxious to remain with his friends who had treated him with so much generosity especially as he had nothing elsewhere to go to. He studied what he should do, thought of learning the blacksmith trade, thought of trying to study law, rather thought he could not succeed at that without a better education. End of quote. The perplexing problem between inclination and means to follow it, the struggle between conscious talent and the restraining fetters of poverty, has come to millions of young Americans before and since, but perhaps to none with a sharper trial of spirit or more resolute patience. Before he had definitely resolved upon either career, chance served not to solve, but to postpone his difficulty, and in the end to greatly increase it. New Salem, which apparently never had any good reason for becoming a town, seems already at that time to have entered on the road to rapid decay. Offutt's speculations had failed, and he had disappeared. The brothers Herndon, who had opened a new store, found business dull and uncompromising. Becoming tired of their undertaking, they offered to sell out to Lincoln and Barry on credit, and took their promissory notes in payment. The new partners, in that excess of hope which usually attends all new ventures, also bought two other similar establishments that were in extremity and for these likewise gave their notes. It is evident that the confidence which Lincoln had inspired while he was a clerk in Offutt's store, and the enthusiastic support he had received as a candidate, were the basis of credit that sustained these several commercial transactions. It turned out in the long run that Lincoln's credit and the popular confidence that supported it were as valuable both to his creditors and himself as if the sums which stood over his signature had been gold coin in a solvent bank. But this transmutation was not attained until he had passed through a very furnace of financial embarrassment. Barry proved a worthless partner, and the business a sorry failure. Seeing this, Lincoln and Barry sold out again on credit, to the Trent brothers, who soon broke up and ran away. Barry also departed and died, and finally all the notes came back upon Lincoln for payment. He was unable to meet these obligations, but he did the next best thing. He remained, promised to pay when he could, and most of his creditors, maintaining their confidence in his integrity, patiently bided their time till, in the course of long years, he fully justified it by paying, with interest, every cent of what he learned to call, in humorous satire upon his own folly, the national debt. With one of them he was not so fortunate. Van Bergen, who bought one of the Lincolnberry notes, obtained judgment, and by peremptory sale, 
swept away the horse, saddle, and surveying instruments with the daily use of which Lincoln, quote, procured bread and kept body and soul together, unquote, to use his own words. But here again, Lincoln's recognized honesty was his safety. Out of personal friendship, James Short bought the property and restored it to the young surveyor, giving him time to repay. It was not until his return from Congress, seventeen years after the purchase of the store, that he finally relieved himself of the last installments of his national debt. But by these seventeen years of sober industry, rigid economy, and unflinching faith to his obligations, he earned the title of Honest Old Abe, which proved of greater service to himself and his country than if he had gained the wealth of Croesus. Out of this ill-starred commercial speculation, however, Lincoln derived one incidental benefit, and it may be said it became the determining factor in his career. It is evident from his own language that he underwent a severe mental struggle in deciding whether he would become a blacksmith or a lawyer. In taking a middle course, and trying to become a merchant, he probably kept the latter choice strongly in view. It seems well established by local tradition that during the period while the Lincoln Berry store was running its foredoomed course from bad to worse, Lincoln employed all the time he could spare from his customers, and he probably had many leisure hours, in reading and studying of various kinds. This habit was greatly stimulated and assisted by his being appointed, May 7, 1833, postmaster at New Salem, which office he continued to hold until May 30, 1836, when New Salem partially disappeared and the office was removed to Petersburg. The influences which brought about the selection of Lincoln were not recorded, but it is suggested that he had acted for some time as deputy postmaster under the former incumbent, and thus became the natural successor. Evidently his politics formed no objection, as New Salem Precinct had at the August election, when he ran as a Whig, given him its almost solid vote for representative, notwithstanding the fact that it was more than two-thirds democratic. The postmastership increased his public consideration and authority, broadened his business experience, and the newspapers he handled provided him an abundance of reading matter on topics of both local and national importance up to the latest dates. Those were stirring times, even on the frontier. The Sangamo Journal of December 30, 1832, printed Jackson's nullification proclamation. The same paper, of March 9, 1833, contained an editorial on Clay's Compromise, and that of the 16th had a notice of the great nullification debate in Congress. The speeches of Clay, Calhoun, and Webster were published in full during the following month, and Mr. Lincoln could not well help reading them and joining in the feelings and comments they provoked. While the town of New Salem was locally dying, the county of Sangamon and the state of Illinois were having what is now called a boom. Other wide-awake newspapers, such as the Missouri Republican and Louisville Journal, abounded in notices of the establishment of new stage lines and the general rush of immigration. But the joyous dream of the New Salemites, that the Sangamon River would become a commercial highway, quickly faded. The talisman was obliged to hurry back down the rapidly falling stream, tearing away a portion of the famous dam to permit her departure. There were rumors that another steamer, the Sylph, would establish regular trips between Springfield and Beardstown, but she never came. The freshets and floods of 1831 and 1832 were succeeded by a series of dry seasons, and the navigation of the Sangamon River was never afterward a telling plank in the county platform of either political party. End of chapter 2. Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois. Chapter 3 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. 
The Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay Chapter 3 Appointed Deputy Surveyor Elected to Legislature in 1834 Campaign Issues Begins Study of Law Internal Improvement System The Lincoln Stone Protest Candidate for Speaker in 1838 and 1840. When Lincoln was appointed postmaster in May 1833, the Lincoln Berry Store had not yet completely winked out, to use his own picturesque phrase. When at length he ceased to be a merchant, he yet remained a government official, a man of consideration and authority, who still had a responsible occupation and definite home, where he could read, write, and study. The proceeds of his office were doubtless very meager, but in that day, when the rate of postage on letters was still twenty-five cents, a little change now and then came into his hands, which, in the scarcity of money prevailing on the frontier, had an importance difficult for us to appreciate. His positions as candidate for the legislature and as postmaster probably had much to do in bringing him another piece of good fortune. In the rapid settlement of Illinois in Sangamon County, and the obtaining titles to farms by purchase or preemption, as well as in the locating and opening of new roads, the county surveyor had more work on his hands than he could perform throughout a county extending forty miles east and west and fifty north and south, and was compelled to appoint deputies to assist him. The name of the county surveyor was John Calhoun, recognized by all his contemporaries in Sangamon as a man of education and talent, and an aspiring democratic politician. It was not an easy matter for Calhoun to find properly qualified deputies, and when he became acquainted with Lincoln, and learned his attainments and aptitudes, and the estimation in which he was held by the people of New Salem, he wisely concluded to utilize his talents and standing, notwithstanding their difference in politics. The incident is thus recorded by Lincoln, quote, the surveyor of Sangamon offered to depute to Abraham that portion of his work which was within his part of the county. He accepted, procured a compass and chain, studied Flint and Gibson a little, and went at it. This procured bread, and kept soul and body together. Unquote. Tradition has it that Calhoun not only gave him the appointment, but lent him the book in which to study the art, which he accomplished in a period of six weeks, aided by the schoolmaster, Mentor Graham. The exact period of this increase in knowledge and business capacity is not recorded, but it must have taken place in the summer of 1833, as there exists a certificate of survey in Lincoln's handwriting, signed J. Calhoun, S.S.C., by A. Lincoln, dated January 14, 1834. Before June of that year, he had surveyed and located a public road from, quote, quote, Music's Ferry on Salt Creek, via New Salem, to the county line in the direction to Jacksonville, unquote, 26 miles and 70 chains in length, the exact course of which survey, with detailed bearings and distances, was drawn on common white-letter paper pasted in a long slip, to a scale of two inches to the mile, in ordinary yet clear and distinct penmanship. The compensation he received for this service was three dollars per day for five days, and two dollars and fifty cents for making the plat and report. An advertisement in the journal shows that the regular fees of another deputy were, quote, two dollars per day, or one dollar per lot of eight acres or less, and fifty cents for a single line, with ten cents per mile for traveling. While this class of work, and his post office, with its emoluments, probably amply supplied his board, lodging, and clothing, it left him no surplus with which to pay his debts. For it was in the latter part of the same year, 1834, that Van Bergen caused his horse and surveying instruments to be sold under the hammer, as already related. Meanwhile, amid these fluctuations of good and bad luck, Lincoln maintained his equanimity, his steady, persevering industry, and his hopeful ambition and confidence in the future. Through all his misfortunes and his failures, he preserved his self-respect and his determination to succeed. Two years had nearly elapsed since he was defeated for the legislature, and, having received so flattering a vote on that occasion, it was entirely natural that he should determine to try a second chance. Four new representatives were to be chosen at the August election of 1834, and, near the end of April, Lincoln published his announcement that he would again be a candidate. 
he could certainly view his expectations in every way in a more hopeful light. His knowledge had increased, his experience broadened, his acquaintanceship greatly increased, his talents were acknowledged, his ability recognized. He was postmaster and deputy surveyor. He had become a public character whose services were in demand. As compared with the majority of his neighbors, he was a man of learning who had seen the world. Greater, however, than all these advantages, his sympathetic kindness of heart, his sincere, open frankness, his sturdy, unshrinking honesty, and that inborn sense of justice that yielded to no influence, made up a nobility of character and bearing that impressed the rude frontiersman as much as, if not more quickly and deeply than, it would have done the most polished and erudite society. Beginning his campaign in April, he had three full months before him for electioneering, and he evidently used the time to good advantage. The pursuit of popularity probably consisted mainly of the same methods that in backwoods districts prevail even to our day, personal visits and solicitations, attendance at various kinds of neighborhood gatherings, such as raisings of new cabins, horse races, shooting matches, sales of town lots, or of personal property under execution, or whatever occasion served to call a dozen or two of the settlers together. One recorded incident illustrates the practical nature of the politician's art at that day. Quote, he, Lincoln, came to my house, near Island Grove, during harvest. There were some thirty men in the field. He got his dinner and went out in the field where the men were at work. I gave him an introduction, and the boys said that they could not vote for a man unless he could make a hand. Well, boys, said he, if that is all, I am sure of your votes. He took hold of the cradle, and led the way all the round with perfect ease. The boys were satisfied, and I don't think he lost a vote in the crowd. Unquote. Sometimes two or more candidates would meet at such places, and short speeches be called for and given. Altogether, the campaign was livelier than that of two years before. Thirteen candidates were again contesting for the four seats in the legislature, to say nothing of candidates for governor, for Congress, and for the state Senate. The scope of discussion was enlarged and localized. From the published address of an industrious aspirant who received only 92 votes, we learn that the issues now were the construction by the general government of a canal from Lake Michigan to the Illinois River, the improvement of the Sangamon River, the location of the state capitol at Springfield, a United States bank, a better road law, and amendments to the Estray laws. When the election returns came in, Lincoln had reason to be satisfied with the efforts he had made. He received the second highest number of votes in the long list of candidates. Those cast for the representatives chosen stood Dawson, 1390, Lincoln, 1376, Carpenter, 1170, Stewart, 1164. The location of the state capital had also been submitted to popular vote at this election. Springfield, being much nearer the geographical center of the state, was anxious to deprive Vandalia of that honor, and the activity of the Sangamon politicians proved it to be a dangerous rival. In the course of a month, the returns from all parts of the state had come in, and showed that Springfield was third in the race. It must be frankly admitted that Lincoln's success at this juncture was one of the most important events of his life. A second defeat might have discouraged his efforts to lift himself to a professional career, and sent him to the anvil to make horseshoes and to iron wagons for the balance of his days. But this handsome popular endorsement assured his standing and confirmed his credit. With this lift into the clouds of his horizon, he could resolutely carry his burden of debt and hopefully look to wider fields of public usefulness. Already, during the progress of the canvass, he had received cheering encouragement and promise of most valuable help. One of the four successful candidates was John T. Stewart, who had been major of volunteers in the Black Hawk War while Lincoln was captain, and who, together with Lincoln, had re-enlisted as a private in the Independent Spy Battalion. There is every likelihood that the two begun a personal friendship during their military service, which was, of course, strongly cemented by their being fellow candidates and both belonging to the Whig party. Mr. Lincoln relates, quote, Major John T. Stewart, then in full practice of the law at Springfield, was also elected. 
During the canvass, in a private conversation, he encouraged Abraham to study law. After the election, he borrowed books of Stuart, took them home with him, and went at it in good earnest. He studied with nobody. In the autumn of 1836, he obtained a law license, and on April 15, 1837, removed to Springfield and commenced the practice, his old friend Stuart taking him into partnership. Unquote. From and after this election in 1834 as a representative, Lincoln was a permanent factor in the politics and the progress of Sangamon County. At a Springfield meeting in the following November, to promote common schools, he was appointed one of eleven delegates to attend a convention at Vandalia, called to deliberate on that subject. He was re-elected to the legislature in 1836, in 1838, and in 1840, and thus, for a period of eight years, took a full share in shaping and enacting the public and private laws of Illinois, which in our day has become one of the leading states in the Mississippi Valley. Of Lincoln's share in that legislation, it need only be said that it was as intelligent and beneficial to the public interest as that of the best of his colleagues. The most serious error committed by the legislature of Illinois during that period was that it enacted law setting on foot an extensive system of internal improvements, in the form of railroads and canals, altogether beyond the actual needs of transportation for the then existing population of the state, and the consequent reckless creation of a state debt for money borrowed at extravagant interest in liberal commissions. The state underwent a season of speculative intoxication, in which, by the promised and expected rush of immigration, and the swelling currents of its business, its farms were suddenly to become villages, its villages spreading towns, and its towns transformed into great cities, while all its people were to be made rich by the increased value of their land and property. Both parties entered with equal recklessness into this ill-advised internal improvement system, which, in the course of about four years, brought the state to bankruptcy, with no substantial works to show for the foolishly expended millions. In voting for these measures, Mr. Lincoln represented the public opinion and wish of his county and the whole state, and while he was as blamable, he was at the same time no more so than the wisest of his colleagues. It must be remembered in extenuation that he was just beginning his parliamentary education. From the very first, however, he seems to have become a force in the legislature, and to have rendered special service to his constituents. It is conceded that the one object which Springfield and most of Sangamon County had at heart was the removal of the capital from Vandalia to that place. This was accomplished in 1836, and the management of the measure appears to have been entrusted mainly to Mr. Lincoln. One incident of his legislative career stands out in such prominent relation to the great events of his afterlife that it deserves special explanation and emphasis. Even at that early date, a quarter of a century before the outbreak of the Civil War, the slavery question was now and then obtruding itself as an irritating and perplexing element into the local legislation of almost every new state. Illinois, though guaranteed its freedom by the Ordinance of 1787, nevertheless underwent a severe political struggle, in which, about four years after her admission into the Union, politicians and settlers from the South made a determined effort to change her to a slave state. The legislature of 1822-1823, with a two-thirds pro-slavery majority of the state Senate, and a technical, but legally questionable, two-thirds majority in the House, submitted to popular vote an act calling a state convention to change the Constitution. It happened, fortunately, that Governor Coles, though a Virginian, was strongly anti-slavery, and gave the weight of his official influence and his whole four-year salary to counteract the dangerous scheme. From the fact that Southern Illinois, up to that time, was mostly peopled from the slave states, the result was seriously in doubt through an active and exciting campaign, and the convention was finally defeated by a majority of 1,800, and a total vote of 11,612. While this result effectually decided that Illinois would remain a free state, the propagandism and reorganization left a deep and tenacious undercurrent of pro-slavery opinion that, for many years, 
manifested itself in vehement and intolerant outcries against abolitionism, which on one occasion caused the murder of Elijah P. Lovejoy for persisting in his right to print an anti-slavery newspaper at Alton. Nearly a year before this tragedy, the Illinois legislature had under consideration certain resolutions from the eastern states on the subject of slavery, and the committee to which they had been referred reported a set of resolves highly disapproving abolition societies, holding that the right of property in slaves is secured to the slaveholding states by the federal constitution, together with other phraseology calculated on the whole to soothe and comfort pro-slavery sentiment. After much irritating discussion, the committee's resolutions were finally passed, with but Lincoln and five others voting in the negative. No record remains whether or not Lincoln joined in the debate, but, to leave no doubt upon his exact position and feeling, he and his colleague, Dan Stone, caused the following protest to be formally entered on the journals of the House. Quote, Resolutions upon the subject of domestic slavery, having passed both branches of the General Assembly at its present session, the undersigned hereby protest against the passage of the same. They believe that the institution of slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy, but that the promulgation of abolition doctrines tends rather to increase than abate its evils. They believe that the Congress of the United States has no power under the Constitution to interfere with the institution of slavery in the different states. They believe that the Congress of the United States has the power, under the Constitution, to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, but that the power ought not to be exercised unless at the request of the people of the district. The difference between these opinions and those contained in the said resolutions is their reasons for entering this protest. Unquote. In view of the great scope and quality of Lincoln's public service in afterlife, it would be a waste of time to trace out in detail his words or his votes upon the multitude of questions on which he acted during this legislative career of eight years. It needs only to be remembered that it formed a varied and thorough school of parliamentary practice and experience that laid the broad foundation of that extraordinary skill and sagacity in statesmanship which he afterward displayed in party controversy and executive direction. The quick proficiency and ready aptitude for leadership evidenced by him in this, as it may be called, his preliminary parliamentary school are strikingly proved by the fact that the Whig members of the Illinois House of Representatives gave him their full party vote for Speaker, both in 1838 and 1840. But, being in a minority, they could not, of course, elect him. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 4 Law Practice. Rules for a Lawyer. Law and Politics. Twin Occupations, The Springfield Coterie, Friendly Help, Anne Rutledge, Mary Owens. Lincoln's removal from New Salem to Springfield and his entrance into a law partnership with Major John T. Stewart begin a distinctively new period in his career. From this point, we need not trace in detail his progress in his new and this time deliberately chosen vocation. The lawyer who works his way up in professional merit, from a five-dollar fee in a suit before a justice of the peace, to a five-thousand-dollar fee before the Supreme Court of his state, has a long and difficult path to climb. Mr. Lincoln climbed this path for twenty-five years, with industry, perseverance, patience. Above all, with that sense of moral responsibility that always clearly traced the dividing line between his duty to his client and his duty to society and truth. 
his unqualified frankness of statement assured him the confidence of judge and jury in every argument. His habit of fully admitting the weak points in his case gained their close attention to its strong ones, and, when clients brought him bad cases, his uniform advice was not to begin the suit. Among his miscellaneous writings, there exist some fragments of autograph notes, evidently intended for a little lecture or talk to law students, which set forth with brevity and force his opinion of what a lawyer ought to be and do. He earnestly commands diligence in study, and, next to diligence, promptness in keeping up his work. As a general rule, never take your whole fee in advance, he says, nor any more than a small retainer. When fully paid beforehand, you are more than a common mortal if you can feel the same interest in the case as if something was still in prospect for you as well as for your client. Extemporaneous speaking should be practiced and cultivated. It is the lawyer's avenue to the public. However able and faithful he may be in other respects, people are slow to bring him business if he cannot make a speech. And yet, there is not a more fatal error to young lawyers than relying too much on speech-making. If anyone, upon his rare powers of speaking, shall claim an exemption from the drudgery of the law, his case is a failure in advance. Discourage litigation. Persuade your neighbors to compromise whenever you can. Point out to them how the nominal winner is often a real loser, in fees, expenses, and waste of time. As a peacemaker, the lawyer has a superior opportunity of being a good man. There will still be business enough. Never stir up litigation. A worse man can scarcely be found than one who does this. Who can be more nearly a fiend than he who habitually overhauls the register of deeds in search of defects and titles, whereon to stir up strife and put money in his pocket? A moral tone ought to be infused into the profession, which should drive such men out of it. There is a vague popular belief that lawyers are necessarily dishonest. I say vague, because when we consider to what extent confidence and honors are opposed in and conferred upon lawyers by the people, it appears improbable that their impression of dishonesty is very distinct and vivid. Yet the impression is common, almost universal. Let no young man choosing the law for a calling for a moment yield to the popular belief. Resolve to be honest at all events. And if, in your own judgment, you cannot be an honest lawyer, resolve to be honest without being a lawyer. Choose some other occupation, rather than one in the choosing of which you do, in advance, consent to be a knave. While Lincoln thus became a lawyer, he did not cease to remain a politician. In the early West, law and politics were parallel roads to usefulness as well as distinction. Newspapers had not then reached any considerable circulation. There existed neither fast presses to print them, mail routes to carry them, nor subscribers to read them. Since even the laws had to be newly framed for these new communities, the lawyer became the inevitable political instructor and guide as far as ability and fame extended. His reputation as a lawyer was a twin of his influence as an orator, whether through logic or eloquence. Local conditions fostered, almost necessitated, this double pursuit. Westward immigration was in its full tide, and population was pouring into the great state of Illinois with ever-accelerating rapidity. Settlements were spreading, roads were being opened, towns laid out, the larger counties divided and new ones organized, and the enthusiastic visions of coming prosperity threw the state into that fever of speculation which culminated in wholesale internal improvements on borrowed capital and brought collapse, stagnation, and bankruptcy in its inevitable train. As already said, these swift changes required a plentiful supply of new laws, to frame which lawyers were in a large proportion sent to the legislature every two years. These same lawyers also filled the bar and recruited the bench of the new state, and, as they followed the itinerant circuit courts from county to county in their various sections, were called upon in these summer wanderings to explain in public speeches their legislative work of the winter. By a natural connection, this also involved a discussion of national and party issues. 
it was also during this period that party activity was stimulated by the general adoption of the new system of party caucuses and party conventions to which President Jackson had given the impulse. In the American system of representative government, elections not only occur with the regularity of clockwork, but pervade the whole organism in every degree of its structure from top to bottom, federal, state, county, township, and school district. In Illinois, even the state judiciary has, at different times, been chosen by popular ballot. The function of the politician, therefore, is one of continuous watchfulness and activity, and he must have intimate knowledge of details if he would work out grand results. Activity in politics also produces eager competition and sharp rivalry. In 1839, the seat of government was definitely transferred from Vandalia to Springfield, and there soon gathered at the new state capital a group of young men whose varied ability and future success in public service has rarely been excelled. Douglas, Shields, Calhoun, Stewart, Logan, Baker, Treat, Hardin, Trumbull, McClernand, Browning, McDougall, and others. His new surroundings greatly stimulated and reinforced Mr. Lincoln's growing experience and spreading acquaintance, giving him a larger share and wider influence in local and state politics. He became a valued and sagacious adviser in party caucuses, and a power in party conventions. Gradually, also, his gifts as an attractive and persuasive campaign speaker were making themselves felt and appreciated. His removal, in April 1837, from a village of twenty houses to a city of about two thousand inhabitants, placed him in striking new relations and necessities as to dress, manners, and society, as well as politics. Yet here again, as in the case of his removal from his father's cabin to New Salem six years before, peculiar conditions rendered the transition less abrupt than would at first appear. Springfield, notwithstanding its greater population and prospective dignity as the capital, was in many respects no great improvement on New Salem. It had no public buildings, its streets and sidewalks were unpaved, its stores, in spite of all their flourish of advertisements, were staggering under the hard times of 1837 to 1839, and stagnation of business imposed a rigid economy on all classes. If we may credit tradition, this was one of the most serious crises of Lincoln's life. His intimate friend, William Butler, related to the writer that, having attended a session of the legislature at Vandalia, he and Lincoln returned together at its close to Springfield, by the usual mode of horseback travel. At one of their stopping places overnight, Lincoln, in one of his gloomy moods, told Butler the story of the almost hopeless prospects which lay immediately before him. That the session was over, his salary all drawn, and his money all spent, that he had no resources and no work, that he did not know where to turn to earn even a week's board. Butler bade him be of good cheer, and, without any formal proposition or agreement, took him and his belongings to his own house, and domesticated him there as a permanent guest, with Lincoln's tacit compliance rather than any definite consent. Later, Lincoln shared a room in genial companionship, which ripened into closest intimacy, in the store of his friend Joshua F. Speed, all without charge or expense. And these brotherly offerings helped the young lawyer over present necessities which might otherwise have driven him to muscular handiwork at weekly or monthly wages. From this time onward, in daily conversation, in argument at the bar, in political consultation and discussion, Lincoln's life gradually broadened into contact with the leading professional minds of the growing state of Illinois. The man who could not pay a week's board bill was twice more elected to the legislature, was invited to public banquets and toasted by name, became a popular speaker, moved in the best society of the new capital, and made what was considered a brilliant marriage. Lincoln's stature and strength, his intelligence and ambition, in short, all the elements which gave him popularity among men in New Salem, rendered him equally attractive to the fair sex of that village. On the other hand, his youth, his frank sincerity, his longing for sympathy and encouragement, made him peculiarly sensitive to the society and influence of women. 
soon after coming to New Salem, he chanced much in the society of Miss Anne Rutledge, a slender, blue-eyed blonde, nineteen years old, moderately educated, beautiful according to local standards, an altogether lovely, tender-hearted, universally admired, and generally fascinating girl. From the personal descriptions of her which tradition has preserved, the inference is naturally drawn that her temperament and disposition were very much akin to those of Mr. Lincoln himself. It is little wonder, therefore, that he fell in love with her. But two years before, she had become engaged to a Mr. McNamara, who had gone to the East to settle certain family affairs, and whose absence became so unaccountably prolonged that Anne finally despaired of his return, and in time betrothed herself to Lincoln. A year or so after this event, Anne Rutledge was taken sick and died, the neighbors said of a broken heart, but the doctor called it brain fever, and his science was more likely to be correct than their psychology. Whatever may have been the truth upon this point, the incident threw Lincoln into profound grief, in a period of melancholy so absorbing as to cause his friends apprehension for his own health. Gradually, however, their studied and devoted companionship won him back to cheerfulness, and his second affair of the heart assumed altogether different characteristics, most of which may be gathered from his own letters. Two years before the death of Anne Rutledge, Mr. Lincoln had seen and made the acquaintance of Miss Mary Owens, who had come to visit her sister, Mrs. Abel, and had passed about four weeks in New Salem, after which she returned to Kentucky. Three years later, and perhaps a year after Miss Rutledge's death, Mrs. Abel, before starting for Kentucky, told Mr. Lincoln, probably more in jest than in earnest, that she would bring her sister back with her, on condition that he would become her, Mrs. Abel's, brother-in-law. Lincoln, also probably more in jest than earnest, promptly agreed to the proposition, for he remembered Mary Owens as a tall, handsome, dark-haired girl with fair skin and large blue eyes, who in conversation could be intellectual and serious, as well as jovial and witty, who had a liberal education, and was considered wealthy, one of those well-poised, steady characters who look upon matrimony and life with practical views and social matronly instincts. The bantering offer was made and accepted in the autumn of 1836, and in the following April Mr. Lincoln removed to Springfield. Before this occurred, however, he was surprised to learn that Mary Owens had actually returned with her sister from Kentucky, and felt that the romantic jest had become a serious and practical question. Their first interview dissipated some of the illusions in which each had been indulged. The three years elapsed since they first met had greatly changed her personal appearance. She had become stout. Her twenty-eight years, one year more than his, had somewhat hardened the lines of her face. Both in figure and feature, she presented a disappointing contrast to the slim and not yet totally forgotten Anne Rutledge. On her part, it was more than likely that she did not find in him all the attractions her sister had pictured. The speech and manners of the Illinois frontier lacked much of the chivalric attentions and flattering compliments to which the Kentucky beaux were addicted. He was yet a diamond in the rough, and she would not immediately decide till she could better understand his character and prospects, so no formal engagement resulted. In December, Lincoln went to his legislative duties at Vandalia, and in the following April took up his permanent abode in Springfield. Such a separation was not favorable to rapid courtship, yet they had occasional interviews and exchanged occasional letters. None of hers to him have been preserved, and only three of his to her. From these it appears that they sometimes discussed their affair in a cold, hypothetical way, even down to problems of housekeeping, in the light of mere worldly prudence, much as if they were guardians arranging a mariage de convenance, rather than impulsive and ardent lovers wandering in Arcady. Without Mrs. Owen's letters, it is impossible to know what she may have said to him, but in May 1837, Lincoln wrote to her, quote, I am often thinking of what we said about your coming to live at Springfield. I am afraid you would not be satisfied. There is a great deal of flourishing about in carriages here, which it would be your doom to see without sharing it. You would have to be poor, without the means of hiding your poverty. 
do you believe you could bear that patiently? Whatever woman may cast her lot with mine, should any ever do so, it is my intention to do all in my power to make her happy and contented, and there is nothing I can imagine that would make me more unhappy than to fail in the effort. I know I should be much happier with you than the way I am, provided I saw no signs of discontent in you. What you have said to me may have been in the way of jest, or I may have misunderstood it. If so, then let it be forgotten. If otherwise, I much wish you would think seriously before you decide. What I have said I will most positively abide by, provided you wish it. My opinion is that you had better not do it. You have not been accustomed to hardship, and it may be more severe than you now imagine. I know you are capable of thinking correctly on any subject, and if you deliberate maturely upon this before you decide, then I am willing to abide your decision. Unquote. Whether, after receiving this, she wrote him the good long letter he asked for in the same epistle is not known. Apparently they did not meet again until August, and the interview must have been marked by reserve and coolness on both sides, which left each more uncertain than before, for on the same day Lincoln again wrote her, and, after saying that she might perhaps be mistaken in regard to his real feelings towards her, continued thus, quote, I want in all cases to do right, and most particularly so in all cases with women. I want at this particular time, more than anything else, to do right with you and if I knew it would be doing right, as I rather suspect it would, to let you alone, I would do it. And for the purpose of making the matter as plain as possible, I now say that you can now drop the subject, dismiss your thoughts, if you ever had any, from me forever, and leave this letter unanswered, without calling forth one accusing murmur from me. And I will even go further, and say that if it will add anything to your comfort or peace of mind to do so, it is my sincere wish that you should. Do not understand by this that I wish to cut your acquaintance. I mean no such thing. What I do wish is that our further acquaintance shall depend upon yourself. If such further acquaintance would contribute nothing to your happiness, I am sure it would not to mine. If you feel yourself in any degree bound to me, I am now willing to release you, provided you wish it. While, on the other hand, I am willing, and even anxious, to bind you faster if I can be convinced that it will, in any considerable degree, add to your happiness. This, indeed, is the whole question with me. Unquote. All that we know of the sequel is contained in a letter which Lincoln wrote to his friend Mrs. Browning nearly a year later, after Miss Owens had finally returned to Kentucky, in which, without mentioning the lady's name, he gave a serio-comic description of what might be called a courtship to escape matrimony. He dwells on his disappointment at her changed appearance, and continues, quote, But what could I do? I had told her sister that I would take her for better or for worse, and I made a point of honor and conscience in all things to stick to my word, especially if others had been induced to act on it, which in this case I had no doubt they had, for I was now fairly convinced that no other man on earth would have her, and hence the conclusion that they were bent on holding me to my bargain. Well, thought I, I have said it, and, be the consequences what they may, it shall not be my fault if I fail to do it. Although I was fixed, firm as the surge-repelling rock in my resolution, I found I was continually repenting the rashness which had led me to make it. Through life I have been in no bondage, either real or imaginary, from the thraldom of which I so much desired to be free. After I had delayed the matter as long as I thought I could in honor do, which, by the way, had brought me round into last fall, I concluded I might as well bring it to a consummation without further delay, and so I mustered my resolution and made the proposal to her direct. But, shocking to relate, she answered, no. At first I suppose she did it through an affectation of modesty, which I thought but ill became her under the peculiar circumstances of her case but on my renewal of the charge, I found she repelled it with greater firmness than before. I tried it again and again, but with the same success, or rather with the same want of success. I finally was forced to give it up, at which I very unexpectedly found myself mortified almost beyond endurance. I was mortified, it seemed to me, in a hundred different ways. 
my vanity was deeply wounded by the reflection that I had so long been too stupid to discover her intentions, and at the same time never doubting that I understood them perfectly, and also that she, whom I had taught myself to believe nobody else would have, had actually rejected me with all my fancied greatness. And to cap the whole, I then, for the first time, began to suspect that I was really a little in love with her." Unquote. The serious side of this letter is undoubtedly genuine and candid, while the somewhat over-exaggeration of the comic side points as clearly that he had not fully recovered from the mental suffering he had undergone in the long conflict between doubt and duty. From the beginning, the matchmaking zeal of the sister had placed the parties in a false position, produced embarrassment, and created distrust. A different beginning might have resulted in a very different outcome, for Lincoln, while objecting to her corpulency, acknowledges that in both feature and intellect she was as attractive as any woman he had ever met, and Miss Owens's letters, written after his death, state that her principal objection lay in the fact that his training had been different from hers, and that Mr. Lincoln was deficient in those little links which make up the chain of a woman's happiness. She adds, The last message I ever received from him was about a year after we parted in Illinois. Mrs. Abel visited Kentucky, and he said to her in Springfield, Tell your sister that I think she was a great fool because she did not stay here and marry me. She was even then not quite clear in her own mind, but that his words were true. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rob Powell. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter Five Springfield Society, Miss Mary Todd. Lincoln's Engagement, His Deep Despondency, Visit to Kentucky, Letters to Speed, The Shields Duel, Marriage, Law Partnership with Logan, Hardin, Nominated for Congress, 1843, Baker, Nominated for Congress, 1844, Lincoln, Nominated and Elected, 1846. The deep impression which the Mary Owens affair made upon Lincoln is further shown by one of the concluding phrases of his letter to Mrs. Browning. I have now come to the conclusion never again to think of marrying. But it was not long before a reaction set in from this pessimistic mood. The actual transfer of the seat of government from Vandalia to Springfield in 1839 gave the new capital fresh animation. Business revived, public improvements were begun. Politics ran high. Already there was a spirit in the air that in the following year culminated in the extraordinary enthusiasm and fervor of the Harrison presidential campaign of 1840, that rollicking and uproarious party carnival of humor and satire, of song and jollification, of hard cider and log cabins. While the state of Illinois was strongly democratic, Sangamon County was as distinctly Whig, and the local party disputes were hot and aggressive. The Whig delegation of Sangamon in the legislature, popularly called the Long Nine because the sum of the stature of its members was 54 feet, became noted for its influence in legislation in a body where the majority was against them, and of these Mr. Lincoln was the tallest, both in person and ability, as was recognized by his twice receiving the minority vote for a Speaker of the House. Society also began organizing itself upon metropolitan rather than provincial assumptions. As yet, however, society was liberal. Men of either wealth or position were still too few to fill its ranks. Energy, ambition, talent were necessarily the standard of admission, and Lincoln, though poor as a church mouse, was as welcome as those who could wear ruffled shirts and carry gold watches. The meetings of the legislature at Springfield then first brought together that splendid group of young men of genius whose phenomenal careers and distinguished services have given Illinois fame in the history of the nation. 
It is a marked peculiarity of the American character that the bitterest foes in party warfare generally meet each other on terms of perfect social courtesy in the drawing rooms of society. And future presidential candidates, cabinet members, senators, congressmen, jurists, orators, and battle heroes lent the little social reunions of Springfield a zest and exultation never found, perhaps impossible, amid the heavy, oppressive surroundings of conventional ceremony, gorgeous upholstery, and magnificent decorations. It was at this period also that Lincoln began to feel and exercise his expanding influence and powers as a writer and speaker. Already, two years earlier, he had written and delivered the Young Men's Lyceum of Springfield an address upon the perpetuation of our political institutions, strongly enforcing the doctrine of rigid obedience to law. In December 1839, Douglas, in a heated conversation, challenged the young Whigs to present a political discussion. The challenge was immediately taken up, and the public of Springfield listened with eager interest to several nights of sharp debate between Whig and Democratic champions, in which Lincoln bore a prominent and successful share. In the following summer, Lincoln's name was placed upon the Harrison electoral ticket for Illinois, and he lent all his zeal and eloquence to swell the general popular enthusiasm for Tippecanoe and Tyler II. In the midst of this political and social awakening of the new capital, and the quickened interest and high hopes of leading citizens gathered there from all parts of the state, there came into the Springfield circles Miss Mary Todd of Kentucky, 21 years old, handsome, accomplished, vivacious, witty, a dashing and fascinating figure in dress and conversation, gracious and imperious by turns. She easily singled out and secured the admiration of such of the Springfield beau as most pleased her somewhat capricious fancy. She was a sister of Mrs. Ninian W. Edwards, whose husband was one of the Long Nine. This circumstance made Lincoln a frequent visitor at the Edwards house, and being thus much thrown in her company, he found himself, almost before he knew it, entangled in a new love affair, and in the course of a twelve-month engaged to marry her. Much to the surprise of Springfield society, however, the courtship took a sudden turn. Whether it was caprice or jealousy, a new attachment, a mature reflection will always remain a mystery. Every such case is a law unto itself, and neither science nor poetry is ever able to analyze and explain its causes and effects. The conflicting stories then current and the varying traditions that yet exist either fail to agree or to fit the sparse facts which came to light. There remains no dispute, however, that the occurrence, whatever shape it took, threw Mr. Lincoln into a deeper despondency than any he had yet experienced, for on January 23, 1841, he wrote to his law partner, John D. Stewart, For not giving you a general summary of news, you must pardon me. It is not in my power to do so. I am now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on earth. Whether I shall ever be better, I cannot tell. I awfully forebode I shall not. To remain as I am is impossible. I must die or be better. Apparently his engagement to Miss Todd was broken off, but whether that was the result or the cause of his period of gloom seems still a matter of conjecture. His mind was so perturbed that he felt unable to attend the sessions of the legislature of which he was a member, and, after its close, his intimate friend Joshua F. Speed carried him off for a visit to Kentucky. The change of scene and surroundings proved a great benefit. He returned home about midsummer very much improved, but not yet completely restored to a natural mental equipoise. While on their visit to Kentucky, Speed had likewise fallen in love and in the following winter had become afflicted with doubts and perplexities akin to those from which Lincoln had suffered. It now became his turn to give sympathy and counsel to his friend, and he did this with a warmth and delicacy born of his own spiritual trials, not yet overmastered. He wrote letter after letter to Speed to convince him that his doubts about not truly loving the woman of his choice were all nonsense. Why, Speed, if you did not love her, although you might not wish her death, you would most certainly be resigned to it. Perhaps this point is no longer a question with you, and my pertinacious dwelling upon it is a rude intrusion upon your feelings. If so, you must pardon me. You know the hell I have suffered on that point, and how tender I am upon it. I am now fully convinced that you love her as ardently as you are capable of loving. 
It is the peculiar misfortune of both you and me to dream dreams of Elysium far exceeding all that anything earthly can realize. When Lincoln heard that Speed was finally married, he wrote him, It cannot be told how it now thrills me with joy to hear you say that you are far happier than you ever expected to be. That much I know is enough. I know you too well to suppose your expectations were not, at least, sometimes extravagant. And if reality exceeds them all, I say, Enough, dear Lord. I am not going beyond the truth when I tell you that the short space it took me to read your last letter gave me more pleasure than the total sum of all I have enjoyed since the fatal 1st of January, 1841. Since then it seems to me I should have been entirely happy, but for the never-absent idea that there is still one unhappy whom I have contributed to make so. That still kills my soul. I cannot but reproach myself for even wishing to be happy while she is otherwise. It is quite possible that a series of incidents that occurred during the summer in which the above was written had something to do with bringing such a frame of mind to a happier conclusion. James Shields, afterward a general in two wars and a senator from two states, was at that time auditor of Illinois, with his office at Springfield. Shields was an Irishman by birth, and, for an active politician of the Democratic Party, had the misfortune to be both sensitive and irascible in party warfare. Shields, together with the Democratic governor and treasurer, issued a circular order forbidding the payment of taxes in the depreciated paper of the Illinois state banks, and the Whigs were endeavoring to make capital by charging that the order was issued for the purpose of bringing enough silver into the treasury to pay the salaries of these officials. Using this as a basis of argument, a couple of clever Springfield Society girls wrote and printed in the Sangamo Journal a series of humorous letters in the country dialect purporting to come from the lost townships and signed by Aunt Rebecca, who called herself a farmer's widow. It is hardly necessary to say that Mary Todd was one of the culprits. The young ladies originated the scheme more to poke fun at the personal weaknesses of Shields than for the sake of party effect and they embellished their simulated plaint about taxes with an embroidery of fictitious social happenings and personal allusions to the auditor that put the town on a grin and shields into fury. The fair and mischievous writers found it necessary to consult Lincoln about how they should frame the political features of their attack, and he set them a pattern by writing the first letter of the series himself. Shields sent a friend to the editor of the journal and demanded the name of the real Rebecca. The editor, as in duty bound, asked Lincoln what he should do, and was instructed to give Lincoln's name, and not to mention the ladies. Then followed a letter from Shields to Lincoln demanding retraction and apology. Lincoln's reply that he declined to answer under menace, and a challenge from Shields. Thereupon, Lincoln instructed his friend as follows. If former offensive correspondence were withdrawn, and a polite and gentlemanly inquiry made, he was willing to explain that... I did write the Lost Townships letter, which appeared in the journal of the second instant, but had no participation in any form in any other article alluding to you. I wrote that wholly for political effect. I had no intention of injuring your personal or private character or standing as a man or a gentleman. And I did not then think, and do not now think, that that article could produce or has produced that effect against you. And had I anticipated such an effect, I would have forborne to write it. And I will add that your conduct toward me, so far as I know, had always been gentlemanly, and that I had no personal pique against you, and no cause for any. If nothing like this is done, the preliminaries of the fight are to be, first, weapons, cavalry broadswords of the largest size, precisely equal in all respects, and such as now used by the cavalry company at Jacksonville. Second, position, a plank ten feet long, and from nine to twelve inches broad, to be firmly fixed on edge, on the ground, as the line between us, which neither is to pass his foot over upon forfeit of his life. Next, a line drawn on the ground on either set of said plank and parallel with it, each at the distance of the whole length of the sword and three feet additional from the plank, and the passing of his own such line by either party during the fight shall be deemed a surrender of the contest. The two seconds met, and with great unction pledged, our honor to each other, that we would endeavor to settle the matter amicably but persistently higgled over points till publicity and arrest seemed imminent. Procuring the necessary broadswords, all parties then hurried away to an island in the Mississippi River opposite Alton, where, long before the planks were set on edge or the swords drawn, mutual friends took the case out of the hands of the seconds and declared an adjustment. 
The terms of the fight as written by Mr. Lincoln show plainly enough that in his judgment it was to be treated as a farce and would never proceed beyond preliminaries. There, of course, ensued the very bellicose after discussion in the newspapers, with additional challenges between the seconds about the proper etiquette of such farces, all resulting only in the shedding of much ink and furnishing Springfield with topics of lively conversation for a month. These occurrences, naturally enough, again drew Mr. Lincoln and Miss Todd together in friendly interviews, and Lincoln's letter to Speed detailing the news of the duels contains this significant paragraph. But I began this letter not for what I have been writing, but to say something on that subject, which you know to be of such infinite solicitude to me. The immense sufferings you endured from the 1st of September till the middle of February you never tried to conceal from me, and I well understood. You have now been the husband of a lovely woman nearly eight months. That you are happier now than the day you married her I well know, for without you could not be living. But I have your word for it too, and the returning elasticity of spirits which is manifested in your letters. But I wanted to ask a close question. Are you now in feeling as well as judgment glad that you are married as you are? From anybody but me this would be an impudent question not to be tolerated, but I know you will pardon it in me. Please answer it quickly, as I am patient to know. The answer was evidently satisfactory, for on November 4th, 1842, the Reverend Charles Dresser united Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd in the holy bonds of matrimony. His marriage to Miss Todd ended all those mental perplexities and periods of despondency from which he had suffered more or less during his several love affairs, extending over nearly a decade. Out of the keen anguish he had endured, he finally gained that perfect mastery over his own spirit which Scripture declares to denote a greatness superior to that of him who takes a city. Few men have ever attained that complete domination of the will over the emotions, of reason over passion, by which he was able in the years to come to meet and solve the tremendous questions destiny had in store for him. His wedding, once over, he took up with resolute patience the hard, practical routine of daily life in which he had already been so severely schooled. Even his sentimental correspondence with his friend Speed lapsed into neglect. He was so poor that he and his bride could not make the contemplated visit to Kentucky they would have both so much enjoyed. His national debt of the New Salem days was not yet fully paid off. We are not keeping house, but boarding at the Globe Tavern, he writes. Our room and boarding only cost us four dollars a week. His law partnership with Stewart had lasted four years, but was dissolved by reason of Stewart's election to Congress, and a new one was formed with Judge Stephen T. Logan, who had recently resigned from the circuit bench where he had learned both the quality and promise of Lincoln's talents. It was an opportune and important change. Stewart had devoted himself mainly to politics, while with Logan Law was the primary object. Under Logan's guidance and encouragement, he took up both the study and practical work of the profession in a more serious spirit. Lincoln's interest in politics, however, was in no way diminished, and, in truth, his limited practice at that date easily afforded him the time necessary for both. Since 1840, he had declined a re-election to the legislature, and his ambition had doubtless contributed much to this decision. His late law partner, Stewart, had been three times a candidate for Congress. He was defeated in 1836, but successfully gained his election in 1838 and 1840, his service of two terms extending from December 2, 1839, to March 3, 1843. For some reason, the next election had been postponed from the year 1842 to 1843. It was but natural that Stuart's success should excite a similar desire in Lincoln, who had reached equal party prominence and rendered even more conspicuous party service. Lincoln had profited greatly by the companionship and friendly emulation of many talented young politicians of Springfield, but the same condition also increased competition and stimulated rivalry, not only himself, but both Hardin and Baker desired the nomination, which, as the district then stood, was equivalent to an election. When the leading Whigs of Sangamon County met, Lincoln was under the impression that it was Baker and not Hardin who was his most dangerous rival, as it appears in a letter to Speed of March 24th, 1843. We had a meeting of the Whigs of the county here on last Monday to appoint delegates to a district convention, and Baker beat me and got the delegation instructed to go for him. The meeting, in spite of my attempt to decline it, appointed me one of the delegates, so that in getting Baker the nomination, 
I shall be fixed a good deal like a fellow who has made groomsman to a man that has cut him out and is marrying his own dear gal. The causes that led to his disappointment are set forth more in detail in a letter two days later to a friend in the new county of Menard, which now included his old home, New Salem, whose powerful assistance was therefore lost from the party councils of Sangamon. The letter also dwells more particularly on the complicated influences which the practical politician has to reckon with, and shows that even his marriage had been used to turn popular opinion against him. It is truly gratifying to me to learn that while the people of Sangamon have cast me off, my old friends of Menard, who have known me longest and best, stick to me. It would astonish, if not amuse, the older citizens to learn that I, a stranger, friendless, uneducated, penniless boy, working on a flatboat at $10 per month, have been put down here as the candidate of pride, wealth, and aristocratic family distinction. Yet so, chiefly it was. There was, too, the strangest combination of church influence against me. Baker is a Campbellite, and therefore, as I suppose, with few exceptions, got all that church. My wife has some relations in the Presbyterian churches, and some of the Episcopal churches, and therefore, wherever it would tell, I was set down as either the one or the other, while it was everywhere contended that no Christian ought to go for me, because I belonged to no church, was suspected of being a deist, and had talked about fighting a duel. With all these things, Baker, of course, had nothing to do. Nor do I complain of them. As to his own church going for him, I think that was right enough. And as to the influences I have spoken of in the other, though they were very strong, it would be grossly untrue and unjust to charge that they acted upon them in a body, or were very near so. I only mean that those influences levied a tax of considerable percent upon my strength through the religious community. In the same letter, we have a striking illustration of Lincoln's intelligence and skill in the intricate details of political management, together with the high sense of honor and manliness which directed his action in such manners. Speaking of the influences of Menard County, he wrote, If she and Mason act circumspectly, they will in the convention be able so far to enforce their rights as to decide absolutely which one of the candidates shall be successful. Let me show the reason of this. Hardin, or some other Morgan candidate, will get Putnam, Marshall, Woodford, Tazewell, and Logan counties, making 16. Then you and Mason, having three, can give the victory to either side. You say you shall instruct your delegates for me unless I object. I certainly shall not object. That would be too pleasant a compliment for me to tread in the dust. And besides, if anything should happen, which, however, is not probable, by which Baker should be thrown out of the fight, I would be at liberty to accept the nomination if I could get it. I do, however, feel myself bound not to hinder him in any way from getting the nomination. I should despise myself were I to attempt it. I think, then, it would be proper for your meeting to appoint three delegates and to instruct them to go for someone as a first choice, someone else as a second, and perhaps someone as a third. And if in those instructions I were named as the first choice, it would gratify me very much. If you wish to hold the balance of power, it is important for you to attend and secure the vote of Mason also. A few weeks again changed the situation, of which he informed Speed in a letter dated May 18th. In relation to our Congress matter here, you are right in supposing I would support the nominee. Neither Baker nor I, however, is the man, but Hardin, so far as I can judge from present appearances. We shall have no split or trouble about the matter. All will be harmony. In the following year, 1844, Lincoln was once more compelled to exercise his patience. The Campbellite friends of Baker must again have been very active in behalf of their church favorite. For their influence, added to his dashing politics and eloquent oratory, appears to have secured him the nomination without serious contention, while Lincoln found a partial recompense in being nominated a candidate for presidential elector, which furnished him opportunity for all his party energy and zeal during the spirited but unsuccessful presidential campaign for Henry Clay. He not only made an extensive canvass in Illinois, but also made a number of speeches in the adjoining state of Indiana. It was probably during that year that a tacit agreement was reached among the Whig leaders in Sangamon County that each would be satisfied with one term in Congress and would not seek a second nomination. But Hardin was the aspirant from the neighboring county of Morgan, and apparently therefore not included in this arrangement. 
Already in the fall of 1845, Lincoln industriously began his appeals and instructions to his friends in the district to secure the secession. Thus, he wrote on November 17th, The paper at Pekin has nominated Hardin for governor, and, commenting on this, the Alton paper indirectly nominated him for Congress. It would give Hardin a great start, and perhaps use me up, if the Whig papers of the district should nominate him for Congress. If your feelings towards me are the same as when I saw you, which I have no reason to doubt, I wish you would let nothing appear in your paper which may operate against me. You understand. Matters stand just as they did when I saw you. Baker is certainly off the track, and I fear Hardin intends to be on it. But again, as before, the spirit of absolute fairness governed all his movements, and he took special pains to guard against it being suspected that I was attempting to juggle Hardin out of a nomination for Congress by juggling him into one for governor. I should be pleased, he wrote again in January, if I could concur with you in the hope that my name would be the only one presented to the convention, but I cannot. Hardin is a man of desperate energy and perseverance, and one that never backs out, and I fear to think otherwise is to be deceived in the character of our adversary. I would rejoice to be spared the labor of a contest, but, being in, I shall go it thoroughly and to the bottom. He then goes on to recount in much detail the chances for and against him in the several counties of the district, and in later letters discusses the system of selecting candidates, where the convention ought to be held, how the delegates should be chosen, the instructions they should receive, and how the places of absent delegates should be filled. He watched his field of operations, planned his strategy, and handled his forces almost with the vigilance of a military commander. As a result, he won both his nomination in May and his election to the 30th Congress in August 1846. In that same year, the Mexican War broke out. Hardin became colonel of one of the three regiments of Illinois volunteers called for by President Polk, while Baker raised a fourth regiment, which was also accepted. Colonel Hardin was killed in the Battle of Buena Vista, and Colonel Baker won great distinction in the fighting near the city of Mexico. Like Abraham Lincoln, Douglas was also elected to Congress in 1846, where he had already served the two preceding terms. But these redoubtable Illinois champions were not to have a personal tilt in the House of Representatives. Before Congress met, the Illinois legislature elected Douglas to the United States Senate for six years, from March 4, 1847. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rob Powell. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 6. First Session of the 30th Congress. Mexican War, Wilmo Proviso, Campaign of 1848, Letters to Herndon about Young Men in Politics, Speech in Congress on the Mexican War, Second Session of the 30th Congress, Bill to Prohibit Slavery in the District of Columbia, Lincoln's Recommendations of Office Seekers, Letters to Speed, Commissioner of the General Land Office, Declines Governorship of Oregon. Very few men are fortunate enough to gain distinction during their first term in Congress. The reason is obvious. Legally, a term extends over two years. Practically, a session of five or six months during the first and three months during the second year ordinarily reduce their opportunities more than one half. In those two sessions, even if we presuppose some knowledge of parliamentary law, they must learn the daily routine of business, make the acquaintance of their fellow members who, already, in the 30th Congress, numbered something over 200, study the past and prospective legislation on a multitude of minor national questions entirely new to the new members, and perform the drudgery of haunting the departments in the character of unpaid agent and attorney to attend to the private interests of constituents, 
a physical task of no small proportion in Lincoln's day, when there were neither streetcar nor omnibus in the city of magnificent distances, as Washington was nicknamed. Add to this that the principal work of preparing legislation is done by the various committees in their committee rooms, of which the public hears nothing, as that members cannot choose their own time for making speeches. Still further, that the management of debate on prepared legislation must necessarily be entrusted to members of long experience as well as talent, and it will be seen that the novice need not expect immediate fame. It is therefore not to be wondered at that Lincoln's single term in the House of Representatives at Washington added practically nothing to his reputation. He did not attempt to shine forth in debate by either a stinging retort or a witty epigram, or by a sudden burst of inspired eloquence. On the contrary, he took up his task as a quiet but earnest and patient apprentice in the great workshop of national legislation, and performed his share of duty with industry and intelligence, as well as with a modest and appreciative respect for the ability and experience of his seniors. As to speech-making, he wrote, by way of getting the hang of the house, I made a little speech two or three days ago on a post office question of no general interest. I find speaking here and elsewhere about the same thing. I was about as badly scared, and no worse, as I am when I speak in court. I expect to make one within a week or two, in which I hope to succeed well enough to wish you to see it. And again, some weeks later. I just take my pen to say that Mr. Stevens of Georgia, a little, slim, pale-faced, consumptive man with a voice like Logan's, has just concluded the very best speech of an hour's length I have ever heard. My old, withered, dry eyes are full of tears yet. He was appointed the junior Whig member of the Committee on Post Offices and Post Roads, and shared its prosaic but eminently useful labors both in the committee room and the House debates. His name appears on only one other committee, that on expenditures of the War Department, and he seems to have interested himself in certain amendments of the law relating to bounty lands for soldiers and such minor military topics. He looked carefully after the interest of Illinois in certain grants of land to that state for railroads, but expressed his desire that the government price of the reserve sections should not be increased to actual settlers. During the first session of the 30th Congress, he delivered three set speeches in the House, all of them carefully prepared and fully written out. The first of these, on January 12, 1848, was an elaborate defense of the Whig doctrine summarized in a House resolution passed a week or ten days before, that the Mexican-American War had been unnecessarily and unconstitutionally commenced by the President, James K. Polk. The speech is not a mere party diatribe, but a terse historical and legal examination of the origin of the Mexican War. In the afterlight of our own times, which shines upon these transactions, we may readily admit that Mr. Lincoln and the Whigs had the best of the argument. But it must be quite as readily conceded that they were far behind the President and his defenders in political and party strategy. The former were clearly wasting their time in discussing an abstract question of international law upon conditions existing 20 months before. During those 20 months, the American arms had won victory after victory and planted the American flag on the halls of the Montezumas. Could even successful argument undo those victories or call back to life the brave American soldiers who had shed their blood to win them? It may be assumed as an axiom that Providence has never gifted any political party with all of political wisdom, or blinded it with all of political folly. Upon the foregoing point of controversy, the Whigs were sadly thrown on the defensive, and labored heavily under their already discounted declamation. But instinct, rather than sagacity, led them to turn their eyes to the future, and successfully upon other points to retrieve their mistake. Within six weeks after Lincoln's speech, President Polk sent to the Senate a treaty of peace, under which Mexico ceded to the United States an extent of territory equal in area to Germany, France, and Spain combined. And thereafter, the origin of the war was an obsolete question. What should be done with the new territory was now the issue. This issue embraced the already exciting slavery question, and Mr. Lincoln was doubtless gratified that the Whigs had taken a position upon it 
so consonant with his own convictions. Already, in the previous Congress, the body of the Whig members had joined a small group of anti-slavery Democrats in fastening upon an appropriation bill the famous Wilmo Proviso, that slavery should never exist in territory acquired from Mexico, and the Whigs of the 30th Contra steadily followed the policy of voting for the same restriction in regard to every piece of legislation where it was applicable. Mr. Lincoln often said he had voted 40 or 50 times for the Wilmo Proviso in various forms during his single term. Upon another point, he and the other Whigs were equally wise. Repelling the Democratic charge that they were unpatriotic in denouncing the war, they voted in favor of every measure to sustain, supply, and encourage the soldiers in the field. But their most adroit piece of strategy, now that the war was ended, was in their movement to make General Taylor president. In this movement, Mr. Lincoln took a leading and active part. No living American statesman has ever been idolized by his party adherents, as was Henry Clay for a whole generation. And Mr. Lincoln fully shared this hero worship. But his practical campaigning as a candidate for presidential elector in the Harrison campaign of 1840 and the Clay campaign of 1844 in Illinois and the adjoining states afforded him a basis for sound judgment and convinced him that the day when Clay could have been elected president was forever past. Mr. Clay's chance for an election is just no chance at all, he wrote on April 30th. He might get New York, and that would have elected in 1844, but it will not now, because he must now, at the least, lose Tennessee, which he had then, and in addition, the 15 new votes of Florida, Texas, Iowa, and Wisconsin. In my judgment, we can elect nobody but General Taylor, and we cannot elect him without a nomination. Therefore, don't fail to send a delegate. And again, on the same day, Mr. Clay's letter has not advanced his interests any here. Several who were against Taylor, but not for anybody particularly before, are since taking ground, some for Scott and some for McLean. Who will be nominated, neither I nor anyone else can tell. Now, let me pray to you in turn. My prayer is that you let nothing discourage or baffle you, but that, in spite of every difficulty, you send us a good Taylor delegate from your circuit. Make Baker, who is now with you, I suppose, help about it. He is a good hand to raise a breeze. In due time, Mr. Lincoln's sagacity and earnestness were both justified, for on June 12th he was able to write an Illinois friend. On my return from Philadelphia, where I had been attending the nomination of Old Ruff, I found your letter and a mass of others which had accumulated in my absence. By many, and often, it has been said they would not abide the nomination of Taylor. But since the deed has been done, they are fast falling in, and in my opinion, we shall have a most overwhelming, glorious triumph. One unmistakable sign is that all the odds and ends are with us, barn burners, Native Americans, Tyler men, disappointed office-seeking locofocos, and the Lord knows what. This is important, if in nothing else, in showing which way the wind blows. Some of the sanguine men have set down all the states as certain for Taylor but Illinois, and it is as doubtful. Cannot something be done even in Illinois? Taylor's nomination takes the locos on the blind side. It turns the war thunder against them. The war is now to them the gallows of Haman, which they built for us, and which they are doomed to be hanged themselves. Nobody understood better than Mr. Lincoln the obvious truth that in politics it does not suffice merely to nominate candidates. Something must also be done to elect them. Two of the letters which he at this time wrote home to his young law partner, William H. Herndon, are especially worth quoting in part, not alone to show his zeal in industry, but also as a perennial instruction and encouragement to young men who have an ambition to make a name and a place for themselves in American politics. Last night, I was attending a sort of caucus of the Whig members held in relation to the coming presidential election. The whole field of the nation was scanned, and all is high hope and confidence. Now, as to the young men, you must not wait to be brought forward by the older men. For instance, do you suppose that I should have ever got into notice if I had waited to be hunted up and pushed forward by older men? You young men get together and form a rough and ready club and have regular meetings and speeches. Let everyone play the part he can play best. Some speak, some sing, and all holler. 
Your meetings will be of evenings. The older men and the women will go to hear you so that it will not only contribute to the election of old Zach, but will be an interesting pastime and in improving to the intellectual faculties of all engaged. And in another letter, answering one from Herndon, in which that young aspirant complains of having been neglected, he says, The subject of that letter is exceedingly painful to me, and I cannot but think that there is some mistake in your impression of the motives of the old men. I suppose I am now one of the old men, and I declare on my veracity, which I think is good with you, that nothing could afford me more satisfaction than to learn that you and others of my young friends at home are doing battle in the contest and endearing themselves to the people, and taking a stand far above any I have been able to reach in their admiration. I cannot conceive that other old men feel differently. Of course, I cannot demonstrate what I say, but I was young once, and I am sure I was never ungenerously thrust back. I hardly know what to say. The way for a young man to rise is to improve himself every way he can, never suspecting that anybody wishes to hinder him. Allow me to assure you that suspicion and jealousy never did help any man in any situation. There may sometimes be ungenerous attempts to keep a young man down, and they will succeed, too, if he allows his mind to be diverted from its true channel to brood over the attempted injury. Cast about and see if this feeling has not injured every person you have ever known to fall into it. Mr. Lincoln's interest in this presidential campaign did not expend itself merely in advice to others. We have his own written record that he also took an active part for the election of General Taylor after his nomination. Speaking a few times in Maryland near Washington, several times in Massachusetts, and canvassing quite fully his own district in Illinois. Before the session of Congress ended, he also delivered two speeches in the House, one on the general subject of internal improvements, and the other the usual political campaign speech which members of Congress are in the habit, and the other the usual political campaign speech which members of Congress are in the habit of making to be printed for home circulation, made up mainly of humorous and satirical criticism favoring the election of General Taylor and opposing the election of General Cass, the Democratic candidate. Even this production, however, is lighted up by a passage of impressive earnestness and eloquence, in which he explains and defends the attitude of the Whigs in the denouncing the origin of the Mexican War. If to say, the war was unnecessarily and unconstitutionally commenced by the President, be opposing the war, then the Whigs have very generally opposed it. Wherever they have spoken at all, they have said this, and they have said it on what has appeared good reason to them. The marching an army into the midst of a peaceful Mexican settlement, frightening the inhabitants away, leaving their growing crops and other property to destruction, to you may appear a perfectly amiable, peaceful, unprovoking procedure, but it does not appear so to us. So to call such an act to us appears no other than a naked, impudent absurdity and we speak of it accordingly. But if, when the war had begun, and had become the cause of the country, the giving of our money and our blood, in common with yours, was support of the war, then it is not true that we have always opposed the war. With few individual exceptions, you have constantly had our votes here for all the necessary supplies, and more than this, you have had the services, the blood, and the lives of our political brethren in every trial and on every field. The beardless boy and the mature man, the humble and the distinguished, you have had them. Through suffering and death, by disease and in battle, they have endured and fought and fell with you. Clay and Webster each gave a son, never to be returned. From the state of my own residence, besides other worthy but less known Whig names, we sent Marshall, Morrison, Baker, and Hardin. They all fought and one fell and in the fall of that one we lost our best Whig man. Nor were the Whigs few in number or laggard in the day of danger. In that fearful, bloody, breathless struggle at Buena Vista, where each man's hard task was to beat back five foes or die himself, of the five high officers who perished, four were Whigs. In speaking of this, I mean no odious comparison between the line-hearted Whigs and the Democrats who fought there. On other occasions, and among the lower officers and privates on that occasion, I doubt not the proportion was different. I wish to do justice to all. 
I think of all those brave men as Americans, in whose proud fame as an American I too have a share. Many of them, Whigs and Democrats, are my constituents and personal friends, and I thank them, more than thank them, one and all for the high, imperishable honor they have conferred on our common state. During the second session of the 30th Congress, Mr. Lincoln made no long speeches, but in addition to the usual routine work devolved on him by the committee of which he was a member, he busied himself in preparing a special measure which, because of its relation to the great events of his later life, needs to be particularly mentioned. Slavery existed in Maryland and Virginia when those states ceded the territory out of which the District of Columbia was formed. Since, by that session, this land passed under the exclusive control of the federal government, the institution within this ten-mile square could no longer be defended by the plea of state sovereignty. An anti-slavery sentiment naturally demanded that it should cease. Pro-slavery statesmen, on the other hand, as persistently opposed its removal, partly as a matter of pride and political consistency, partly because it was a convenience to Southern senators and members of the Congress when they came to Washington to bring their family servants where the local laws afforded them the same security over their black chattels which existed at their homes. Mr. Lincoln, in his Peoria speech of 1854, emphasized the sectional dispute with his vivid touch of local color. The South clamored for a more efficient fugitive slave law. The North clamored for the abolition of a peculiar species of slave trade in the District of Columbia, in connection with which, in view from the windows of the Capitol, a sort of Negro livery stable, where droves of Negroes were collected, temporarily kept, and finally taken to Southern markets, precisely like droves of horses had been openly maintained for fifty years. Thus, the question remained a minor but never-ending bone of contention and point of irritation. And excited debate arose in the 30th Congress over a House resolution that the Committee on the Judiciary be instructed to report a bill, as soon as practicable, prohibiting the slave trade in the District of Columbia. In this situation of affairs, Mr. Lincoln conceived the fond hope that he might be able to present a plan of compromise. He already entertained the idea, which in later years during his presidency, he urged upon both Congress and the border slave states that the just and generous mode of getting rid of the barbarous institution of slavery was by a system of compensated emancipation, giving freedom to the slave and a money indemnity to the owner. He therefore carefully framed a bill providing for the abolishment of slavery in the district upon the following principal conditions. First, that the law should be adopted by a popular vote in the district. Second, a temporary system of apprenticeship and gradual emancipation for children born of slave mothers after January 1, 1850. Third, the government to pay full cash value for slaves voluntarily manumitted by their owners. Fourth, prohibiting bringing slaves into the district or selling them out of it. Fifth, providing that government officers, citizens of slave states, might bring with them and take them away again their slave house servants. Sixth, leaving the existing fugitive slave law in force. When Mr. Lincoln presented this amendment to the House, he said that he was authorized to state that of about 15 of the leading citizens of the District of Columbia to whom the proposition had been submitted, there was not one who did not approve the adoption of such a proposition. He did not wish to be misunderstood. He did not know whether or not they would vote for this bill on the first Monday in April, but he repeated that out of the 15 persons to whom it had been submitted, he had authority to say that every one of them desired that some proposition like this should pass. While Mr. Lincoln did not so state to the House, it was well understood in intimate circles that the bill had the approval on the one hand of Mr. Seaton, the conservative mayor of Washington, and on the other hand of Mr. Giddings, the radical anti-slavery member of the House of Representatives. Notwithstanding the singular merit of the bill in reconciling such extremes of opposing factions in its support, the temper of Congress had already become too hot to accept such a rational and practical solution, and Mr. Lincoln's wise proposition was not allowed to come to a vote. The triumphant election of General Taylor to the presidency in November 1848 very soon devolved upon Mr. Lincoln the delicate and difficult duty of making recommendations to the incoming administration of persons suitable to be appointed to fill the various federal offices in Illinois, as Colonel E.D. Baker and himself were the only Whigs elected to Congress from that state. In performing this duty, one of his leading characteristics, impartial honesty, and absolute fairness to political friends and foes alike, stands out with noteworthy clearness. 
His term ended with General Taylor's inauguration, and he appears to have remained in Washington but a few days thereafter. Before leaving, he wrote to the new Secretary of the Treasury, Colonel E.D. Baker and myself are the only Whig members of Congress from Illinois, I of the 30th and he of the 31st. We have reason to think the Whigs of that state hold us responsible, to some extent, for the appointments which may be made of our citizens. We do not know you personally, and our efforts to see you have so far been unavailing. I therefore hope I am not obtrusive in saying in this way, for him and myself, that when a citizen of Illinois is to be appointed in your department to an office either in or out of the state, we most respectfully ask to be heard. On the following day, March 10, 1849, he addressed to the Secretary of State his first formal recommendation. It is remarkable from the fact that between the two Whig applicants whose papers are transmitted, he says rather less in favor of his own choice than of the opposing claimant. Sir, there are several applicants for the office of United States Marshal for the District of Illinois, among the most prominent of whom are Benjamin Bond, Esquire of Carlisle, and... Thomas, Esquire, of Galena. Mr. Bond, I know to be personally every way worthy of the office, and he is very numerously and most respectably recommended. His papers I send to you, and I solicit for his claims a full and fair consideration. Having said this much, I add that in my individual judgment, the appointment of Mr. Thomas would be the better. Your obedient servant, A. Lincoln, endorsed on Mr. Bond's papers. In this and the accompanying envelope are the recommendations of about 200 good citizens of all parts of Illinois that Benjamin Bond be appointed marshal for that district. They include the names of nearly all our Whigs who now are, or have ever been, members of the state legislature, besides 46 of the Democratic members of the present legislature, and many other good citizens. I add that from personal knowledge, I consider Mr. Bond every way worthy of office and qualified to fill it. Holding the individual opinion that the appointment of a different gentleman would be better, I ask a special attention and consideration for his claims, and for the opinions expressed in his favor by those over whom I can claim no superiority. There were but three other prominent federal appointments to be made in Mr. Lincoln's congressional district, and he waited until after his return home so that he might be better informed of the local opinion concerning them before making his recommendations. It was nearly a month after he left Washington before he sent his decision to the several departments at Washington. The letter quoted below, relating to one of those appointments, is in substance almost identical with the others, and particularly refrains from expressing any opinion of his own for or against the policy of political removals. He also expressly explains that Colonel Baker, the other Whig representative, claims no voice in the appointment. Dear Sir, I recommend that Walter Davis be appointed receiver of the land office at this place, wherever there shall be a vacancy. I cannot say that Mr. Herndon, the present incumbent, has failed in the proper discharge of any of the duties of the office. He is a very warm partisan, and openly and actively opposed to the election of General Taylor. I also understand that since General Taylor's election he has received a reappointment from Mr. Polk, his old commission not having expired. Whether this is true, the records of the department will show. I may add that the Whigs here almost universally desire his removal. If Mr. Lincoln's presence in Washington during two sessions in Congress did not add materially to either his local or national fame, it was of incalculable benefit in other respects. It afforded him a close inspection of the complex machinery of the federal government and its relations to that of the states, and enabled him to notice both the easy routine and the occasional friction of their movements. It brought him into contact, and to some degree, intimate companionship with political leaders from all parts of the Union, and gave him the opportunity of joining in the caucus and the national convention that nominated General Taylor for president. It broadened immensely the horizon of his observation, and the sharp personal rivalries he noted at the center of the nation opened to him new lessons in the study of human nature. His quick intelligence acquired knowledge quite as, or even more rapidly by the process of logical intuition than by a mere dry, laborious study and it was the inestimable experience of the single term in the Congress of the United States which prepared him for his coming, yet undreamed of, responsibilities, as fully as it would have done the ordinary man in a dozen. Mr. Lincoln had frankly acknowledged to his friend Speed, after his election in 1864, that, Being elected to Congress, though I am very grateful to our friends for having done it, it has not pleased me as much as I expected. It has already been said that an agreement had been reached among the several Springfield aspirants that they would limit their ambition to a single term 
and take turns in securing and enjoying the coveted distinction, and Mr. Lincoln remained faithful to this agreement. When the time to prepare for the election of 1848 approached, he wrote to his law partner, It is very pleasant to learn from you that there are some who would desire that I should be re-elected. I most heartily thank them for their kind partiality, and I can say, as Mr. Clay said of the annexation of Texas, that, personally, I would not object to a re-election, although I thought at the time, and still think, it would be quite as well for me to return to the law at the end of a single term. I made the declaration that I would not be a candidate again, more from a wish to deal fairly with others to keep peace among our friends, and to keep the district from going to the enemy, than for any cause personal to myself. So that if it should so happen that nobody else wishes to be elected, I could not refuse the people the right of sending me again. But to enter myself as a competitor of others, or to authorize anyone else so to enter me, is what my word and honor forbid. Judge Stephen T. Logan, his late law partner, was nominated for the place, and heartily supported not only by Mr. Lincoln, but also by the Whigs of the district. By this time, however, the politics of the district had undergone a change by reason of the heavy emigration to Illinois at that period, and Judge Logan was defeated. Mr. Lincoln's strict and sensitive adherence to his promises now brought him a disappointment which was one of those blessings in disguise so commonly deplored for the time being by the wisest and the best. A number of the Western members of Congress had joined in a recommendation to President-elect Taylor to give Colonel E.D. Baker a place in his cabinet, a reward he richly deserved for his talents, his party service, and the military honor he had won in the Mexican War. When this application bore no fruit, the Whigs of Illinois, expressing at least some encouragement from the new administration, laid claim to a bureau appointment, that of Commissioner of the General Land Office in the new Department of the Interior recently established. I believe that, so far as the Whigs in Congress are concerned, wrote Lincoln to Speed 12 days before Taylor's inauguration, I could have the General Land Office almost by common consent. But then Sweet and Don Morrison and Browning and Cyrus Edwards all want it. And what is worse, while I think I could easily take it myself, I fear I shall have trouble to get it for any other man in Illinois. Unselfishly yielding his own chances, he tried to induce the four Illinois candidates to come to a mutual agreement in favor of one of their own number. They were so tardy in settling their differences as to excite his impatience, and he wrote to a Washington friend, I learned from Washington that a man by the name of Butterfield will probably be appointed commissioner of the General Land Office. This ought not to be. Some kind friends think I ought to be an applicant, but I am for Mr. Edwards. Try to defeat Butterfield, and in doing so, use Mr. Edwards, J.L.D. Morrison, or myself, whichever you can to best advantage. As the situation grew persistently worse, Mr. Lincoln at length, about the 1st of June, himself became a formal applicant. But the delay resulting from his devotion to his friends had dissipated his chances. Butterfield received the appointment, and the defeat was aggravated when, a few months later, his unrelenting spirit of justice and fairness impelled him to write a letter defending Butterfield and the Secretary of the Interior from an attack by one of Lincoln's warm personal but indiscreet friends in the Illinois legislature. It was, however, a fortunate escape. In the four succeeding years, Mr. Lincoln qualified himself for better things than the monotonous drudgery of an administrative bureau at Washington. It is probable that this defeat also enabled him more easily to pass by another temptation. The Taylor administration, realizing its ingratitude, at length, in September, offered him the governorship of the recently organized territory of Oregon, but he replied, On as much reflection as if I had time to give the subject, I cannot consent to accept it. End of chapter 6「7 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ernst Schnell A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay Chapter number 7 Repeal of the Missouri Compromise State Fair Debate Peoria debate, Trumbull elected, Letter to Robinson, The Know-Nothings, 
Decatur Meeting, Bloomington Convention, Philadelphia Convention, Lincoln's Vote for Vice President, Fremont and Dayton, Lincoln's Campaign Speeches, Chicago Banquet Speech. After the expiration of his term in Congress, Mr. Lincoln applied himself with unremitting assiduity to the practice of law, which the growth of the state in population and the widening of his acquaintanceship no less than his own growth in experience and legal acumen rendered ever more important and absorbing. In 1854, he writes, his profession had almost superseded the thought of politics in his mind, when the repeal of the Missouri Compromise aroused him as he had never been before. Not alone Mr. Lincoln, but indeed the whole nation was so aroused, the Democratic Party and nearly the entire South, to force the passage of that repeal through Congress, and an alarmed majority, including even a considerable minority of the Democratic Party in the North, to resist its passage. Mr. Lincoln, of course, shared the general indignation of Northern sentiment that the whole of the remaining Louisiana territory, out of which six states and the greater part of two more have since been organized and admitted to the Union, should be open to the possible extension of slavery. But two points served specially to enlist his energy in the controversy. One was personal, in that Senator Douglas of Illinois, by whom the repeal was championed, and whose influence as a free state senator and powerful democratic leader alone made the repeal possible, had been his personal antagonist in Illinois politics for almost twenty years. The other was moral, in that the new question involved the elemental principles of the American government, the fundamental maxim of the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal. His intuitive logic needed no demonstration that bank, tariff, internal improvements, the Mexican War, and their related incidents were questions of passing expediency, but that this sudden reaction, needlessly grafted upon a routine statute to organize a new territory, was the unmistakable herald of a coming struggle which might transform republican institutions. It was in January 1854 that the accidents of a Senate debate threw into Congress and upon the country the firebrand of the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. The repeal was not consummated till the month of May, and from May until the autumn elections the flame of acrimonious discussion ran over the whole country like a wildfire. There is no record that Mr. Lincoln took any public part in the discussion until the month of September, but it is very clear that he not only carefully watched its progress, but that he studied its phases of development, its historical origins, and its legal bearings with close industry, and gathered from party literature and legislative documents a harvest of substantial facts and data, rather than the wordy campaign phrases and explosive epithets with which more impulsive students and speakers were content to produce their oratorical effects. Here we may again quote Mr. Lincoln's exact written statement of the manner in which he resumed his political activity. In the autumn of that year, 1854, he took the stump with no broader practical aim or object than to secure, if possible, the re-election of the Honorable Richard Yates to Congress. His speeches at once attracted a more marked attention than they had ever before done. As the canvas proceeded, he was drawn to different parts of the state, outside of Mr. Yates' district. He did not abandon the law, but gave his attention by turns to that and politics. The state agricultural fair was at Springfield that year, and Douglas was announced to speak there. The new question had created great excitement and uncertainty in Illinois politics, and there were abundant signs that it was beginning to break up the organization of both the Whig and the Democratic parties. This feeling brought together at the state fair an unusual number of local leaders from widely scattered counties, and almost spontaneously a sort of political tournament of speech-making broke out. In this, Senator Douglas, doubly conspicuous by his leadership of the Nebraska Bill in the Congress, was expected to play the leading part, while the opposition, by a common impulse, called upon Lincoln to answer him. Lincoln performed the task with such aptness and force, with such freshness of argument, illustrations from history and citations from authorities, 
as secured him a decided oratorical triumph, and lifted him at a single bound to the leadership of the opposition to Douglas's propagandism. Two weeks later Douglas and Lincoln met at Peoria in a similar debate, and on his return to Springfield, Lincoln wrote out and printed his speech in full. The reader who carefully examines this speech will at once be impressed with the genius which immediately made Mr. Lincoln a power in American politics. His grasp of the subject is so comprehensive, his statement so clear, his reasoning so convincing, his language so strong and eloquent by turns, that the wonderful power he manifested in the discussions and debates of the six succeeding years does not surpass, but only amplifies this, his first examination of the whole brood of questions relating to slavery precipitated upon the country by Douglas's repeal. After a searching history of the Missouri Compromise, he attacks the demoralizing effects and portentous consequences of its repeal. This declared indifference, he says, but, as I must think, covert real zeal for the spread of slavery, I cannot but hate. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it deprives our republican example of its just influence in the world, enables the enemies of free institutions with plausibility to taunt us as hypocrites, causes the real friends of freedom to doubt our sincerity, and especially because it forces so many good men among ourselves into an open war with the very fundamental principles of civil liberty, criticizing the Declaration of Independence, and insisting that there is no right principle of action but self-interest. Slavery is founded in the selfishness of man's nature, opposition to it in his love of justice. These principles are an internal antagonism, and when brought into collision so fiercely as slavery extension brings them, shocks and throes and convulsions must ceaselessly follow. Repeal the Missouri Compromise, repeal all compromises, repeal the Declaration of Independence, repeal all past history, you still cannot repeal human nature. It still will be the abundance of man's heart that slavery extension is wrong, and out of the abundance of his heart his mouth will continue to speak. With argument as impetuous and logic as inexorable, he disposes of Douglas's plea of popular sovereignty. Here, or at Washington, I would not trouble myself with the oyster laws of Virginia or the cranberry laws of Indiana. The doctrine of self-government is right, absolutely and eternally right, but it has no just application as here attempted. Or perhaps I should rather say, that whether it has such application depends upon whether a negro is not or is a man. If he is not a man, in that case he who is a man may, as a matter of self-government, do just what he pleases with him. But if the negro is a man, is it not to that extent a total destruction of self-government to say that he too shall not govern himself? When the white man governs himself, that is self-government. But when he governs himself and also governs another man, that is more than self-government, that is despotism. I particularly object to the new position which the avowed principle of this Nebraska law gives to slavery in the body politic. I object to it because it assumes that there can be moral right in the enslaving of one man by another. I object to it as a dangerous dalliance for a free people a sad evidence that feeling prosperity we forget right, that liberty as a principle we have ceased to revere. Little by little, but steadily, as man's march to the grave, we have been giving up the old for the new faith. Near eighty years ago we began by declaring that all men are created equal. But now, from that beginning we have run down to the other declaration that for some men to enslave others is a sacred right of self-government. These principles cannot stand together. They are as opposite as God and Mammon. If one compares the serious tone of this speech with the hard cider and coonskin buncombe of the Harrison campaign of 1840, and its lofty philosophical thought with the humorous declamation of the Taylor campaign of 1848, the speaker's advance in mental development at once becomes apparent. In this single effort, Mr. Lincoln had risen from the class of the politician to the rank of the statesman. There is a well-founded tradition that Douglas, 
disconcerted and troubled by Lincoln's unexpected manifestation of power in the Springfield and Peoria debates, sought a friendly interview with his opponent, and obtained from him an agreement that neither one of them would make any further speeches before the election. The local interest in the campaign was greatly heightened by the fact that the term of Douglas's Democratic colleague in the United States Senate was about to expire, and that the state legislature to be elected would have the choosing of his successor. It is not probable that Lincoln built much hope upon this coming political chance, as the Democratic Party had been throughout the whole history of the state in decided political control. It turned out, nevertheless, that in the election held on November 7th, an opposition majority of the members of the legislature was chosen, and Lincoln became, to outward appearances, the most available opposition candidate. But party disintegration had been only partial. Lincoln and his party friends still called themselves Whigs, though they could muster only a minority of the total membership of the legislature. The so-called anti-Nebraska Democrats, opposing Douglas and his followers, were still too full of traditional party prejudice to help elect a pronounced Whig to the United States Senate, though as strongly anti-Nebraska as themselves. Five of them brought forward and stubbornly voted for Lyman Trumbull, an anti-Nebraska Democrat of ability who had been chosen representative in Congress from the 8th Illinois District in the recent election. On the ninth ballot, it became evident to Lincoln that there was danger of a new Democratic candidate, neutral on the Nebraska question, being chosen. In this contingency, he manifested a personal generosity and political sagacity far above the comprehension of the ordinary smart politician. He advised and prevailed upon his Whig supporters to vote for Trumbull, and thus secure a vote in the United States Senate against slavery extension. He had rightly interpreted both statesmanship and human nature. His personal sacrifice on this occasion contributed essentially to the coming political regeneration of his state, and the five anti-Nebraska Democrats, who then wrought his defeat, became his most devoted personal followers and efficient allies in his own later political triumph, which adverse currents, however, were still to delay to a tantalizing degree. The circumstances of his defeat at that critical stage of his career must have seemed especially irritating, yet he preserved a most remarkable equanimity of temper. I regret my defeat moderately, he wrote to a sympathizing friend, but I am not nervous about it. We may fairly infer that while Mr. Lincoln was not nervous, he was nevertheless deeply impressed by the circumstance as an illustration of the grave nature of the pending political controversy. A letter written by him about half a year later to a friend in Kentucky is full of such serious reflection as to show that the existing political conditions in the United States had engaged his most profound thought and investigation. That spirit, he wrote, which desired the peaceful extinction of slavery has itself become extinct with the occasion and the men of the revolution. Under the impulse of that occasion, nearly half the states adopted systems of emancipation at once, and it is a significant fact that not a single state has done the like since. So far as peaceful voluntary emancipation is concerned, the condition of the negro slave in America, scarcely less terrible to the contemplation of a free mind, is now as fixed and hopeless of change for the better as that of the lost souls of the finally impenitent. The autocrat of all Russias will resign his crown and proclaim his subjects free republicans sooner than will our American masters voluntarily give up their slaves. Our political problem now is, can we as a nation continue together permanently, forever, half slave and half free? The problem is too mighty for me. May God in his mercy superintend the solution. Not quite three years later, Mr. Lincoln made the concluding problem of this letter the text of a famous speech. On the day before his first inauguration as President of the United States, the autocrat of all Russias, Alexander II, by imperial decree emancipated his serfs, while six weeks after the inauguration the American masters, headed by Jefferson Davis, began the greatest war of modern times to perpetuate and spread the institution of slavery. The excitement produced by the repeal of the Missouri Compromise in 1854, by the election forays of the Missouri border ruffians into Kansas in 1855, 
and by the succeeding civil strife in 1856 in that territory, wrought an effective transformation of political parties in the Union, in preparation for the presidential election of that year. This transformation, though not seriously checked, was very considerably complicated by an entirely new faction, or rather by the sudden revival of an old one, which in the past had called itself Native Americanism, and now assumed the name of the American Party, though it was more popularly known by the nickname of Know Nothings, because of its secret organization. It professed a certain hostility to foreign-born voters and to the Catholic religion, and demanded a change in the naturalization laws from five years to twenty-one years preliminary residence. This faction had gained some sporadic successes in eastern cities, but when its national convention met in February 1856 to nominate candidates for president and vice-president, the pending slavery question that it had hitherto studiously ignored caused the disruption of its organization, and though the adhering delegates nominated Millard Fillmore for president and A.J. Donaldson for vice-president, who remained in the field and were voted for to some extent in the presidential election, the organization was present only as a crippled and disturbing factor and disappeared totally from politics in the following years. Both North and South party lines adjusted themselves defiantly upon the single issue, for or against men and measures representing the extension or restriction of slavery. The Democratic Party, though radically changing its constituent elements, retained the party name and became the party of slavery extension, having forced the repeal and supported the resulting measures, while the Whig Party entirely disappeared, its members in the northern states joining the anti-Nebraska Democrats in the formation of the new Republican Party. Southern Whigs either went boldly into the Democratic camp, or followed for a while the delusive prospects of the know-nothings. This party change went on somewhat slowly in the state of Illinois, because that state extended in territorial length from the latitude of Massachusetts to that of Virginia, and its population contained an equally diverse local sentiment. The northern counties had at once become strongly anti-Nebraska, the conservative Whig counties of the center inclined to the know-nothings, while the Kentuckians and Carolinians who had settled the southern end had strong antipathies to what they called abolitionism and applauded Douglas and the repeal. The agitation, however, swept on, and further hesitation became impossible. Early in 1856, Mr. Lincoln began to take an active part in organizing the Republican Party. He attended a small gathering of anti-Nebraska editors in February at Decatur, who issued a call for a mass convention, which met at Bloomington in May at which the Republican Party of Illinois was formally constituted by an enthusiastic gathering of local leaders who had formerly been bitter antagonists, but who now joined their efforts to resist slavery extension. They formulated an empathic but not radical platform, and through a committee selected a composite ticket of candidates for state offices, which the convention approved by acclamation. The occasion remains memorable because of the closing address made by Mr. Lincoln in one of his most impressive oratorical moods. So completely were his auditors carried away by the force of his denunciation of existing political evils and by the eloquence of his appeal for harmony and union to redress them, that neither a verbatim report nor even an authentic abstract was made during its delivery, but the lifting inspiration of its periods will never fade from the memory of those who heard it. About three weeks later, the first national convention of the Republican Party met in Philadelphia and nominated John C. Fremont of California for president. There was a certain fitness in this selection from the fact that he had been elected to the United States Senate when California applied for admission as a free state, and that the resistance of the South to her admission had been the entering wedge of the slavery agitation of 1850. This, however, was in reality a minor consideration. It was rather his romantic fame as a daring Rocky Mountain explorer, appealing strongly to popular imagination and sympathy, which gave him prestige as a presidential candidate. It was at this point that the career of Abraham Lincoln had a narrow and fortunate escape from a premature and fatal prominence. The Illinois Bloomington Convention had sent him as a delegate to the Philadelphia Convention, and no doubt very unexpectedly to himself, on the first ballot for a candidate for vice president, he received 110 votes against 259 votes for William L. Dayton of New Jersey, upon which the choice of Mr. Dayton was at once made unanimous. 
but the incident proves that Mr. Lincoln was already gaining a national fame among the advanced leaders of political thought. Happily, a mysterious providence reserved him for larger and nobler uses. The nominations thus made at Philadelphia completed the array for the presidential battle of 1856. The Democratic National Convention had met at Cincinnati on June 2nd and nominated James Buchanan for president and John C. Breckinridge for vice president. Its work presented two points of noteworthy interest, namely, that the South, in an arrogant pro-slavery dictatorship, relentlessly cast aside the claims of Douglas and Pierce, who had effected the repeal of the Missouri Compromise, and nominated Buchanan in apparently sure confidence of that superserviceable zeal in behalf of slavery which he so obediently rendered. Also that in a platform of intolerable length there was such a cunning ambiguity of words and concealment of sense, such a double-dealing of phrase and meaning, as to render it possible that the pro-slavery Democrats of the South and some anti-slavery Democrats of the North might join for the last time to elect a northern man with southern principles. Again, in this campaign, as in several former presidential elections, Mr. Lincoln was placed upon the electoral ticket of Illinois, and he made over fifty speeches in his own and adjoining states in behalf of Fremont and Dayton. Not one of these speeches was reported in full, but the few fragments which have been preserved show that he occupied no doubtful ground on the pending issues. Already the Democrats were raising the potent alarm cry that the Republican Party was sectional, and that its success would dissolve the Union. Mr. Lincoln did not then dream that he would ever have to deal practically with such a contingency, but his mind was very clear as to the method of meeting it. Speaking for the Republican Party, he said, But the Union in any event will not be dissolved. We don't want to dissolve it, and if you attempt it, we won't let you. With the purse and sword, the army and navy and treasury in our hands and at our command, you could not do it. This government would be very weak, indeed, if a majority with a disciplined army and navy and a well-filled treasury could not preserve itself when attacked by an unarmed, undisciplined, unorganized minority. All this talk about the dissolution of the Union is humbug, nothing but folly. We do not want to dissolve the Union, you shall not. While the Republican Party was much cast down by the election of Buchanan in November, the Democrats found significant cause for apprehension in the unexpected strength with which the Fremont ticket had been supported in the free states. Especially was this true in Illinois, where the adherents of Fremont and Fillmore had formed a fusion and thereby elected a Republican governor and state officers. One of the strong elements of Mr. Lincoln's leadership was the cheerful hope that he was always able to inspire in his followers, in the correct political instincts of popular majorities. This trait was happily exemplified in a speech he made at a Republican banquet in Chicago about a month after the presidential election. Recalling the pregnant fact that though Buchanan gained a majority of the electoral vote, he was in a minority by about 400,000 of the popular vote for president, Mr. Lincoln thus summed up the chances of Republican success in the future. Our government rests in public opinion. Whoever can change public opinion can change the government, practically just so much. Public opinion on any subject always has a central idea, from which all its minor thoughts radiate. That central idea in our political public opinion at the beginning was, and until recently has continued to be, the equality of man. And although it has always submitted patiently to whatever of inequality there seemed to be as a matter of actual necessity, its constant working has been a steady progress towards the practical equality of all men. The late presidential election was a struggle by one party to discard that central idea and to substitute for it the opposite idea that slavery is right in the abstract, the workings of which as a central idea may be the perpetuity of human slavery and its extension to all countries and colors. All of us who did not vote for Mr. Buchanan taken together are a majority of 400,000. But in the late contest we were divided between Fremont and Fillmore. Can we not come together for the future? Let every one who really believes and is resolved that free society is not and shall not be a failure, and who can conscientiously declare that in the past contest he has done only what he thought best, let every such one have charity to believe that every other one can say as much. 
Thus let bygones be bygones, let past differences as nothing be, and with steady eye on the real issue, let us re-inaugurate the good old central ideas of the Republic. We can do it. The human heart is with us. God is with us. We shall again be able not to declare that all states as states are equal, nor yet all citizens as citizens are equal, but to renew the broader, better declaration, including both these and much more, that all men are created equal. End of chapter 7 Recording by Ernst Schnell in Aberdeen Chapter 8 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John George Nicolay Chapter 8 Buchanan elected President The Dred Scott Decision Douglas's Springfield Speech, 1857 Lincoln's Answering Speech Criticism of Dred Scott Decision, Kansas Civil War, Buchanan Appoints Walker, Walker's Letter on Kansas, The Lecompton Constitution, Revolt of Douglas. The election of 1856 once more restored the Democratic Party to full political control in national affairs. James Buchanan was elected president to succeed Pierce. The Senate continued, as before, to have a decided Democratic majority, and a clear Democratic majority of 25 was chosen to the House of Representatives to succeed the heavy opposition majority of the previous Congress. Though the new House did not organize till a year after it was elected, the certainty of its coming action was sufficient not only to restore, but greatly to accelerate the pro-slavery reaction begun by the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. This impending drift of national policy now received a powerful impetus by an act of the third coordinate branch, the Judicial Department of the Government. Very unexpectedly to the public at large, the Supreme Court of the United States, a few days after Buchanan's inauguration, announced its judgment in what quickly became famous as the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott, a Negro slave in Missouri, sued for his freedom on the ground that his master had taken him to reside in the state of Illinois and the territory of Wisconsin, where slavery was prohibited by law. The question had been twice decided by Missouri courts, once for and then against Dred Scott's claim, and now the Supreme Court of the United States, after hearing the case twice elaborately argued by eminent counsel, finally decided that Dred Scott, being a Negro, could not become a citizen, and therefore was not entitled to bring suit. This branch, under ordinary precedent, simply threw the case out of court, but in addition the decision, proceeding with what lawyers call obiter dictum, went on to declare that under the Constitution of the United States neither Congress nor a territorial legislature possessed power to prohibit slavery in federal territories. The whole country immediately flared up with the agitation of the slavery question in this new form. The South defended the decision with heat, the North protested against it with indignation, and the controversy was greatly intensified by a phrase in the opinion of Chief Justice Taney that at the time of the Declaration of Independence Negroes were considered by general public opinion to be so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. This decision of the Supreme Court placed Senator Douglas in a curious dilemma. While it served to endorse and fortify his course in repealing the Missouri Compromise, it, on the other hand, totally negatived his theory by which he had sought to make the repeal palatable, that the people of a territory, by the exercise of his great principle of popular sovereignty, could decide the slavery question for themselves. But, being a subtle sophist, he sought to maintain a show of consistency by an ingenious evasion. In the month of June following the decision, he made a speech at Springfield, Illinois, in which he tentatively announced what in the next year became widely celebrated as his Freeport Doctrine, and was immediately denounced by his political confreres of the South as serious party heterodoxy, first lauding the Supreme Court as the highest judicial tribunal on earth, and declaring that violent resistance to its decrees must be put down by the strong arm of the government. He went on thus to define a master's right to his slave in Kansas. While the right continues in full force under the guarantees of the Constitution, and cannot be divested or alienated by an act of Congress, 
it necessarily remains a barren and a worthless right unless sustained, protected, and enforced by appropriate police regulations and local legislation prescribing adequate remedies for its violation. These regulations and remedies must necessarily depend entirely upon the will and wishes of the people of the territory, as they can only be prescribed by the local legislatures. Hence the great principle of popular sovereignty and self-government is sustained and firmly established by the authority of this decision. Both the legal and political aspects of the new question immediately engaged the earnest attention of Mr. Lincoln, and his splendid power of analysis set its ominous portent in a strong light. He made a speech in reply to Douglas about two weeks after, subjecting the Dred Scott decision to a searching and eloquent criticism. He said, That decision declares two propositions. First, that a Negro cannot sue in the United States courts and secondly that congress cannot prohibit slavery in the territories it was made by a divided court dividing differently on the different points judge douglas does not discuss the merits of the decision and in that respect i shall follow his example believing i could no more improve on mclean and curtis than he could on taney we think the dred scott decision was erroneous we know the court that made it has often overruled its own decisions and we shall do what we can to have it overrule this we offer no resistance to it. If this important decision had been made by the unanimous concurrence of the judges, and without any apparent partisan bias, and in accordance with legal public expectation, and with the steady practice of the departments throughout our history, and had been in no part based on assumed historical facts which are not really true, or if, wanting in some of these, it had been before the court more than once, and had there been affirmed and reaffirmed through a course of years, it then might be, perhaps would be, factious, nay, even revolutionary, not to acquiesce in it as a precedent. But when, as is true, we find it wanting in all these claims to the public confidence, it is not resistance, it is not factious, it is not even disrespectful, to treat it as not having yet quite established a settled doctrine for the country." The Chief Justice does not directly assert, but plainly assumes, as a fact, that the public estimate of the black man is more favorable now than it was in the days of the Revolution. This assumption is a mistake. In some trifling particulars the condition of that race has been ameliorated, but as a whole in this country the change between then and now is decidedly the other way, and their ultimate destiny has never appeared so hopeless as in the last three or four years. In two of the five states, New Jersey and North Carolina, that then gave the free Negro the right of voting, the right has since been taken away. And in the third, New York, it has been greatly abridged, while it has not been extended, so far as I know, to a single additional state, though the number of the states has more than doubled. In those days, as I understand, masters could, at their own pleasure, emancipate their slaves but since then such legal restraints have been made upon emancipation as to amount almost to prohibition in those days legislatures held the unquestioned power to abolish slavery in their respective states but now it is becoming quite fashionable for state constitutions to withhold that power from the legislatures in those days by common consent the spread of the black man's bondage to the new countries was prohibited but now congress decides that it will not continue the prohibition and the supreme court decides that it could not if it would in those days our declaration of independence was held sacred by all and thought to include all but now to aid in making the bondage of the negro universal and eternal it is assailed and sneered at and construed and hawked at and torn till if its framers could rise from their graves they could not at all recognize it all the powers of earth seem rapidly combining against him Mammon is after him, ambition follows, philosophy follows, and the theology of the day is fast joining the cry. They have him in his prison house, they have searched his person, and left no prying instrument with him. One after another they have closed the heavy iron doors upon him, and now they have him, as it were, bolted in with a lock of a hundred keys, which can never be unlocked without the concurrence of every key, the keys in the hands of a hundred different men, and they scattered to a hundred different and distant places, and they stand musing as to what invention in all the dominions of mind and matter can be produced to make the impossibility of his escape more complete than it is. There is not room to quote the many other equally forcible points in Mr. Lincoln's speech. Our narrative must proceed to other significant events in the great pro-slavery reaction. 
Thus far the Kansas experiment had produced nothing but agitation, strife, and bloodshed. First the storm in Congress over repeal, then a mad rush of immigration to occupy the territory. This was followed by the border ruffian invasions, in which Missouri voters elected a bogus territorial legislature, and the bogus legislature enacted a code of bogus laws. In turn, the more rapid immigration from free states filled the territory with a majority of free state voters, who quickly organized a compact free state party, which sent a free state constitution, known as the Topeka Constitution, to Congress, and applied for admission. This movement proved barren, because the two houses of Congress were divided in sentiment. Meanwhile, President Pierce recognized the bogus laws, and issued proclamations declaring the free state movement illegal and insurrectionary and the Free State Party had, in its turn, baffled the enforcement of the bogus laws, partly by concerted action of non-conformity and neglect, partly by open defiance. The whole finally culminated in a chronic border war between Missouri raiders on one hand and Free State guerrillas on the other, and it became necessary to send Federal troops to check the disorder. These were instructed by Jefferson Davis, then Secretary of War, that rebellion must be crushed. The future Confederate president little suspected the tremendous prophetic import of his order. The most significant illustration of the underlying spirit of the struggle was that President Pierce had successively appointed three Democratic governors for the territory, who, starting with pro-slavery bias, all became free state partisans, and were successively insulted and driven from the territory by the pro-slavery faction, when, in manly protest, they refused to carry out the behests of the Missouri conspiracy. After a three years' struggle, neither faction had been successful, neither party was satisfied, and the administration of Pierce bequeathed to its successor the same old question embittered by rancor and defeat. President Buchanan began his administration with a boldly announced pro-slavery policy. In his inaugural address, he invoked the popular acceptance of the Dred Scott decision, which he already knew was coming and a few months later declared in a public letter that slavery exists in Kansas under the Constitution of the United States. How it ever could have been seriously doubted is a mystery. He chose for the governorship of Kansas Robert J. Walker, a citizen of Mississippi of national fame and of pronounced pro-slavery views, who accepted his dangerous mission only upon condition that a new Constitution, to be formed for that state, must be honestly submitted to the real voters of Kansas for adoption or rejection. President Buchanan and his advisers, as well as Senator Douglas, accepted this condition repeatedly and emphatically. But when the new governor went to the territory, he soon became convinced, and reported to his chief, that to make a slave state of Kansas was a delusive hope. Indeed, he wrote, it is universally admitted here that the only real question is this, whether Kansas shall be a conservative, constitutional, democratic, and ultimately free state, or whether it shall be a republican and abolition state. As a compensation for the disappointment, however, he wrote, later, direct to the President, But we must have a slave state out of the southwestern Indian territory, and then a calm will follow. Cuba be acquired with the acquiescence of the North, and your administration, having in reality settled the slavery question, be regarded in all time to come as a re-signing and re-sealing of the Constitution. I shall be pleased soon to hear from you. Cuba, Cuba, in Puerto Rico if possible, should be the countersign of your administration, and it will close in a blaze of glory. And the governor was doubtless much gratified to receive the president's unqualified endorsement in reply. On the question of submitting the Constitution to the bona fide resident settlers of Kansas, I am willing to stand or fall. The sequel to this heroic posturing of the chief magistrate is one of the most humiliating chapters in American politics. Attendant circumstances leave little doubt that a portion of Mr. Buchanan's cabinet, in secret league and correspondence with the pro-slavery Missouri-Kansas cabal, aided and abetted the framing and adoption of what is known to history as the Lecompton Constitution, an organic instrument of a radical pro-slavery type that its pretended submission to popular vote was under phraseology, and in combination with such gigantic electoral frauds and dictatorial procedure as to render the whole transaction a mockery of popular government. Still worse, that President Buchanan himself, 
proving too weak in insight and will to detect the intrigue or resist the influence of his malign counsellors, abandoned his solemn pledges to Governor Walker, adopted the Lecompton Constitution as an administration measure, and recommended it to Congress in a special message, announcing dogmatically, Kansas is therefore at this moment as much a slave state as Georgia or South Carolina. The radical pro-slavery attitude thus assumed by President Buchanan and Southern leaders threw the Democratic Party of the free states into serious disarray, while upon Senator Douglas the blow fell with the force of party treachery, almost of personal indignity. The Dred Scott decision had rudely brushed aside his theory of popular sovereignty, and now the Lecompton Constitution proceedings brutally trampled it down in practice. The disaster overtook him, too, at a critical moment. His senatorial term was about to expire. The next Illinois legislature would elect his successor. The prospect was none too bright for him, for at the late presidential election Illinois had chosen Republican state officers. He was compelled either to break his pledges to the Democratic voters of Illinois, or to lead a revolt against President Buchanan and the Democratic leaders in Congress. Party disgrace at Washington, or popular disgrace in Illinois, were the alternatives before him. To lose his re-election to the Senate would almost certainly end his public career. When, therefore, Congress met in December 1857, Douglas boldly attacked and denounced the Lecompton Constitution, even before the President had recommended it in his special message. "'Stand by the doctrine,' he said, "'that leaves the people perfectly free to form and regulate their institutions for themselves, in their own way, and your party will be united and irresistible in power.' If Kansas wants a slave state constitution, she has a right to it. If she wants a free state constitution, she has a right to it. It is none of my business which way the slavery clause is decided. I care not whether it is voted down or voted up. Do you suppose, after the pledges of my honor, that I would go for that principle and leave the people to vote as they choose, that I would now degrade myself by voting one way if the slavery clause be voted down, and another way if it be voted up? I care not how that vote may stand. Ignore Lecompton. Ignore Topeka. Treat both those party movements as irregular and void. Pass a fair bill, the one that we framed ourselves when we were acting as a unit. Have a fair election, and you will have peace in the Democratic Party, and peace throughout the country in ninety days. The people want a fair vote. They will never be satisfied without it. But if this Constitution is to be forced down our throats in violation of the fundamental principle of free government under a mode of submission that is a mockery and insult, I will resist it to the last. Walker, the fourth Democratic governor, who had now been sacrificed to the interests of the Kansas pro-slavery cabal, also wrote a sharp letter of resignation denouncing the Lecompton fraud in policy. And such was the indignation aroused in the free states, that although the Senate passed the Lecompton bill, twenty-two Northern Democrats joining their vote to that of the Republicans, the measure was defeated in the House of Representatives. The President and his Southern partisans bitterly resented this defeat, and the schism between them on the one hand, and Douglas and his adherents on the other, became permanent and irreconcilable. End of chapter 8《ハッピーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバースデーバース The Lincoln-Douglas Debates The Freeport Doctrine Douglas Deposed from Chairmanship of Committee on Territories Benjamin on Douglas Lincoln's Popular Majority Douglas Gains Legislature Greeley, Crittenden, et al. The Fight Must Go On Douglas's Southern Speeches Senator Brown's Questions Lincoln's Warnings Against Popular Sovereignty The War of Pamphlets Lincoln's Ohio Speeches The John Brown Raid Lincoln's Comment The hostility of the Buchanan administration to Douglas for his part in defeating the Lecompton Constitution and the multiplying chances against him 
served only to stimulate his followers in Illinois to greater efforts to secure his re-election. Precisely the same elements inspired the hope and increased the enthusiasm of the Republicans of the state to accomplish his defeat. For a candidate to oppose the little giant, there could be no rival in the Republican ranks to Abraham Lincoln. He had, in 1854, yielded his priority of claim to Trumbull. He alone had successfully encountered Douglas in debate. The political events themselves seemed to have selected and pitted these two champions against each other. Therefore, when the Illinois State Convention on June 16, 1858, passed by acclamation a separate resolution that Abraham Lincoln is the first and only choice of the Republicans of Illinois for the United States Senate as the successor of Stephen A. Douglas, it only recorded the well-known judgment of the party. After its routine work was finished, the convention adjourned to meet again in the hall of the State House at Springfield at eight o'clock in the evening. At that hour Mr. Lincoln appeared before the assembled delegates and delivered a carefully studied speech, which has become historic. After a few opening sentences, he uttered the following significant prediction. Quote, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half-slave and half-free. I do not expect the Union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it, and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. End of quote. Then followed his critical analysis of the legislative objects and consequences of the Nebraska Bill, and the judicial effects and doctrines of the Dred Scott decision, with their attendant and related incidents. The first of these had opened all the national territory to slavery. The second established the constitutional interpretation that neither Congress nor a territorial legislature could exclude slavery from any United States territory. The President had declared Kansas to be already practically a slave state. Douglas had announced that he did not care whether slavery was voted down or voted up. Adding to these many other indications of current politics, Mr. Lincoln proceeded, quote, Put this and that together, and we have another nice little niche, which we may ere long see filled with another Supreme Court decision declaring that the Constitution of the United States does not permit a state to exclude slavery from its limits. Such a decision is all that slavery now lacks of being alike lawful in all the states. We shall lie down pleasantly dreaming that the people of Missouri are on the verge of making their state free, and we shall awake to the reality instead that the Supreme Court has made Illinois a slave state. End of quote. To avert this danger, Mr. Lincoln declared it was the duty of Republicans to overthrow both Douglas and the Buchanan political dynasty. Quote, Two years ago the Republicans of the nation mustered over 1,300,000 strong. We did this under the single impulse of resistance to a common danger, with every external circumstance against us. Of strange, discordant, and even hostile elements we gathered from the four winds, and formed and fought the battle through, under the constant hot fire of a disciplined, proud, and pampered enemy. Did we brave all then to falter now, now when that same enemy is wavering, dissevered, and belligerent? The result is not doubtful. We shall not fail. If we stand firm, we shall not fail. Wise counsels may accelerate or mistakes delay it, but sooner or later the victory is sure to come. End of quote. Lincoln's speech excited the greatest interest everywhere throughout the free states. The grave peril he so clearly pointed out came home to the people of the North almost with the force of a revelation, and thereafter their eyes were fixed upon the Illinois senatorial campaign with undivided attention. Another incident also drew to it the equal notice and interest of the politicians of the slave states. 
Within a month from the date of Lincoln's speech, Douglas returned from Washington and began his campaign of active speech-making in Illinois. The fame he had acquired as the champion of the Nebraska Bill, and, more recently, the prominence into which his opposition to the Lecompton fraud had lifted him in Congress, attracted immense crowds to his meetings, and for a few days it seemed as if the mere contagion of popular enthusiasm would submerge all intelligent political discussion. To counteract this, Mr. Lincoln, at the advice of his leading friends, sent him a letter challenging him to joint public debate. Douglas accepted the challenge, but with evident hesitation, and it was arranged that they should jointly address the same meetings at seven towns in the state, on dates extending through August, September, and October. The terms were that, alternately, one should speak an hour in opening, the other an hour and a half in reply, and the first again have half an hour in closing. This placed the contestants upon an equal footing before their audiences. Douglas's senatorial prestige afforded him no advantage. Face to face, with the partisans of both, gathered in immense numbers and alert with critical and jealous watchfulness, there was no evading the square, cold, rigid test of skill in argument and truth in principle. The processions and banners, the music and fireworks of both parties, were stilled and forgotten, while the audience listened with high-strung nerves to the intellectual combat of three hours' duration. It would be impossible to give the scope and spirit of these famous debates in the space allotted to these pages, but one of the turning points in the oratorical contest needs particular mention. Northern Illinois, peopled mostly from free states, and southern Illinois, peopled mostly from slave states, were radically opposed in sentiment on the slavery question. Even the old Whigs of central Illinois had, to a large extent, joined the Democratic Party, because of their ineradicable prejudice against what they stigmatized as abolitionism. To take advantage of this prejudice, Douglas, in his opening speech in the first debate at Ottawa in northern Illinois, propounded to Lincoln a series of questions designed to commit him to strong anti-slavery doctrines. He wanted to know whether Mr. Lincoln stood pledged to the repeal of the Fugitive Slave Law, against the admission of any more slave states, to the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia, to the prohibition of the slave trade between different states, to prohibit slavery in all the territories, to oppose the acquisition of any new territory unless slavery were first prohibited therein. In their second joint debate at Freeport, Lincoln answered that he was pledged to none of these propositions except the prohibition of slavery in all territories of the United States. In turn, he propounded four questions to Douglas, the second of which was, quote, Can the people of a United States territory in any lawful way, against the wish of any citizen of the United States, exclude slavery from its limits prior to the formation of a state constitution. End of quote. Mr. Lincoln had long and carefully studied the import and effect of this interrogatory, and nearly a month before, in a private letter, accurately foreshadowed Douglas's course upon it. You shall have hard work, he wrote, to get him directly to the point whether a territorial legislature has or has not the power to exclude slavery. But if you succeed in bringing him to it, though he will be compelled to say it possesses no such power, he will instantly take ground that slavery cannot actually exist in the territories unless the people desire it, and so give it protection by territorial legislation. If this offends the South, he will let it offend them, as at all events he means to hold on to his chances in Illinois. On the night before the Freeport debate, the question had also been considered in a hurried caucus of Lincoln's party friends. They all advised against propounding it, saying, If you do, you can never be senator. Gentlemen, replied Lincoln, I am killing larger game. If Douglas answers, he can never be president and the battle of 1860 is worth a hundred of this. As Lincoln had predicted, 
Douglas had no resource but to repeat the sophism he had hastily invented in his Springfield speech of the previous year. "'It matters not,' replied he, "'what way the Supreme Court may hereafter decide as to the abstract question whether slavery may or may not go into a territory under the Constitution. The people have the lawful means to introduce it or exclude it, as they please, for the reason that slavery cannot exist a day or an hour anywhere unless it is supported by local police regulations. Those police regulations can only be established by the local legislature, and if the people are opposed to slavery, they will elect representatives to that body who will by unfriendly legislation effectually prevent the introduction of it into their midst. If, on the contrary, they are for it, their legislation will favor its extension. Hence, no matter what the decision of the Supreme Court may be on that abstract question, still the right of the people to make a slave territory or a free territory is perfect and complete under the Nebraska Bill. In the course of the next joint debate at Jonesboro, Mr. Lincoln easily disposed of this sophism by showing 1 that, practically, slavery had worked its way into territories without police regulations in almost every instance. 2. That United States courts were established to protect and enforce rights under the Constitution. 3. That members of a territorial legislature could not violate their oath to support the Constitution of the United States. And 4. That in default of legislative support, Congress would be bound to supply it for any right under the Constitution. The serious aspect of the matter, however, to Douglas was not the criticism of the Republicans, but the view taken by Southern Democratic leaders of his Freeport Doctrine, or Doctrine of Unfriendly Legislation. His opposition to the Lecompton Constitution in the Senate, grievous stumbling-block to their schemes as it had proved, might yet be passed over as a reckless breach of party discipline. But this new announcement at Freeport was unpardonable doctrinal heresy, as rank as the abolitionism of Giddings and Lovejoy. The Freeport joint debate took place August 27, 1858. When Congress convened on the first Monday in December of the same year, one of the first acts of the Democratic Senators was to put him under party ban by removing him from the chairmanship of the Committee on Territories, a position he had held for eleven years. In due time, also, the Southern leaders broke up the Charleston Convention rather than permit him to be nominated for President, and three weeks later Senator Benjamin of Louisiana frankly set forth in a Senate speech the light in which they viewed his apostasy. Quote, we accuse him for this, to wit, that having bargained with us upon a point upon which we were at issue, that it should be considered a judicial point, that he would abide the decision, that he would act under the decision, and consider it a doctrine of the party, that having said that to us here in the Senate, he went home, and under the stress of a local election his knees gave way, his whole person trembled. His adversary stood upon principle and was beaten, and, lo, he is the candidate of a mighty party for the presidency of the United States. The senator from Illinois faltered. He got the prize for which he faltered, but, lo, the grand prize of his ambition to-day slips from his grasp, because of his faltering in his former contest, and his success in the canvas for the Senate, purchased for an ignoble price, has cost him the loss of the presidency of the United States. End of quote. In addition to the seven joint debates, both Lincoln and Douglas made speeches at separate meetings of their own during almost every day of the three months' campaign, and sometimes two or three speeches a day. At the election which was held on November 2, 1858, a legislature was chosen containing 54 Democrats and 46 Republicans, notwithstanding the fact that the Republicans had a plurality of 3,821 on the popular vote. But the apportionment was based on the census of 1850 and did not reflect recent changes in political sentiment, which, if fairly represented, would have given them an increased strength of from six to ten members in the legislature. 
Another circumstance had great influence in causing Lincoln's defeat. Douglas's opposition to the Lecompton Constitution in Congress had won him great sympathy among a few Republican leaders in the eastern states. It was even whispered that Seward wished Douglas to succeed as a strong rebuke to the Buchanan administration. The most potent expression and influence of this feeling came, however, from another quarter. Senator Crittenden of Kentucky, who, since Clay's death in 1852, was the acknowledged leader of what remained of the Whig Party, wrote a letter during the campaign openly advocating the re-election of Douglas, and this, doubtless, influenced the vote of all the Illinois Whigs who had not yet formally joined the Republican Party. Lincoln's own analysis gives, perhaps, the clearest view of the unusual political conditions. Quote, Douglas had three or four very distinguished men of the most extreme anti-slavery views of any men in the Republican Party expressing their desire for his re-election to the Senate last year. That would of itself have seemed to be a little wonderful, but what wonder is heightened when we see that Wise of Virginia, a man exactly opposed to them, a man who believes in the divine right of slavery, was also expressing his desire that Douglas should be re-elected that another man that may be said to be kindred to wise, Mr. Breckinridge, the vice president, and of your own state, was also agreeing with the anti-slavery men in the North that Douglas ought to be re-elected. Still to heighten the wonder, a senator from Kentucky, whom I have always loved with an affection as tender and as endearing as I have ever loved any man, who was opposed to the anti-slavery men for reasons which seemed sufficient to him, and equally opposed to Wise and Breckinridge, was writing letters to Illinois to secure the re-election of Douglas. Now that all these conflicting elements should be brought, while at daggers points with one another, to support him, is a feat that is worthy for you to note and consider. It is quite probable that each of these classes of men thought by the re-election of Douglas their peculiar views would gain something. It is probable that the anti-slavery men thought their views would gain something that Wise and Breckinridge thought so too, as regards their opinions. That Mr. Crittenden thought that his views would gain something, although he was opposed to both these other men. It is probable that each and all of them thought they were using Douglas, and it is yet an unsolved problem whether he was not using them all. End of quote. Lincoln, though beaten in his race for the Senate, was by no means dismayed, nor did he lose his faith in the ultimate triumph of the cause he had so ably championed. Writing to a friend, he said, quote, You doubtless have seen ere this the result of the election here. Of course I wished, but I did not much expect a better result. I am glad I made the late race. It gave me a hearing on the great and durable question of the age, which I could have had in no other way. And though I now sink out of view and shall be forgotten, I believe I have made some marks which will tell for the cause of civil liberty long after I am gone. End of quote. And to another, quote, Yours of the thirteenth was received some days ago. The fight must go on. The cause of civil liberty must not be surrendered at the end of one or even one hundred defeats. Douglas had the ingenuity to be supported in the late contest both as the best means to break down and to uphold the slave interest. No ingenuity can keep these antagonistic elements in harmony long. Another explosion will soon come. End of quote. In his house divided against itself speech, Lincoln had emphatically cautioned Republicans not to be led on a false trail by the opposition Douglas had made to the Lecompton Constitution, that his temporary quarrel with the Buchanan administration could not be relied upon to help overthrow that pro-slavery dynasty. Quote, How can he oppose the advances of slavery? He don't care anything about it. His avowed mission is impressing the public heart to care nothing about it. Whenever, if ever, he and we can come together on principle, so that our great cause may have assistance from his great ability, I hope to have interposed no adventitious obstacle. But clearly he is not now with us. He does not pretend to be. He does not promise ever to be. 
Our cause, then, must be entrusted to, and conducted by, its own undoubted friends, those whose hands are free, whose hearts are in the work, who do care for the result. End of quote. Since the result of the Illinois senatorial campaign had assured the re-election of Douglas to the Senate, Lincoln's sage advice acquired a double significance and value. Almost immediately after the close of the campaign, Douglas took a trip through the southern states, and in speeches made by him at Memphis, at New Orleans, and at Baltimore, sought to regain the confidence of southern politicians by taking decidedly advanced ground toward southern views on the slavery question. On the sugar plantations of Louisiana, he said, it was not a question between the white man and the negro, but between the negro and the crocodile. He would say that between the negro and the crocodile he took the side of the negro, but between the negro and the white man he would go for the white man. The Almighty had drawn a line on this continent, on the one side of which the soil must be cultivated by slave labor, on the other by white labor. That line did not run at thirty-six degrees and thirty minutes, the Missouri Compromise Line, for thirty-six degrees and thirty minutes runs over mountains and through valleys. But this slave line, he said, meanders in the sugar fields and plantations of the South, and the people living in their different localities and in the territories must determine for themselves whether their middle belt were best adapted to slavery or free labor. He advocated the eventual annexation of Cuba and Central America. Still going a step further, he had laid down a far-reaching principle. It is a law of humanity, he said, a law of civilization that whenever a man or a race of men show themselves incapable of managing their own affairs, they must consent to be governed by those who are capable of performing the duty. In accordance with this principle, I assert that the Negro race, under all circumstances, at all times, and in all countries, has shown itself incapable of self-government. This pro-slavery coquetting, however, availed him nothing, as he felt himself obliged in the same speeches to defend his Freeport doctrine. Having taken his seat in Congress, Senator Brown of Mississippi, toward the close of the short session, catechized him sharply on this point. "'If the territorial legislature refuses to act,' he inquired, "'will you act? If it pass unfriendly acts, will you pass friendly? If it pass laws hostile to slavery, will you annul them, and substitute laws favoring slavery in their stead?' There was no evading these direct questions, and Douglas answered frankly. Quote, I tell you, gentlemen of the South, in all candor, I do not believe a Democratic candidate can ever carry any one Democratic state of the North on the platform that it is the duty of the federal government to force the people of a territory to have slavery when they do not want it. End of quote. An extended discussion between Northern and Southern Democratic senators followed the colloquy, which showed that the Freeport Doctrine had opened up an irreparable schism between the northern and southern Whigs of the Democratic Party. In all the speeches made by Douglas during his southern tour, he continually referred to Mr. Lincoln as the champion of abolitionism, and to his doctrines as the platform of the abolition or Republican Party. The practical effect of this course was to extend and prolong the Illinois senatorial campaign of 1858, to expand it to national breadth, and gradually to merge it in the coming presidential campaign. The effect of this was not only to keep before the public the position of Lincoln as the Republican champion of Illinois, but also gradually to lift him into general recognition as a national leader. Throughout the year 1859, Politicians and newspapers came to look upon Lincoln as the one antagonist who could at all times be relied on to answer and refute the Douglas arguments. His propositions were so forcible and direct, his phraseology so apt and fresh, that they held the attention and excited comment. A letter written by him in answer to an invitation to attend a celebration of Jefferson's birthday in Boston contained some notable passages. Quote, Soberly, 
it is now no child's play to save the principles of Jefferson from total overthrow in this nation. One would state with great confidence that he could convince any sane child that the simpler propositions of Euclid are true, but nevertheless he would fail utterly with one who should deny the definitions and axioms. The principles of Jefferson are the definitions and axioms of free society, and yet they are denied and evaded with no small show of success. One dashingly calls them glittering generalities, another bluntly calls them self-evident lies, and others insidiously argue that they apply to superior races. These expressions, differing in form, are identical in object and effect. The supplanting of the principles of free government, and restoring those of classification, caste, and legitimacy. They would delight a convocation of crowned heads plotting against the people. They are the vanguard, the miners and sappers of returning despotism. We must repulse them, or they will subjugate us. This is a world of compensation, and he who would be no slave must consent to have no slave. Those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves, and under a just God cannot long retain it. End of quote. Douglas's quarrel with the Buchanan administration had led many Republicans to hope that they might be able to utilize his name and his theory of popular sovereignty to aid them in their local campaigns. Lincoln knew from his recent experience the peril of this delusive party strategy, and was constant and earnest in his warnings against adopting it. In a little speech after the Chicago municipal election on March 1, 1859, he said, quote, if we, the Republicans of this state, had made Judge Douglas our candidate for the Senate of the United States last year, and had elected him, there would today be no Republican Party in this Union. Let the Republican Party of Illinois dally with Judge Douglas, let them fall in behind him and make him their candidate, and they do not absorb him, he absorbs them. They would come out at the end, all Douglas men, all claimed by him as having endorsed every one of his doctrines upon the great subject with which the whole nation is engaged at this hour, that the question of Negro slavery is simply a question of dollars and cents, that the Almighty has drawn a line across the continent on one side of which labor, the cultivation of the soil, must always be performed by slaves. It would be claimed that we, like him, do not care whether slavery is voted up or voted down, had we made him our candidate, and given him a great majority, we should never have heard an end of declarations by him that we had endorsed all these dogmas. End of quote. To a Kansas friend, he wrote on May 14, 1859, quote, You will probably adopt resolutions in the nature of a platform. I think the only temptation will be to lower the Republican standard in order to gather recruits. In my judgment, such a step would be a serious mistake, and open a gap through which more would pass out than pass in. And this would be the same whether the letting down should be in deference to Douglasism or to the Southern opposition element. Either would surrender the object of the Republican organization, the preventing of the spread and nationalization of slavery. Let a union be attempted on the basis of ignoring the slavery question and magnify other questions which the people are just not caring about, and it will result in gaining no single electoral vote in the South and losing everyone in the North. End of quote. To Schuyler Colfax, afterward vice president, he said in a letter dated July 6, 1859, quote, my main object in such conversation would be to hedge against divisions in the Republican ranks generally, and particularly for the contest of 1860. The point of danger is the temptation in different localities to platform for something which will be popular just there, but which, nevertheless, will be a firebrand elsewhere and especially in a national convention. As instances, the movement against foreigners in Massachusetts, in New Hampshire, to make obedience to the fugitive slave law punishable as a crime, in Ohio, to repeal the fugitive slave law, 
and squatter sovereignty in Kansas. In these things there is explosive matter enough to blow up half a dozen national conventions, if it gets into them, and what gets very rife outside of conventions is very likely to find its way into them. End of quote. And again, to another warm friend in Columbus, Ohio, he wrote in a letter dated July 28, 1859, quote, There is another thing our friends are doing which gives me some uneasiness. It is their leaning toward popular sovereignty. There are three substantial objections to this. First, no party can command respect which sustains this year what it opposed last. Secondly, Douglas, who is the most dangerous enemy of liberty, because he is the most insidious one, would have left little support in the North, and by consequence no capital to trade on in the South, if it were not for his friends thus magnifying him and his humbug. But lastly and chiefly, Douglas's popular sovereignty, accepted by the public mind as a just principle, nationalizes slavery and revives the African slave trade inevitably. Taking slaves into new territories and buying slaves in Africa are identical things, identical rights or identical wrongs, and the argument which establishes one will establish the other. Try a thousand years for a sound reason why Congress shall not hinder the people of Kansas from having slaves, and when you have found it, it will be an equally good one why Congress should not hinder the people of Georgia from importing slaves from Africa. End of quote. An important election occurred in the state of Ohio in the autumn of 1859, and during the canvass Douglas made two speeches in which, as usual, his pointed attacks were directed against Lincoln by name. Quite naturally, the Ohio Republicans called Lincoln to answer him and the marked impression created by Lincoln's replies showed itself not alone in their unprecedented circulation in print and newspapers and pamphlets, but also in the decided success which the Ohio Republicans gained at the polls. About the same time, also, Douglas printed a long political essay in Harper's Magazine, using as a text quotation from Lincoln's House Divided Against Itself speech, and Seward's Rochester speech defining the irrepressible conflict. Attorney General Black of President Buchanan's cabinet here entered the lists with an anonymously printed pamphlet in pungent criticism of Douglas's Harper essay, which again was followed by reply and rejoinder on both sides. Into this field of overheated political controversy, the news of the John Brown raid at Harper's Ferry on Sunday, October 19, fell with startling portent. The scattering and tragic fighting in the streets of the little town on Monday, the dramatic capture of the fanatical leader on Tuesday by a detachment of Federal Marines under the command of Robert E. Lee, the famous Confederate general of subsequent years, the undignified haste of his trial and condemnation by the Virginia authorities, the interviews of Governor Wise, Senator Mason, and Representative Vallandigham with the prisoner, his sentence and execution on the gallows on December 2, and the hysterical laudations of his acts by a few prominent and extreme abolitionists in the East, kept public opinion, both North and South, in an inflamed and feverish state for nearly six weeks. Mr. Lincoln's habitual freedom from passion, and the steady and common-sense judgment he applied to this exciting event, which threw almost everybody into an extreme of feeling or utterance, are well illustrated by the tempered criticism he made of it a few months later. Quote, John Brown's effort was peculiar. It was not a slave insurrection. It was an attempt by white men to get up a revolt among slaves, in which the slaves refused to participate. In fact, it was so absurd that the slaves, with all their ignorance, saw plainly enough it could not succeed. That affair, in its philosophy, corresponds with the many attempts, related in history, at the assassination of kings and emperors. An enthusiast broods over the oppression of a people till he fancies himself commissioned by heaven to liberate them. He ventures the attempt which ends in little else than his own execution. Orsini's attempt on Louis Napoleon, 
and John Brown's attempt at Harper's Ferry were in their philosophy precisely the same. The eagerness to cast blame on old England in the one case, and on new England in the other, does not disprove the sameness of the two things. End of chapter 9 Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois Chapter 10 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ernst Schnell. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 10 Lincoln's Kansas Speeches, The Cooper Institute Speech, New England speeches, the Democratic schism, Senator Brown's resolutions, Jefferson Davis's resolutions, the Charleston Convention, majority and minority reports, cotton state delegations secede, Charleston Convention adjourns, Democratic Baltimore Convention splits, Breckenridge nominated, Douglas nominated, Bell nominated by Union Constitutional Convention, Chicago Convention, Lincoln's letters to Pickett and Judd, the pivotal states, Lincoln nominated. During the month of December 1859, Mr. Lincoln was invited to the territory of Kansas, where he made speeches at a number of its new and growing towns. In these speeches, he laid special emphasis upon the necessity of maintaining undiminished the vigor of the Republican organization and the high plane of the Republican doctrine. We want and must have, said he, a national policy as to slavery, which deals with it as being a wrong. Whoever would prevent slavery becoming national and perpetual yields all when he yields to a policy which treats it either as being right or as being a matter of indifference. To effect our main object, we have to employ auxiliary means. We must hold conventions, adopt platforms, select candidates, and carry elections. At every step we must be true to the main purpose. If we adopt a platform falling short of our principle, or elect a man rejecting our principle, we not only take nothing affirmative by our success, but we draw upon us the positive embarrassment of seeming ourselves to have abandoned our principle. A still more important service, however, in giving the Republican presidential campaign of 1860 precise form and issue, was rendered by him during the first three months of the new year. The public mind had become so preoccupied with the dominant subject of national politics that a committee of enthusiastic young Republicans of New York and Brooklyn arranged a course of public lectures by prominent statesmen, and Mr. Lincoln was invited to deliver the third one of the series. The meeting took place in the hall of the Cooper Institute in New York on the evening of February 27, 1860, and the audience was made up of ladies and gentlemen comprising the leading representatives of the wealth, culture and influence of the great metropolis. Mr. Lincoln's name and arguments had filled so large a space in Eastern newspapers, both friendly and hostile, that the listeners before him were intensely curious to see and hear this rising Western politician. The West was even at that late day but imperfectly understood by the East. The poets and editors, the bankers and merchants of New York vaguely remembered having read in their books that it was the home of Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett, the country of bowie knives and pistols, of steamboat explosions and mobs, of wild speculation and the repudiation of state debts. And these half-forgotten impressions had lately been vividly recalled by a several years' succession of newspaper reports retailing the incidents of border ruffian violence and free state guerrilla reprisals during the Civil War in Kansas. What was to be the type, the character, the language of this speaker? How could he impress the great editor Horace Greeley, who sat among the invited guests? David Dudley Field, the great lawyer who escorted him to the platform, William Cullen Bryant, the great poet who presided over the meeting, 
Judging from after effects, the audience quickly forgot these questioning thoughts. They had but time to note Mr. Lincoln's impressive stature, his strongly marked features, the clear ring of his rather high-pitched voice, and the almost commanding earnestness of his manner. His beginning foreshadowed a dry argument, using as a text Douglas's phrase that our fathers, when they framed the government under which we live, understood this question just as well and even better than we do now. But the concise statements, the strong links of reasoning and the irresistible conclusions of the argument, with which the speaker followed his close historical analysis of how our fathers understood this question, held every listener as though each were individually merged with the speaker's thought and demonstration. It is surely safe to assume, said he with emphasis, that the thirty-nine framers of the original Constitution and the seventy-six members of the Congress, which framed the amendments thereto, taken together do certainly include those who may be fairly called our fathers who framed the government under which we live. And so assuming, I defy any man to show that any one of them ever in his whole life declared that in his understanding any proper division of local from federal authority or any part of the constitution forbade the federal government to control as to slavery in the federal territories with equal skill he next dissected the complaints the demands and the threats to dissolve the union made by the southern states pointed out their emptiness their fallacy and their injustice and defined the exact point and center of the agitation Holding, as they do, said he, that slavery is morally right and socially elevating, they cannot cease to demand a full national recognition of it as a legal right and a social blessing. Nor can we justifiably withhold this on any ground, save our conviction that slavery is wrong. If slavery is right, all words, acts, laws, and constitutions against it are themselves wrong and should be silenced and swept away. If it is right, we cannot justly object to its nationality, its universality. If it is wrong, they cannot justly insist upon its extension, its enlargement. All they ask we could readily grant if we thought slavery right. All we ask they could readily grant if they thought it wrong. Their thinking it right and our thinking it wrong is the precise fact upon which depends the whole controversy. Wrong as we think slavery is, we can yet afford to let it alone where it is, because that much is due to the necessity arising from its actual presence in the nation. But can we, while our votes will prevent it, allow it to spread into the national territories and to overrun us here in the free states? If our sense of duty forbids this, then let us stand by our duty fearlessly and effectively. Let us be diverted by none of those sophistical contrivances wherewith we are so industriously plied and belabored, contrivances such as groping for some middle ground between the right and the wrong, vain as the search for a man who should be neither a living man nor a dead man. Such as a policy of don't care on a question about which all true men do care. Such as union appeals beseeching true union men to yield to disunionist reversing the divine rule and calling not the sinners but the righteous to repentance. Such as invocations to Washington imploring men to unsay what Washington said and undo what Washington did. Neither let us be slandered from our duty by false accusation against us, nor frightened from it by menaces of destruction to the government nor of dungeons to ourselves. Let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith let us, to the end, dare to do our duty as we understand it. The close attention bestowed on its delivery, the hearty applause that greeted its telling points, and the enthusiastic comments of the Republican journals next morning showed that Lincoln's Cooper Institute speech had taken New York by storm. It was printed in full in four of the leading New York dailies, and at once went into large circulation in carefully edited pamphlet editions. From New York, Lincoln made a tour of speech-making through several of the New England states, and was everywhere received with enthusiastic welcome, and listened to with an eagerness that bore a marked result in their spring elections. The interest of the factory men who listened to these addresses was equaled, perhaps excelled, by the gratified surprise of college professors, 
when they heard the style and method of a popular western orator that would bear the test of their professional criticism and compare with the best examples in their standard textbooks. The attitude of the Democratic Party in the coming presidential campaign was now also rapidly taking shape. Great curiosity existed whether the radical differences between its northern and southern wings could by any possibility be removed or adjusted, whether the adherents of Douglas and those of Buchanan could be brought to join in a common platform and in the support of a single candidate. The Democratic leaders in the southern states had become more and more outspoken in their pro-slavery demands. They had advanced step by step from the repeal of the Missouri Compromise in 1854, the attempt to capture Kansas by Missouri invasions in 1855 and 1856, the support of the Dred Scott decision and the Lecompton fraud in 1857, the repudiation of Douglas's Freeport heresy in 1858, to the demand for a congressional slave code for the territories and the recognition of the doctrine of property in slaves. These last two points they had distinctly formulated in the first session of the 36th Congress. On January 18, 1860, Senator Brown of Mississippi introduced into the Senate two resolutions, one asserting the nationality of slavery the other that, when necessary, Congress should pass laws for its protection in the territories. On February 2nd, Jefferson Davis introduced another series of resolutions intended to serve as a basis for the National Democratic Platform, the central points of which were that the right to take and hold slaves in the territories could neither be impaired nor annulled, and that it was the duty of Congress to supply any deficiency of laws for its protection. Perhaps even more significant than these formulated doctrines was the pro-slavery spirit manifested in the congressional debates. Two months were wasted in a parliamentary struggle to prevent the election of the Republican John Sherman as Speaker of the House of Representatives, because the Southern members charged that he had recommended an abolition book, during which time the most sensational and violent threats of disunion were made in both the House and the Senate, containing repeated declarations that they would never submit to the inauguration of a black Republican president. When the National Democratic Convention met at Charleston on April 23, 1860, there at once became evident the singular condition that the delegates from the free states were united and enthusiastic in their determination to secure the nomination of Douglas as the Democratic candidate for president while the delegates from the slave states were equally united and determined upon forcing the acceptance of an extreme pro-slavery platform. All expectations of a compromise, all hope of coming to an understanding by juggling omissions or evasions in the declaration of party principles, were quickly dissipated. The platform committee, after three days and nights of fruitless effort, presented two antagonistic reports. The majority report declared that neither Congress nor a territorial legislature could abolish or prohibit slavery in the territories, and that it was the duty of the federal government to protect it when necessary. To this doctrine the northern members could not consent, but they were willing to adopt the ambiguous declaration that property rights in slaves were judicial in their character, and that they would abide the decisions of the Supreme Court on such questions. The usual expedient of recommitting both reports brought no relief from the deadlock. A second majority and a second minority report exhibited the same irreconcilable divergence in slightly different language, and the words of mutual defiance exchanged in debating the first report rose to a parliamentary storm when the second came under discussion. On the seventh day the convention came to a vote and the northern delegates being in the majority, the minority report was substituted for that of the majority of the committee by 165 to 138 delegates. In other words, the Douglas platform was declared adopted. Upon this, the delegates of the cotton states, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, South Carolina, Florida, Texas, and Arkansas, withdrew from the convention. It soon appeared, however, that the Douglas delegates had achieved only a barren victory. Their majority could indeed adopt a platform, but under the acknowledged two-thirds rule which governs democratic national conventions, they had not sufficient votes to nominate their candidate. 
During the fifty-seven ballots taken, the Douglas men could muster only one hundred and fifty-two and one-half votes of the two hundred and two necessary to a choice, and to prevent mere slow disintegration, the convention adjourned on the tenth day under a resolution to reassemble in Baltimore on June eighteenth. Nothing was gained, however, by the delay. In the interim, Jefferson Davis and nineteen other Southern leaders published an address commending the withdrawal of the Cotton State delegates, and in a Senate debate Davis laid down the plain proposition, We want nothing more than a simple declaration that Negro slaves are property, and we want the recognition of the obligation of the Federal Government to protect that property like all other. Upon the reassembling of the Charleston Convention at Baltimore, it underwent a second disruption on the fifth day. The northern wing nominated Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois and the southern wing John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky as their respective candidates for president. In the meanwhile, also regular and irregular delegates from some twenty-two states representing fragments of the old Whig party had convened in Baltimore on May ninth and nominated John Bell of Tennessee as their candidate for president upon a platform ignoring the slave issue and declaring they would recognize no other political principle than the constitution of the country, the union of the states, and the enforcement of the laws. In the long contest between slavery extension and slavery restriction, which was now approaching its culmination, the growing demands and increasing bitterness of the pro-slavery party had served in an equal degree to intensify the feelings and stimulate the efforts of the Republican Party and remembering the encouraging opposition strength which the united vote of fremont and fillmore had shown in eighteen fifty six they felt encouraged to hope for possible success in eighteen sixty since the fillmore party had practically disappeared throughout the free states when therefore the charleston convention was rent asunder and adjourned on may tenth without making a nomination the possibility of republican victory seemed to have risen to probability such a feeling inspired the eager enthusiasm of the delegates to the Republican National Convention, which met according to appointment at Chicago on May 16th. A large temporary wooden building christened the Wigwam had been erected in which to hold its sessions, and it was estimated that 10,000 persons were assembled in it to witness the proceedings. William H. Seward of New York was recognized as the leading candidate, but Chase of Ohio, Cameron of Pennsylvania, Bates of Missouri and several prominent Republicans from other states were known to have active and zealous followers. The name of Abraham Lincoln had also often been mentioned during his growing fame, and fully a year before an ardent Republican editor of Illinois had requested permission to announce him in his newspaper. Lincoln, however, discouraged such action at that time, answering him, As to the other matter you kindly mention, I must in candor say I do not think myself fit for the presidency. I certainly am flattered and gratified that some partial friends think of me in that connection, but I really think it best for our cause that no concerted effort such as you suggest should be made. He had given an equally positive answer to an eager Ohio friend in the preceding July, but about Christmas 1859 an influential caucus of his strongest Illinois adherents made a personal request that he would permit them to use his name, and he gave his consent not so much in any hope of becoming the nominee for president as in possibly reaching the second place on the ticket, or at least of making such a showing of strength before the convention as would aid him in his future senatorial ambition at home, or perhaps carry him into the cabinet of the Republican president should one succeed. He had not been eager to enter the lists, but once having agreed to do so, it was but natural that he should manifest a becoming interest, subject, however, now as always, to his inflexible rule of fair dealing and honorable faith to all his party friends. I do not understand Trumbull and myself to be rivals, he wrote December ninth, 1859. You know I am pledged not to enter a struggle with him for the seat in the Senate now occupied by him, and yet I would rather have a full term in the Senate than in the Presidency. And on February ninth, he wrote to the same Illinois friend, I am not in a position where it would hurt much for me not to be nominated on the national ticket, but I am where it would hurt some for me not to get the Illinois delegates. What I expected when I wrote the letters to Messrs. Dahl and others is now happening. Your discomfited assailants are most bitter against me, and they will for revenge upon me 
lay to the Bates Egg in the south, and to the Seward Egg in the north, and go far towards squeezing me out of the middle with nothing. Can you not help me a little in this matter in your end of the vineyard? It turned out that the delegates whom the Illinois State Convention sent to the National Convention at Chicago were men not only of exceptional standing and ability, but filled with the warmest zeal for Mr. Lincoln's success. and They were able at once to impress upon delegates from other states his sterling personal worth and fitness, and his superior availability. It needed but little political arithmetic to work out the sum of existing political chances. It was almost self-evident that in the coming November election victory or defeat would hang upon the result in the four pivotal states of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Indiana, and Illinois. It was quite certain that no Republican candidate could carry a single one of the fifteen slave states, and equally sure that Breckinridge, on his extreme pro-slavery platform, could not carry a single one of the eighteen free states. But there was a chance that one or more of these four pivotal free states might cast its vote for Douglas and popular sovereignty. A candidate was needed, therefore, who could successfully cope with Douglas and the Douglas theory, and this ability had been convincingly demonstrated by Lincoln. As a mere personal choice, a majority of the convention would have preferred Seward, but in the four pivotal states there were many voters who believed Seward's anti-slavery views to be too radical. They shrank apprehensively from the phrase in one of his speeches that there is a higher law than the Constitution, these pivotal states all lay adjoining slave states, and their public opinion was infected with something of the undefined dread of abolitionism. When the delegates of the pivotal states were interviewed, they frankly confessed that they could not carry their states for Seward, and that would mean certain defeat if he were the nominee for president. For their voters Lincoln stood on more acceptable ground. His speeches had been more conservative, his local influence in his own state of Illinois was also a factor not to be idly thrown away. Plain practical reasoning of this character found ready acceptance among the delegates to the convention. Their eagerness for the success of the cause largely overbalanced their personal preferences for favorite aspirants. When the convention met, the fresh, hearty hopefulness of its members was a most inspiring reflection of the public opinion in the states that sent them. They went at their work with an earnestness which was an encouraging premonition of success, and they felt a gratifying support in the presence of the ten thousand spectators who looked on at their work. Few conventions have ever been pervaded by such a depth of feeling or exhibited such a reserve of latent enthusiasm. The cheers that greeted the entrance of popular favorites and the short speeches on preliminary business ran and rolled through the great audience in successive moving waves of sound that were echoed and re-echoed from side to side in the vast building. Not alone the delegates on the central platform, but in the multitude of spectators as well, felt they were playing a part in a great historical event. The temporary and afterward the permanent organization was finished on the first day, with somewhat less than usual of the wordy and tantalizing small talk which these routine proceedings always call forth. On the second day the platform committee submitted its work, embodying the carefully considered and skillfully framed body of doctrines of which the Republican Party, made up only four years before from such previously heterogeneous and antagonistic political elements, was now able to find common and durable ground of agreement. Around its central tenet, which denied the authority of Congress, of territorial legislature, or of any individuals to give legal existence to slavery in any territory of the United States, were grouped vigorous denunciations of the various steps and incidents of the pro-slavery reaction and its prospective demands, while its positive recommendations embraced the immediate admission of Kansas, free homesteads to actual settlers, river and harbor improvements of national character, a railroad to the Pacific Ocean, and the maintenance of existing naturalization laws. The platform was about to be adopted without objection when a flurry of discussion arose over an amendment proposed by Mr. Giddings of Ohio to incorporate in it the phrase of the Declaration of Independence, which declares the right of all men to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Impatience was at once manifested lest any change should produce endless delay and dispute. 
I believe in the Ten Commandments, commented a member, but I do not want them in a political platform, and the proposition was voted down. Upon this the old anti-slavery veteran felt himself aggrieved, and taking up his hat, marched out of the convention. In the course of an hour's desultory discussion, however, a member, with stirring oratorical emphasis, asked whether the convention was prepared to go upon record before the country as voting down the words of the Declaration of Independence, whether the men of 1860 on the free prairies of the West quailed before repeating the words enunciated by the men in 76 at Philadelphia. In an impulse of patriotic reaction, the amendment was incorporated into the platform, and Mr. Giddings was brought back by his friends, his face beaming with triumph, and the stormy acclaim of the audience manifested the deep feeling which the incident evoked. On the third day it was certain that balloting would begin, and crowds hurried to the wigwam in a fever of curiosity. Having grown restless at the indispensable routine preliminaries, when Mr. Everts nominated William H. Seward of New York for president, they greeted his name with a perfect storm of applause. Then Mr. Judd nominated Abraham Lincoln of Illinois, and in the tremendous cheering that broke from the throats of his admirers and followers, the former demonstration dwindled to comparative feebleness. Again and again these contests of lungs and enthusiasm were repeated, as the choice of New York was seconded by Michigan, and that of Illinois by Indiana. When other names had been duly presented, the cheering at length subsided, and the chairman announced that balloting would begin. Many spectators had provided themselves with tally lists, and when the first roll call was completed, were able at once to perceive the drift of popular preference. Cameron, Chase, Bates, McLean, Dayton, and Colomer were endorsed by the substantial votes of their own states. But two names stood out in marked superiority. Seward, who had received 173 and one-half votes, and Lincoln, 102. The New York delegation was so thoroughly persuaded of the final success of their candidate that they did not comprehend the significance of this first ballot. Had they reflected that their delegation alone had contributed seventy votes to Seward's total, they would have understood that outside of the Empire State, upon this first showing, Lincoln held their favorite almost an even race. As the second ballot progressed, their anxiety visibly increased. They watched with eagerness as the complimentary votes first cast for state favorites were transferred now to one, now to the other of the recognized leaders in the contest, and their hopes sank when the result of the second ballot was announced. Seward, 184 and one-half, Lincoln, 181, and a volume of applause, which was with difficulty checked by the chairman, shook the wigwam at this announcement. Then followed a short interval of active caucusing in the various delegations, while excited men went about rapidly interchanging questions, solicitations, and messages between delegations from different states. Neither candidate had yet received a majority of all the votes cast, and the third ballot was begun amid a deep, almost painful suspense, delegates and spectators alike recording each announcement of votes on their tally sheets with nervous fingers. But the doubt was of short duration before the secretaries made the official announcement, the totals had been figured up. Lincoln, 231 and one-half. Seward, 180. Counting the scattering votes, 465 ballots had been cast, and 233 were necessary to a choice. Seward had lost four and one-half. Lincoln had gained fifty and one-half, and only one and one-half votes more were needed to make a nomination. The wigwam suddenly became as still as a church, and everybody leaned forward to see whose voice would break the spell. Before the lapse of a minute, David K. Carter sprang upon his chair and reported a change of four Ohio votes from Chase to Lincoln. Then a teller shouted a name toward the skylight, and the boom of cannon from the roof of the wigwam announced the nomination and started the cheering of the overjoyed Illinoisians down the long Chicago streets while in the wigwam delegation after delegation changed its vote to the victor amid a tumult of hurrahs. When quiet was somewhat restored, Mr. Everts, speaking for New York and for Seward, moved to make the nomination unanimous, 
and Mr. Browning gracefully returned the thanks of Illinois for the honor the convention had conferred upon the state. In the afternoon the convention completed its work by nominating Hannibal Hamlin of Maine for vice president, and as the delegates sped homeward in the night trains, they witnessed in the bonfires and cheering crowds of the stations that a memorable presidential campaign was already begun. End of chapter 10「Decatur, Lincoln Resolution, John Hanks and the Lincoln Rails, the Rail Splitter Candidate, the Wide Awakes, Douglas's Southern Tour, Jefferson Davis's Address, Fusion, Lincoln at the State House, the Election Result. The nomination of Lincoln at Chicago completed the preparations of the different parties of the country for the presidential contest of 1860, and presented the unusual occurrence of an appeal to the voters of the several states by four district political organizations. In the order of popular strength with which they afterward developed, they were 1. The Republican Party, whose platform declared in substance that slavery was wrong and that its further extension should be prohibited by Congress. Its candidates were Abraham Lincoln of Illinois for President and Hannibal Hamlin of Maine for Vice President. 2. The Douglas Wing of the Democratic Party, which declared indifference whether slavery were right or wrong, extended or prohibited, and proposed to permit the people of a territory to decide whether they would prevent or establish it. Its candidates were Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois for President and Herschel V. Johnson of Georgia for Vice President. C. The Buchanan Wing of the Democratic Party, which declared that slavery was right and beneficial, and whose policy was to extend the institution and create new slave states. Its candidates were John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky for President and Joseph Lane of Oregon for vice president. 4. The Constitutional Union Party, which professed to ignore the question of slavery and declared it would recognize no political principles other than the Constitution of the country, the Union of the States, and the enforcement of the laws. Its candidates were John Bell of Tennessee for president and Edward Everett of Massachusetts for vice president. In the array of these opposing candidates and their platforms, it could be easily calculated from the very beginning that neither Lincoln nor Douglas had any chance to carry a slave state, nor Breckinridge nor Bell to carry a free state, and that neither Douglas in the free states nor Bell in either section could obtain electoral votes enough to succeed. Therefore, but two alternatives seemed probable. Either Lincoln would be chosen by electoral votes, or, upon his failure to obtain a sufficient number, the election would be thrown into the House of Representatives, in which case the course of combination, chance, or intrigue could not be foretold. The political situation and its possible results thus involved a degree of uncertainty sufficient to hold out a contingent hope to all the candidates and to inspire the followers of each to active exertion. This hope and inspiration added to the hot temper which the long discussion of antagonistic principles had engendered, served to infuse into the campaign enthusiasm, earnestness, and even bitterness according to local conditions in the different sections. In campaign enthusiasm, the Republican Party easily took the lead. About a week before his nomination, Mr. Lincoln had been present at the Illinois State Convention at Decatur in Coles County, 
not far from the old Lincoln home, when, at a given signal, there marched into the convention old John Hanks, one of his boyhood companions, and another pioneer, who bore on their shoulders two long fence-rails decorated with a banner inscribed, Two Rails from a Lot Made by Abraham Lincoln and John Hanks in the Sagamon Bottom in the year 1830. They were greeted with a tremendous shout of applause from the whole convention, succeeded by a united call for Lincoln, who sat on the platform. The tumult would not subside until he rose to speak, when he said, "'Gentlemen, I suppose you want to know something about those things,' pointing to old John and the rails. "'Well, the truth is, John Hanks and I did make rails in the Sagamon Bottom. I don't know whether we made those rails or not. Fact is, I don't think they are a credit to the makers, laughing as he spoke. But I do know this. I made rails then, and I think I could make better ones than these now. Still louder cheering followed this short but effective reply. But the convention was roused to its full warmth of enthusiasm when a resolution was immediately and unanimously adopted, declaring that Abraham Lincoln is the first choice of the Republican Party of Illinois for the presidency and directing the delegates to the Chicago Convention to use all honorable means to secure his nomination and to cast the vote of the state as a unit for him. It was this resolution which the Illinois delegation had so successfully carried out at Chicago, and, besides, they had carried with them the two fence rails and set them up in state at the Lincoln headquarters at their hotel, where enthusiastic lady friends gaily trimmed them with flowers and ribbons and lighted them up with tapers. These slight preliminaries, duly embellished in the newspapers, gave the key to the Republican campaign, which designated Lincoln as the rail-splitter candidate, and added to his common Illinois sobriquet of Old Honest Abe, furnished both country and city campaign orators a powerfully sympathetic appeal to the rural and laboring element of the United States. When these homely but picturesque appellations were fortified by the copious pamphlet and newspaper biographies in which people read the story of his humble beginnings and how he had risen, by dint of simple, earnest work and native genius, through privation and difficulty, first to fame and leadership in his state, and now to fame and leadership in the nation, they grew quickly into symbols of a faith and trust destined to play no small part in a political revolution of which the people at large were not as yet even dreaming. Another feature of the campaign also quickly developed itself. On the preceding 5th of March, one of Mr. Lincoln's New England speeches had been made at Hartford, Connecticut, and at its close he was escorted to his hotel by a procession of the local Republican Club, at the head of which marched a few of its members bearing torches and wearing caps and capes of glazed oilcloth, the primary purpose of which was to shield their clothes from the dripping oil of their torches. Both the simplicity and the efficiency of the uniform caught the popular eye, as did also the name, Wide Awakes, applied to them by the Hartford Current. The example found quick imitation in Hartford and adjoining towns, and when Mr. Lincoln was made candidate for president, every city, town, and nearly every village in the North, within a brief space, had its organized wide-awake club with their half-military uniform and drill, and these clubs were often, later in the campaign, gathered into imposing torchlight processions miles in length on occasions of important party meetings and speech-making. It was the revived spirit of the Harrison campaign of twenty years before, but now, shorn of its fun and frolic, it was strengthened by the power of organization and the tremendous impetus of earnest devotion to a high principle. It was a noteworthy feature of the campaign that the letters of acceptance of all the candidates either in distinct words or unmistakable implication, declared devotion to the Union, while at the same time the adherents of each were charging disunion sentiments and intentions upon the other three parties. Douglas himself made a tour of speech-making 
through the southern states in which while denouncing the political views of both lincoln and breckinridge he nevertheless openly declared in response to direct questions that no grievance could justify disunion and that he was ready to put the hemp around the neck and hang any man who would raise the arm of resistance to the constituted authorities of the country during the early part of the campaign the more extreme southern fire-eaters abated somewhat of their violent menaces of disunion between the charleston and the baltimore democratic conventions an address published by jefferson davis and other prominent leaders had explained that the seventeen democratic states which had voted at charleston for the succeeders platform could if united with pennsylvania alone elect the democratic nominees against all opposition this hope doubtless floated before their eyes like a will-o'-the-wisp until the october elections dispelled all possibility of securing pennsylvania for breckinridge from that time forward there began a renewal of disunion threats which by their constant increase throughout the south prepared the public mind of that section for the coming succession as the chances of republican success gradually grew stronger an undercurrent of combination developed itself among those politicians of the three opposing parties more devoted to patronage than principle to bring about the fusion of lincoln's opponents on some agreed ratio of a division of the spoils such a combination made considerable progress in the three northern states of new york pennsylvania and new jersey it appears to have been engineered mainly by the douglas faction though it must be said to his credit against the open and earnest protest of douglas himself but the thrifty plotters cared little for his disapproval by the secret manipulations of conventions and committees a fusion electoral ticket was formed in new york made up of adherents of the three different factions in the following proportion douglas eighteen bell ten breckinridge seven and the whole opposition vote of the state of new york was cast for this fusion ticket the same tactics were pursued in pennsylvania where however the agreement was not so openly avowed one-third of the pennsylvania fusion electoral candidates were pledged to douglas the division of the remaining two-thirds between bell and breckinridge was not made public the bulk of the pennsylvania opposition vote was cast for this fusion ticket but a respectable percentage refused to be bargained away and voted directly for douglas or bell in new jersey a definite agreement was reached by the managers and an electoral ticket formed composed of two adherents of bell two of breckinridge and three of douglas and in this state a practical result was effected by the movement a fraction of the douglas voters formed a straight electoral ticket adopting the three douglas candidates on the fusion ticket and by this action these three douglas electors received a majority vote in new jersey on the whole however the fusion movement proved ineffectual to defeat lincoln and indeed it would not have done so even had the fusion electoral tickets deceived a majority in all three of the above-named states the personal habits and surroundings of mr lincoln were varied somewhat though but slightly during the whole of this election summer naturally he withdrew at once from active work leaving his law office and his whole law business to his partner william h herndon while his friends installed him in the governor's room in the state house at springfield which was not otherwise needed during the absence of the legislature here he spent the time during the usual business hours of the day attended only by his private secretary mr nicolay friends and strangers alike were thus able to visit him freely without ceremony and they availed themselves largely of the opportunity few if any went away without being favorably impressed by his hearty western greeting and the frank sincerity of his manner and conversation in which naturally all subjects of controversy 
were courteously and instinctively avoided by both the candidate and his visitors. By none was this free, neighborly intercourse enjoyed more than by the old-time settlers of Sangamon and the adjoining counties, who came to revive the incidents and memories of pioneer days with one who could give them such thorough and appreciative interest and sympathy. He employed no literary bureau, wrote no public letters, made no set or impromptu speeches, except that once or twice during great political meetings at Springfield he uttered a few words of greeting and thanks to passing street processions. All these devices of propagandism he left to the leaders and committees of his adherents in their several states. Even the strictly confidential letters in which he indicated his advice on points in the progress of the campaign did not exceed a dozen in number, and when politicians came to interview him at Springfield, he received them in the privacy of his own home, and generally their presence created little or no public notice. Cautious politician as he was, he did not permit himself to indulge in any overconfidence, but then, as always before, showed unusual skill in estimating political chances. Thus he wrote, about a week after the Chicago Convention, So far as I can learn, the nominations start well everywhere, and, if they get no back set, it would seem as if they are going through. Again on July 4, long before this, you have learned who is nominated at Chicago. We know not what a day may bring forth, but today it looks as if the Chicago ticket will be elected. And on September 22, to a friend in Oregon, no one on this side of the mountains pretends that any ticket can be elected by the people unless it be ours. Hence, great efforts to combine against us are being made, which, however, as yet have not had much success. Besides what we see in the newspapers, I have a good deal of private correspondence, and, without giving details, I will only say it all looks very favorable to our success. His judgment was abundantly verified at the presidential election which occurred upon November 6, 1860. Lincoln electors were chosen in every one of the free states except New Jersey, where, as has already been stated, three Douglas electors received majorities because their names were on both the Fusion ticket and the straight Douglas ticket, while the other four Republican electors in that state succeeded. Of the slave states, eleven chose Breckinridge electors, three of them Bell electors, and one of them Missouri Douglas electors. As provided by law, the electors met in their several states on December 5th to officially cast their votes, and on February 13, 1861, Congress in joint session of the two houses made the official count as follows. For Lincoln, 180 for Breckinridge, 72, for Bell, 39, and for Douglas, 12, giving Lincoln a clear majority of 57 in the whole electoral college. Thereupon, Breckinridge, who presided over the joint session, officially declared that Abraham Lincoln was duly elected President of the United States for four years, beginning March 4, 1861. End of chapter 11. Recording by Lana Jordan. Chapter 12 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alana Jordan. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 12. Lincoln's Cabinet Program. Members from the South. Questions and Answers. Correspondence with Stevens. Action of Congress. Peace Convention. Preparation of the Inaugural. Lincoln's Farewell Address, The Journey to Washington, Lincoln's Midnight Journey. During the long presidential campaign of 1860, 
between the Chicago Convention in the middle of May and the election at the beginning of November, Mr. Lincoln, relieved from all other duties, had watched political developments with very close attention, not merely to discern the progress of his own chances, but doubtless also, much more seriously, to deliberate upon the future in case he should be elected. But it was only when, on the night of November 6, he sat in the telegraph office at Springfield, from which all but himself and the operators were excluded, and read the telegrams as they fell from the wires, that little by little the accumulating Republic majorities reported from all directions convinced him of the certainty of his success, and with that conviction there fell upon him the overwhelming, almost crushing weight of his coming duties and responsibilities. He afterward related that in that supreme hour, grappling resolutely with the mighty problem before him, he practically completed the first essential act of his administration, the selection of his future cabinet, the choice of men who were to aid him. From what afterward occurred, we may easily infer the general principle which guided his choice. One of his strongest characteristics, as his speeches abundantly show, was his belief in the power of public opinion and his respect for the popular will. That was to be found and to be wielded by the leaders of public sentiment. In the present instance, there were no truer representatives of that will than the men who had been prominently supported by the delegates to the Chicago Convention for the presidential nominations. Of these, he would take at least three, perhaps four, to compose one half of his cabinet. In selecting Seward, Chase, Bates, and Cameron, he could also satisfy two other points of the representative principle, the claims of locality and the elements of former party divisions now joined in the newly organized Republican Party. With Seward from New York, Cameron from Pennsylvania, Chase from Ohio, and himself from Illinois, the four leading free states each had a representative. With Bates from Missouri, the South could not complain of being wholly excluded from the cabinet. New England was properly represented by Vice President Hamlin. When, after the inauguration, Smith from Indiana, Wells from Connecticut, and Blair from Maryland were added to make up the seven cabinet members, the local distribution between East and West, North and South, was in no wise disturbed. It was indeed complained that in this arrangement there were four former Democrats and only three former Whigs, to which Lincoln laughingly replied that he had been a Whig and would be there to make the number even. It was not likely that this exact list was in Lincoln's mind on the night of the November election, but only the principal names in it, and much delay and some friction occurred before its completion. The post of Secretary of State was offered to Seward on December 8. Rumors have got into the newspapers, wrote Lincoln, to the effect that the department named above would be tendered you as a compliment, and with the expectation that you would decline it. I beg you to be assured that I have said nothing to justify these rumors. On the contrary, it has been my purpose from the day of the nomination at Chicago to assign you, by your leave, this place in the administration. Seward asked for a few days for reflection, then cordially accepted. Bates was tendered the attorney generalship on December 15 while making a personal visit to Springfield. Word had been meanwhile sent to Smith that he would probably be included. The assignment of places to Chase and Cameron worked less smoothly. Lincoln wrote Cameron a note on January 3rd saying he would nominate him for either Secretary of the Treasury or Secretary of War. He had not yet decided which, and on the same day, in an interview with Chase, whom he had invited to Springfield, said to him, I have done with you 
what I would not perhaps have ventured to do with any other man in the country, sent for you to ask whether you will accept the appointment of Secretary of the Treasury without, however, being exactly prepared to offer it to you. They discussed the situation very fully, but without reaching a definite conclusion, agreeing to await the advice of friends. Meanwhile, the rumor that Cameron was going to go into the cabinet excited such hot opposition that Lincoln felt obliged to recall his tender in a confidential letter and asked him to write a public letter declining the place. Instead of doing this, Cameron fortified himself with recommendations from prominent Pennsylvanians and demonstrated that in his own state he had at least three advocates to one opponent. Pending the delay which this contest consumed, another cabinet complication found its solution. It had been warmly urged by conservatives that, in addition to Bates, another cabinet member should be taken from one of the southern states. The difficulty of doing this had been clearly foreshadowed by Mr. Lincoln in a little editorial which he wrote for the Springfield Journal on December 12. First, is it known that any such gentleman of character would accept a place in the cabinet? Second, if yea, on what terms does he surrender to Mr. Lincoln, or Mr. Lincoln to him, on the political differences between them, or do they enter upon the administration in open opposition to each other? It was very soon demonstrated that these differences were insurmountable. Through Mr. Seward, who was attending his senatorial duties at Washington, Mr. Lincoln tentatively offered a cabinet appointment successively to Gilmer of North Carolina, Hunt of Louisiana, and Scott of Virginia, no one of whom had the courage to accept. Toward the end of the recent canvass, and still more since the election, Mr. Lincoln had received urgent letters to make some public declaration to reassure and pacify the South, especially the cotton states, which were manifesting a constantly growing spirit of rebellion. Most of such letters remained unanswered, but in a number of strictly confidential replies he explained the reasons for his refusal. I appreciate your motive, he wrote October 23, when you suggest the propriety of my writing for the public something disclaiming all intention to interfere with slaves or slavery in the states, but, in my judgment, it would do no good. I have already done this many, many times, and it is in print, and open to all who will read. But those who will not read or heed what I have already publicly said would not read or heed a repetition of it. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one rose from the dead. To the letter of the Louisville Journal, he wrote, October 29, For the good men of the South, and I regard the majority of them as such, I have no objection to repeat seventy and seven times, but I have had bad men to deal with, both North and South, who are eager for something new upon which to base new misrepresentations, men who would like to frighten me, or at least to fix upon me the character of timidity and cowardice. Alexander H. Stevens of Georgia, who afterward became Confederate Vice President, made a strong speech against succession in that state on November 14, and Mr. Lincoln wrote him a few lines asking for a revised copy of it. In the brief correspondence which ensued, Mr. Lincoln again wrote him under date of December 22, I fully appreciate the present peril the country is in, and the weight of responsibility on me. Do the people of the South really entertain fears that a Republican administration would, directly or indirectly, interfere with the slaves or with them about the slaves? If they do, I wish to assure you, as once a friend, and still, I hope not an enemy, that there is no cause for such fears. The South will be in no more danger in this respect than it was in the days of Washington. I suppose, however, this does not meet the case. 
You think slavery is right and ought to be extended, while we think it is wrong and ought to be restricted. That, I suppose, is the rub. It certainly is the only substantial difference between us. So, also, replying a few days earlier in a long letter to Honorable John A. Gilmer of North Carolina, to whom, as already stated, he offered a cabinet appointment, he said, On the territorial question I am inflexible, as you see my position in the book. On that there is a difference between you and us, and it is the only substantial difference. You think slavery is right and ought to be extended. We think it is wrong and ought to be restricted. For this neither has any just occasion to be angry with the other. As to the state laws, mentioned in your sixth question, I really know very little of them. I have never read one. If any of them are in conflict with the fugitive slave cause, or any other part of the Constitution, I certainly shall be glad of their repeal. But I could hardly be justified, as a citizen of Illinois, or as President of the United States, to recommend the repeal of a statute of Vermont or South Carolina. Through his intimate correspondence with Mr. Seward and his personal friends in Congress, Mr. Lincoln was kept somewhat informed of the hostile temper of the Southern leaders, and that a tremendous pressure was being brought upon that body by timid conservatives and the commercial interests in the North to bring about some kind of compromise which would stay the progress of disunion, and on this point he sent an emphatic monition to Representative Washburn on December 13. Your long letter received. Prevent as far as possible any of our friends from demoralizing themselves and their cause by entertaining propositions for compromise of any sort on slavery extension. There is no possible compromise upon it but what puts us under again, and all your work to do over again. Whether it be a Missouri line or Eli Thayer's popular sovereignty, it is all the same. Let either be done, and immediately filibustering and extending slavery recommences. On that point, hold firm as a chain of steel. Between the day when a president is elected by popular vote and that on which he is officially inaugurated, there exists an interim of four long months during which he has no more direct power in the affairs of government than any private citizen. However anxiously Mr. Lincoln might watch the development of public events at Washington and in the cotton states, whatever appeals might come to him through interviews or correspondence, no positive action of any kind was within his power beyond an occasional word of advice or suggestion. The position of the Republican leaders in Congress was not much better. Until the actual succession of states and the departure of their representatives, they were in a minority in the Senate, while the so-called South Americans and anti lecompton Democrats held the balance of power in the House. The session was mainly consumed in excited, profitless discussion. Both the Senate and the House appointed compromise committees, which met and labored, but could find no common ground of agreement. A peace convention met and deliberated at Washington, with no practical result except to waste the powder for a salute of one hundred guns over a sham report to which nobody paid the least attention. Throughout this period, Mr. Lincoln was by no means idle. Besides the many difficulties he had to overcome in completing his cabinets, he devoted himself to writing his inaugural address. Withdrawing himself some hours each day from his ordinary receptions, he went to a quiet room on the second floor of the store, occupied by his brother-in-law, on the south side of the public square in Springfield, where he could think and write in undisturbed privacy. When, after abundant reflection and revision, he had finished the document, he placed it in the hands of Mr. William H. Bailhush, one of the editors of the Illinois State Journal, who locked himself and a single compositor into the composing room of the journal. Here, in Mr. Bailhock's presence, it was set up, proof taken and read, and a dozen copies printed, after which the types were again immediately distributed. 
the alert newspaper correspondents in Springfield, who saw Lincoln every day as usual, did not obtain the slightest hint of what was going on. Having completed his arrangements, Mr. Lincoln started on his journey to Washington on February 11, 1861, on a special train, accompanied by Mrs. Lincoln and their three children, his two private secretaries, and a suite of about a dozen personal friends. Mr. Seward had suggested that in view of the feverish condition of public affairs, he should come a week earlier. But Mr. Lincoln allowed himself only time enough comfortably to fill the appointments he had made to visit the capitals and principal cities of the states on his route, in accordance with nonpartisan invitations from their legislatures and mayors which he had accepted. Standing on the front platform of the car, as the conductor was about to pull the bell rope, Mr. Lincoln made the following brief and pathetic address of farewell to his friends and neighbors of Springfield, the last time his voice was ever to be heard in the city which had been his home for so many years. My friends, not one, not in my situation, can appreciate my feeling of sadness at this parting. To this place and the kindness of these people I owe everything. Here I have lived a quarter of a century, have passed from a young to an old man. Here my children have been born, and one is buried. I now leave, not knowing when or whether ever I may return, with a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington, without the assistance of that divine being who ever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance I cannot fail. Trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you, and be everywhere for good. Let us confidently hope that all will yet be well. To his care, commending you, as I hope in your prayers you will commend me, I bid you an affectionate farewell. It was the beginning of a memorable journey. On the whole route from Springfield to Washington, at almost every station, even the smallest, was gathered a crowd of people in hope to catch a glimpse of the face of the president-elect, or, at least, to see the flying train. At the larger stopping places these gatherings were swelled to thousands, and in the great cities into almost unimaginable assemblages. Everywhere there were vociferous calls for Mr. Lincoln and, if he showed himself, for a speech. Whenever there were sufficient time, he would step to the rear platform of the car and bow his acknowledgments as the train was moving away, and sometimes utter a few words of thanks and greeting. At the capitals of Indiana, Ohio, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, as also in the cities of Cincinnati, Cleveland, Buffalo, New York, and Philadelphia, a halt was made for one or two days, and a program was carried out of a formal visit and brief address to each house of the legislature, street processions, large receptions in the evening, and other similar ceremonies. And in each of them there was an unprecedented outpouring of the people to take advantage of every opportunity to see and to hear the future chief magistrate of the Union. Party foes, as well as party friends, made up these expectant crowds. The public suspense was at a degree of tension which rendered every eye and ear eager to catch even the slightest indication of the thoughts or intentions of the man who was to be the official guide of the nation in a crisis the course and end of which even the wisest dared not predict. In the twenty or thirty brief addresses delivered by Mr. Lincoln on this journey, he observed the utmost caution of utterance and reticence of declaration. Yet the shades of meaning in his carefully chosen sentences were enough to show how alive he was to the trials and dangers confronting his administration, and to inspire hope and confidence in his judgment. He repeated that he regarded the public demonstrations not as belonging to himself, but to the high office with which the people had clothed him, and that if he failed, they could four years later substitute a better man in his place. And in his very first address, at Indianapolis, he thus emphasized their reciprocal duties. 
if the union of these states and the liberties of this people shall be lost it is but little to any one man of fifty-two years of age but a great deal to the thirty millions of people who inhabit these united states and to their posterity in all coming time it is your business to rise up and preserve the union and liberty for yourselves and not for me i appeal to you again to constantly bear in mind that not with politicians not with presidents not with office seekers but with you is the question shall the union and shall the liberties of this country be preserved to the latest generations many salient and interesting quotations could be made from his other addresses but a comparatively few sentences will be sufficient to enable the reader to infer what was likely to be his ultimate conclusion and action in his second speech at indianapolis he asked the question on what rightful principle may a state being not more than one-fiftieth part of the nation in soil and population break up the nation and then coerce a proportionally larger subdivision of itself in the most arbitrary way at steubenville if the majority should not rule who would be the judge where is such judge to be found we should all be bound by the majority of the american people if not then the minority must control would that be right at trenton i shall do all that may be in my power to promote a peaceful settlement of all our difficulties the man does not live who is more devoted to peace than i am none who would do more to preserve it but it may be necessary to put the foot down firmly at harrisburg while i am exceedingly gratified to see the manifestation upon your streets of your military force here and exceedingly gratified at your promise to use that force upon a proper emergency while i make these acknowledgments i desire to repeat in order to preclude any possible misconstruction that i do most sincerely hope that we shall have no use for them that it will never become their duty to shed blood and most especially never to shed fraternal blood i promise that so far as i may have wisdom to direct if so painful a result shall in any wise be brought about it shall be through no fault of mine while mr lincoln was yet at philadelphia he was met by mr frederick w seward son of senator seward who brought him an important communication from his father and general scott at washington about the beginning of the year serious apprehension had been felt lest the sudden uprising of the secessionists in virginia and maryland might endeavor to gain possession of the national capital an investigation by a committee of congress found no active military preparation to exist for such a purpose but considerable traces of disaffection and local conspiracy in baltimore and to guard against such an outbreak President Buchanan had permitted his Secretary of War, Mr. Holt, to call General Scott to Washington and charge him with the safety of the city, not only at that moment, but also during the counting of the presidential returns in February and the coming inauguration of Mr. Lincoln. For this purpose, General Scott had concentrated at Washington a few companies from the regular army and also, in addition, had organized and armed about 900 men of the militia of the District of Columbia. In connection with these precautions, Colonel Stone, who commanded these forces, had kept himself informed about the disaffection in Baltimore through the agency of the New York Police Department. The communication brought by young Mr. Seward contained, besides notes from his father and General Scott, a short report from Colonel Stone, stating that there had arisen within the past few days imminent danger of violence to and the assassination of mr lincoln in his passage through baltimore should the time of that passage be known all risk he suggested might easily be avoided by a change in the traveling arrangements which would bring mr lincoln and a portion of his party through baltimore by a night train without previous notice the seriousness of this information was doubled by the fact 
that Mr. Lincoln had, that same day, held an interview with a prominent Chicago detective who had been for some weeks employed by the President of Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railway to investigate the danger to their property and trains from the Baltimore secessionists. The investigations of this detective, a Mr. Pinkerton, had been carried on without the knowledge of the New York detective, and he reported not identical but almost similar conditions of insurrectionary feeling and danger, and recommended the same precaution. Mr. Lincoln very earnestly debated the situation with his intimate personal friend, Honorable N. B. Judd of Chicago, perhaps the most active and influential member of his suite, who advised him to proceed to Washington that same evening on the eleven o'clock train. I cannot go tonight, replied Mr. Lincoln. I have promised to raise the flag over Independence Hall tomorrow morning and to visit the legislature at Harrisburg. Beyond that, I have no engagements. The railroad schedule by which Mr. Lincoln had hitherto been traveling included a direct trip from Harrisburg through Baltimore to Washington on Saturday, February 23rd. When the Harrisburg ceremonies had been concluded on the afternoon of the 22nd, the danger and the proposed change of program were for the first time fully laid before a confidential meeting of the prominent members of Mr. Lincoln's suite. Reasons were strongly urged, both for and against the plan, but Mr. Lincoln finally decided and explained that while he himself was not afraid he would be assassinated, nevertheless, since the possibility of danger had been made known from two entirely independent sources and officially communicated to him by his future Prime Minister and the General of the American Armies, he was no longer at liberty to disregard it that it was not the question of his private life, but the regular and orderly transmission of the authority of the government of the United States in the face of threatened revolution, which he had no right to put in the slightest jeopardy. He would, therefore, carry out the plan, the full details of which had been arranged with the railroad officials. Accordingly, that same evening, he, with a single companion, Colonel W. H. Lamont, took a car from Harrisburg back to Pennsylvania, at which place, about midnight, they boarded the through train from New York to Washington, and without recognition or any untoward incident, passed quietly through Baltimore and reached the capital about daylight on the morning of February 23rd, where they were met by Mr. Seward and Representative Washburn of Illinois and conducted to Willard's Hotel. When Mr. Lincoln's departure from Harrisburg became known, a reckless newspaper correspondent telegraphed to New York the ridiculous invention that he traveled disguised in a Scotch cap and long military cloak. There was not word of truth in the absurd statement. Mr. Lincoln's family and suite proceeded to Washington by the originally arranged train and schedule and witnessed great crowds in the streets of Baltimore but encountered neither turbulence nor incivility of any kind. There was now, of course, no occasion for any, since the telegraph had definitely announced that the president-elect was already in Washington. End of chapter 12. Recording by Lana Jordan. Chapter 13 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 13 The Secession Movement. South Carolina's secession, Buchanan's neglect, disloyal cabinet members, Washington's central cabal, Anderson's transfer to Sumter, Star of the West, Montgomery Rebellion, Davis and Stevens, Cornerstone Theory, Lincoln inaugurated, his inaugural address, Lincoln's cabinet, the question of Sumter, Seward's memorandum, 
Lincoln's Answer, Bombardment of Sumter, Anderson's Capitulation. It is not the province of these chapters to relate in detail the course of the secession movement in the cotton states in the interim which elapsed between the election and inauguration of President Lincoln. Still less can space be given to analyze and set forth the lamentable failure of President Buchanan to employ the executive authority and power of the government to prevent it or even hinder its development by any vigorous opposition or adequate protest. The determination of South Carolina to secede was announced by the governor of that state a month before the presidential election and on the day before the election he sent the legislature of the state a revolutionary message to formally inaugurate it from that time forward the whole official machinery of the state not only led but forced the movement which culminated on december twentieth in the ordinance of secession by the south carolina convention this official revolution in South Carolina was quickly imitated by similar official revolutions ending in secession ordinances in the state of Mississippi on January 9, 1861, Florida, January 10th, Alabama, January 11th, Georgia, January 19th, Louisiana, January 26th, and by a still bolder usurpation in Texas culminating on February 1st. From the day of the presidential election, all these proceedings were known probably more fully to President Buchanan than to the general public, because many of the actors were his personal and party friends, while almost at their very beginning, he became aware that the three members of his cabinet were secretly or openly abetting and promoting them by their official influence and power. Instead of promptly dismissing these unfaithful servants, he retained one of them a month, and the others twice that period, and permitted them so far to influence his official conduct, that in his annual message to Congress, he announced the fallacious and paradoxical doctrine that though a state had no right to secede, the federal government had no right to coerce her to remain in the Union nor could he justify his non-action by the excuse that contumacious speeches and illegal resolves of parliamentary bodies might be tolerated under the American theory of free assemblage and free speech. Almost from the beginning of the secession movement, it was accompanied from time to time by overt acts, both of treason and war, notably by the occupation and seizure by military order and force of the seceding states, of twelve or fifteen harbor forts, one extensive navy yard, half a dozen arsenals, three mints, four important custom houses, three revenue cutters, and a variety of miscellaneous federal property, for all of which insults to the flag and infractions of the sovereignty of the United States, President Buchanan could recommend no more efficacious remedy or redress than to ask the voters of the country to reverse their decision given at the presidential election and to appoint a day of fasting and prayer on which to implore the Most High, quote, to remove from our hearts that false pride of opinion which would impel us to persevere in wrong for the sake of consistency, end quote nor must mention be omitted of the astounding phenomenon that encouraged by president buchanan's doctrine of non-coercion and purpose of non-action a central cabal of southern senators and representatives issued from washington on december fourteenth their public proclamation of the duty of secession their executive committee using one of the rooms of the capitol building itself as the headquarters of the conspiracy and rebellion they were appointed to lead and direct during the month of december while the active treason of cotton state officials and the fatal neglect of the federal executive were in their most damaging and demoralizing stages an officer of the united states army had the high courage and distinguished honor to give the ever-growing revolution its first effective check. Major Robert Anderson, though a Kentuckian by birth and allied by marriage to a Georgia family, was, late in November, placed in command of the federal forts in Charleston Harbor. 
and having repeatedly reported that his little garrison of sixty men was insufficient for the defense of fort moultrie and vainly asked for reinforcements which were not sent to him he suddenly and secretly on the night after christmas transferred his command from the insecure position of moultrie to the strong and unapproachable walls of fort sumter midway in the mouth of the charleston harbor where he could not be assailed by the raw charleston militia companies that had for weeks been threatening him with a storming assault in this stronghold surrounded on all sides by water he loyally held possession for the government and sovereignty of the united states the surprised and baffled rage of the south carolina rebels created a crisis at washington that resulted in the expulsion of the president's treacherous counselors and the reconstruction of mr buchanan's cabinet to unity and loyalty the new cabinet though unable to obtain president buchanan's consent to aggressive measures to re-establish the federal authority was nevertheless able to prevent further concessions to the insurrection and to effect a number of important defensive precautions among which was the already mentioned concentration of a small military force to protect the national capital meanwhile the governor of south carolina had begun the erection of batteries to isolate and besiege fort sumter and the first of these on a sand spit of morris island commanding the main ship channel by a few shots turned back on january ninth the merchant steamer star of the west in which general scott had attempted to send a reinforcement of two hundred recruits to major anderson battery building was continued with uninterrupted energy until a triangle of siege works was established on the projecting points of neighboring islands mounting a total of thirty guns and seventeen mortars manned and supported by a volunteer force of from four to six thousand men military preparation though not on so extensive or definite a scale was also carried on in the other revolted states and while mr lincoln was making his memorable journey from springfield to washington telegrams were printed in the newspapers from day to day showing that their delegates had met at montgomery alabama formed a provisional congress and adopted a constitution and government under the title of the confederate states of america of which they elected jefferson davis of mississippi president and alexander h stevens of georgia vice president it needs to be constantly borne in mind that the beginning of this vast movement was not a spontaneous revolution but a chronic conspiracy the secession of south carolina truly said one of the chief actors is not an event of a day it is not anything produced by mr lincoln's election or by the non-execution of the fugitive slave law it is a matter which has been gathering head for thirty years the central motive and dominating object of the revolution was frankly avowed by vice president stevens in a speech he made at savannah a few weeks after his inauguration Quote, the prevailing ideas entertained by him jefferson and most of the leading statesmen at the time of the formation of the old constitution were that the enslavement of the african was in violation of the laws of nature that it was wrong in principle, socially, morally, and politically. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical philosophical and moral truth End quote. in the week which elapsed between mr lincoln's arrival in washington and the day of inauguration he exchanged the customary visits of ceremony with president buchanan his cabinet the supreme court the two houses of congress and other dignitaries in his rooms at willard's hotel he also held consultations with leading republicans about the final composition of his cabinet and pressing questions of public policy 
careful preparations had been made for the inauguration and under the personal eye of general scott the military force in the city was ready instantly to suppress any attempt to disturb the peace or quiet of the day on march fourth the outgoing and incoming presidents rode side by side in a carriage from the executive mansion to the capitol and back escorted by an imposing military and civic procession and an immense throng of spectators heard the new executive read his inaugural address from the east portico of the capitol he stated frankly that a disruption of the federal union was being formidably attempted and discussed dispassionately the theory and illegality of secession he held that the union was perpetual that resolves and ordinances of disunion are legally void and announced that to the extent of his ability he would faithfully execute the laws of the union in all the states the power confided to him would be used to hold occupy and possess the property and places belonging to the government and to collect the duties and imposts but beyond what might be necessary for these objects there would be no invasion no using of force against or among the people anywhere where hostility to the united states in any interior locality should be so great and universal as to prevent competent resident citizens from holding the federal offices there would be no attempt to force obnoxious strangers among them for that object the mails unless repelled would continue to be furnished in all parts of the union and this course would be followed until current events and experience should show a change to be necessary to the south he made an earnest plea against the folly of this union and in favor of maintaining peace and fraternal good will declaring that their property peace and personal security were in no danger from a republican administration Quote, one section of our country believes slavery is right and ought to be extended he said while the other believes it is wrong and ought not to be extended that is the only substantial dispute physically speaking we cannot separate we cannot remove our respective sections from each other nor build an impassable wall between them a husband and wife may be divorced and go out of the presence and beyond the reach of the other but the different parts of our country cannot do this they cannot but remain face to face and intercourse either amicable or hostile must continue between them is it possible then to make that intercourse more advantageous or more satisfactory after separation than before can aliens make treaties easier than friends can make laws can treaties be more faithfully enforced between aliens than laws can among friends suppose you go to war you cannot fight always and when after much loss on both sides and no gain on either you cease fighting the identical old questions as to terms of intercourse are again upon you in your hands my dissatisfied fellow-countrymen and not in mine is the momentous issue of civil war the government will not assail you you can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors i am loath to close we are not enemies but friends we must not be enemies though passion may have strained it must not break our bonds of affection the mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature End quote but the peaceful policy here outlined was already more difficult to follow than mr lincoln was aware on the morning after inauguration the secretary of war brought to his notice freshly received letters from major anderson commanding fort sumter in charleston harbor announcing that in the course of a few weeks the provisions of the garrison would be exhausted and therefore an evacuation or surrender would become necessary unless the fort were relieved by supplies or reinforcements 
and this information was accompanied by the written opinions of the officers that to relieve the fort would require a well-appointed army of twenty thousand men the new president had appointed as his cabinet william h seward secretary of state salmon p chase secretary of the treasury simon cameron secretary of war gideon wells secretary of the navy caleb b smith secretary of the interior montgomery blair postmaster general and edward bates attorney general the president and his official advisers at once called into council the highest military and naval officers of the union to consider the new and pressing emergency revealed by the unexpected news from sumter the professional experts were divided in opinion relief by a force of twenty thousand men was clearly out of the question no such union army existed nor could one be created within the limit of time the officers of the navy thought that men and supplies might be thrown into the fort by swift-going vessels while on the other hand the army officers believed that such an expedition would surely be destroyed by the formidable batteries which the insurgents had erected to close the harbor in view of all of the conditions lieutenant general scott general-in-chief of the army recommended the evacuation of the fort as a military necessity president lincoln thereupon asked the several members of his cabinet the written question assuming it to be possible to now provision fort sumter under all the circumstances is it wise to attempt it only two members replied in the affirmative while the other five argued against the attempt holding that the country would recognize that the evacuation of the fort was not an indication of policy but a necessity created by the neglect of the old administration under this advice the president withheld his decision until he could gather further information meanwhile three commissioners had arrived from the provisional government at montgomery alabama under the instructions to endeavor to negotiate a de facto and de jure recognition of the independence of the confederate states they were promptly informed by mr seward that he could not receive them that he did not see in the confederate states a rightful and accomplished revolution and an independent nation and that he was not at liberty to recognize the commissioners as diplomatic agents or to hold correspondence with them failing in this direct application they made further efforts through mr justice campbell of the supreme court as a friendly intermediary who came to seward in the guise of a loyal official though his correspondence with jefferson davis soon revealed a treasonable intent in replying to campbell's earnest entreaties that peace should be maintained seward informed him confidentially that the military status at charleston would not be changed without notice to the governor of south carolina on march twenty ninth a cabinet meeting for the second time discussed the question of sumter four of the seven members now voted in favor of an attempt to supply the fort with provisions and the president signed a memorandum order to prepare certain ships for such an expedition under the command of captain g v fox so far mr lincoln's new duties as president of the united states had not in any wise put him at a disadvantage with his constitutional advisers upon the old question of slavery he was as well informed and had clearer convictions and purposes than either seward or chase and upon the newer question of secession and the immediate decision about fort sumter which it involved the members of his cabinet were like himself compelled to rely on the professional advice of experienced army and navy officers since these differed radically in their opinions the president's own powers of perception and logic were as capable of forming a correct decision as men who had been governors and senators he had reached at least a partial decision in the memorandum he gave fox to prepare ships for the sumter expedition it must therefore have been a great surprise to the president when on april first secretary of state seward handed him a memorandum 
setting forth a number of most extraordinary propositions. For a full enumeration of the items, the reader must carefully study the entire document, which is printed below in a footnote, but the principal points for which it had evidently been written and presented can be given in a few sentences. A month has elapsed, and the administration has neither a domestic nor a foreign policy. The administration must at once adopt and carry out a novel, radical, and aggressive policy. It must cease saying a word about slavery and raise a great outcry about union. It must declare war against France and Spain and combine and organize all the governments of North and South America in a crusade to enforce the Monroe Doctrine. This policy, once adopted, it must be the business of someone incessantly to pursue it. It is not in my especial province, wrote Mr. Seward, but I neither seek to evade nor assume responsibility. This phrase, which is a key to the whole memorandum, enables the reader easily to translate its meaning into something like the following. After a month's trial, you, Mr. Lincoln, are a failure as president, the country is in desperate straits and must use a desperate remedy. That remedy is to submerge the South Carolina insurrection in a continental war. Some new man must take the executive helm and wield the undivided presidential authority. I should have been nominated at Chicago and elected in November, but am willing to take your place and perform your duties. Why, William H. Seward, who was fairly entitled to rank as a great statesman, should have written this memorandum and presented it to Mr. Lincoln, has never been explained. Nor is it capable of explanation. Its suggestions were so visionary, its reasoning so fallacious, its assumptions so unwarranted, its conclusions so malapropos, that it falls below critical examination. Had Mr. Lincoln been an envious or a resentful man, he could not have wished for a better occasion to put a rival under his feet. The president doubtless considered the incident one of phenomenal strangeness, but it did not in the least disturb his unselfish judgment or mental equipoise. There was in his answer no trace of excitement or passion. He pointed out in a few sentences of simple, quiet explanation that what the administration had done was exactly a foreign and domestic policy which the Secretary of State himself had concurred in and helped to frame, only that Mr. Seward proposed to go further and give up Sumter. Upon the central suggestion that someone mind must direct, Mr. Lincoln wrote with simple dignity, quote, if this must be done, I must do it. When a general line of policy is adopted, I apprehend that there is no danger of its being changed without good reason, or continuing to be a subject of unnecessary debate. Still, upon points arising in its progress, I wish, and suppose I am entitled to have, the advice of all the cabinet." End quote. Mr. Lincoln's unselfish magnanimity is the central marvel of the whole affair. His reply ended the argument. Mr. Seward doubtless saw at once how completely he had put himself in the president's power. Apparently, neither of the men ever again alluded to the incident. No other persons, except Mr. Seward's son and the president's private secretary, ever saw the correspondence or knew of the occurrence. The president put the papers away in an envelope, and no word of the affair came to public until a quarter of a century later, when the details were published in Mr. Lincoln's biography. In one mind, at least, there was no further doubt that the cabinet had a master, for only some weeks later, Mr. Seward is known to have written, quote, There is but one vote in the cabinet, and that is cast by the president, end quote. This mastery Mr. Lincoln retained with a firm dignity throughout his administration. When, near the close of the war, he sent Mr. Seward to meet the rebel commissioners at the Hampton Roads Conference, he finished his short letter of instructions with the imperative sentence, You will not assume to definitely consummate anything. From this strange episode, our narrative must return to the question of Fort Sumter, 
On April 4th, official notice was sent to Major Anderson of the coming relief, with the instruction to hold out till the 11th or 12th if possible, but authorizing him to capitulate whatever it might become necessary to save himself and command. Two days later, the president sent a special messenger with written notice to the governor of South Carolina that an attempt would be made to supply Fort Sumter with provisions only, and that if such attempt were not resisted, no further effort would be made to throw in men, arms, or ammunition without further notice, or unless in case of an attack on the fort. The building of batteries around Fort Sumter had begun, under the orders of Governor Pickens, about the 1st of January, and continued with industry and energy, and about the 1st of March, General Beauregard, an accomplished engineer officer, was sent by the Confederate government to take charge of and complete the works. On April 1st, he telegraphed to Montgomery, batteries ready to open Wednesday or Thursday. What instructions? At this point, the Confederate authorities at Montgomery found themselves face to face with the fatal alternative either to begin war or to allow their rebellion to collapse. Their claim to independence was denied. Their commissioners were refused a hearing. Yet, not an angry word, provoking threat, nor harmful act had come from President Lincoln. He had promised them peace, protection, freedom from irritation, had offered them the benefit of the mails. Even now, all he proposed to do was not to send guns or ammunition or men to Sumter, but only bread and provisions to Anderson and his soldiers. His prudent policy placed them in the exact attitude described a month earlier in his inaugural. They could have no conflict without being themselves the aggressors. But the rebellion was organized by ambitious men with desperate intentions. A member of the Alabama legislature, present at Montgomery, said to Jefferson Davis and three members of his cabinet, Gentlemen, unless you sprinkle blood in the face of the people of Alabama, they will be back in the old Union in less than ten days. And the sanguinary advice was adopted. In answer to his question, what instructions, Beauregard, on April 10th, was ordered to demand the evacuation of Fort Sumter and, in case of refusal, to reduce it. The demand was presented to Anderson, who replied that he would evacuate the fort by noon of April 15th unless assailed, or unless he received supplies or controlling instructions from his government. This answer being unsatisfactory to Beauregard, he sent Anderson notice that he would open fire on Sumter at 420 on the morning of April 12th. Promptly at the hour indicated, the bombardment was begun. As has been related, the rebel siege works were built on the points of the islands forming the harbor, at distances varying from 1,300 to 2,500 yards, and numbered 19 batteries, with an armament of 47 guns, supported by a land force of from four to 6,000 volunteers. The disproportion between means of attack and defense was enormous. Sumter, though a work 300 by 350 feet in size, with well-constructed walls and casemats of brick, was in very meager preparation for such a conflict. Of its 48 available guns, only 21 were in the casemats, 27 being on the ramparts in Barbet. The garrison consisted of nine commissioned officers, 68 non-commissioned officers and privates, eight musicians, and 43 non-combatant workmen compelled by the besiegers to remain to hasten the consumption of provisions. Under the fire of the 17 mortars and the rebel batteries, Anderson could reply only with a vertical fire from the guns of small caliber in his casemats which was of no effect against the rebel bomb proofs of sand and roofs of sloping railroad iron. But, refraining from exposing his men to serve his barbette guns, his garrison was also safe in its protecting casemats. It happened, therefore, that although the attack was spirited and the defense resolute, the combat went on for a day and a half without a single casualty. 
it came to an end on the second day only when the cartridges of the garrison were exhausted and the red hot shot from the rebel batteries had set the buildings used as officers quarters on fire creating heat and smoke that rendered further defense impossible there was also the further discouragement that the expedition of relief which anderson had been instructed to look for on the eleventh or twelfth had failed to appear several unforeseen contingencies had prevented the assembling of the vessels at the appointed rendezvous outside charleston harbor though some of them reached it in time to hear the opening guns of the bombardment but as accident had deranged and thwarted the plan agreed upon they could do nothing except impatiently await the issue of the fight a little after noon of april thirteenth when the flagstaff of the fort had been shot away and its guns remained silent an invitation to capitulate with the honors of war came from general beauregard which anderson accepted and on the following day sunday april fourteenth he hauled down his flag with impressive ceremonies and leaving the fort with his faithful garrison proceeded in a steamer to new york End of chapter 13